Section 15 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Section 15. Book 2. The Woman. Chapter 1. Of storm and tempest and of the coming of Charmian. I was at sea in an open boat. Out of the pitch black heaven there rushed a mighty wind, and the pitch black seas above me rose high and even higher, flecked with hissing white. Wherefore I cast me face downwards in my little boat, that I might not behold the horror of the waters, and above their ceaseless surging thunder there rose a long drawn cry. Charmian! I stood upon the desolate moor, and the pitiless rain lashed me, and the fierce wind buffeted me, and out of the gloom where frowning earth and heaven met, there rose a long-drawn cry. Charmian! I started up in bed, broad awake and listening, yet the tumult was all about me still, the hiss and beat of rain, and the sound of a rushing mighty wind, a wind that seemed to fill the earth, a wind that screamed about me, that howled above me, and filled the woods near and far with a deep booming, pierced now and then by the splintering crash of snapping bough or falling tree. And yet somewhere in this frightful pandemonium of sound blended in with it, yet not of it, it seemed to me that the cry still faintly echoed, Charmian! So appalling was all this to my newly awakened senses, that I remained for a time staring into the darkness as one dazed. Presently, however, I rose, and donning some clothes, mended the fire which still smouldered upon the hearth, and having filled and lighted my pipe, sat down to listen to the awful voices of the storm. What brain could conceive, what pen describe that elemental chorus, like the mighty voice of persecuted humanity, past and present, crying the woes and ills, the sorrows and torments, endured of all the ages. Tonight, surely, the souls of the unnumbered dead rode with the storm, and this was the voice of their lamentation. From the red mire of battlefields are they come, from the flame and ravishment of fair cities, from dim and reeking dungeons, from the rack, the stake, and the gibbet, to pierce the heavens once more with the voice of their agony. Since the world was made, how many have lived and suffered and died unlettered and unsung, snatched by a tyrant's whim from life to death, in the glory of the sun, in the gloom of the night, in blood and flame and torment. Indeed, their name is Legion. But there is a great and awful book whose leaves are countless, yet every leaf of which is smirched with blood and fouled with nameless sins, a record, howsoever brief and inadequate, of human suffering, whereas through a glass, darkly, we may behold horrors unimagined, where murder stalks and rampant lust, where treachery creeps with curving back, smiling mouth and sudden deadly hand, where tyranny, fierce-eyed and iron-lipped, grinds the nations beneath a bloody heel. Truly man hath no enemy like man, and Christ is there, and Socrates, and Savonarola, and there too is a cross of agony, a bowl of hemlock, and a consuming fire. O noble martyrs, by whose blood and agony the world is become a purer and better place for us, and those who shall come after us, O glorious innumerable host, thy poor maimed bodies were dust ages since, but thy souls live on in paradise, and thy memory abides, and shall abide in the earth for ever. Ye purblind, ye pessimists, existing with no hope of a resurrection, bethink you of these matters. Go, open the great and awful book, and read and behold these things for yourselves. For what student of history is there, but must be persuaded of man's immortality, that though this poor flesh be mangled, torn asunder, burned to ashes, Yet the soul, rising beyond the tyrant's reach, soars triumphant above death and this sorry world, to the refuge of the everlasting arms, for God is a just God. Now, in a while, becoming conscious that my pipe was smoked out and cold, I reached up my hand to my tobacco box upon the mantel-shelf. 
yet I did not reach it down, for, even as my fingers closed upon it, above the wailing of the storm, above the hiss and patter of driven rain, there rose a long-drawn cry, Charmian! So, remembering the voice I had seemed to hear calling in my dream, I sat there, with my hand stretched up to my tobacco box, and my face screwed round to the casement behind me, that, as I watched, shook and rattled beneath each wind gust, as if some hand strove to pluck it open. How long I remained thus, with my hand stretched up to my tobacco box, and my eyes upon this window, I am unable to say. But, all at once, the door of the cottage burst open with a crash, and immediately the quiet room was full of rioting wind and tempest, such a wind as stopped my breath, and sent up a swirl of smoke and sparks from the fire. And borne upon this wind, like some spirit of the storm, was a woman with flying draperies and long streaming hair, who turned, and, with knee and shoulder, forced to the door, and so leaned there, panting. Tall she was, and nobly shaped, for her wet gown clung, disclosing the sinuous lines of her waist and the bold full curves of hip and thigh. Her dress, too, had been wrenched and torn at the neck, and through the shadow of her fallen hair I caught the ivory gleam of her shoulder and the heave and tumult of her bosom. Here I reached down my tobacco box and mechanically began to fill my pipe, watching her the while. Suddenly she started and seemed to listen. Then, with a swift, stealthy movement, she slipped from before the door, and I noticed that she hid one hand behind her. Charmian! The woman crouched back against the wall, with her eyes towards the door, and always her right hand was hidden in the folds of her petticoat. So we remained, she watching the door, and I her. Charmian! The voice was very clear now, and almost immediately after there came a loud view hello and a heavy fist pounded upon the door. Oh, Charmian, you're there. Yes, yes, inside, I know you are. I swore you should never escape me, and you shan't, by God. A hand fumbled upon the latch, the door swung open, and a man entered. As he did so, I leapt forward and caught the woman's wrist. There was a blinding flash, a loud report, and a bullet buried itself somewhere in the rafters overhead. With a strange, repressed cry, she turned upon me so fiercely that I fell back before her. The newcomer, meantime, had closed the door, latching it very carefully, and now, standing before it, folded his arms, staring at her with bent head. He was a very tall man, with a rain-sodden, bell-crowned hat, crushed low upon his brows, and wrapped in a long, many-caged overcoat, the skirts of which were woefully mired and torn. All at once he laughed, very softly and musically. "'So you would have killed me, would you, Charmian? Shot me like a dog?' His tone was soft as his laugh, and equally musical, and yet neither was good to hear. "'So you thought you had lost me, did you, when you gave me the slip a while ago? Lose me? Escape me? Why, I tell you, I would search for you day and night, hunt the world over until I found you, Charmian, until I found you,' said he, nodding his head and speaking almost in a whisper. "'I would, by God.' The woman neither moved nor uttered a word, only her breath came thick and fast, and her eyes gleamed in the shadow of her hair. They stood facing each other, like two adversaries, each measuring the other's strength, without appearing to be conscious of my presence. Indeed, the man had not so much as looked toward me, even when I had struck up the pistol. Now, with every minute, I was becoming more curious to see this man's face, hidden as it was in the shadow of his dripping hat-brim. Yet the fire had burned low. "'You always were a spitfire, weren't you, Charmian?' he went on in the same gentle voice. "'Hot and fierce and proud, the flame beneath the ice. "'I knew that, and loved you the better for it, "'and so I determined to win you, Charmian, "'to win you whether you would or no. "'And you are so strong, so tall and glorious and strong, Charmian.' "'His voice had sunk to a murmur again, "'and he drew a slow step nearer to her. How wonderful you are, Charmian. I always loved your shoulders and that round, white throat. Loved? Worship them. Worship them. And tonight... He paused 
and I felt rather than saw that he was smiling. And tonight you would have killed me, Charmian, shot me like a dog. But I would not have it different. You have flouted, coquetted, scorned, and mocked me for three years, Charmian, and tonight you would have killed me, and I would not have it otherwise, for surely you can see that this of itself makes your final surrender even sweeter. With a gesture utterly at variance with his voice, so sudden, fierce, and passionate was it, he sprang toward her with outstretched arms, but as quick as he, she eluded him, and before he could reach her, I stepped between them. Sir, said I, a word with you. Out of my way, bumpkin, he retorted, and brushing one aside, made after her. I caught him by the skirts of his long, loose coat, but with a dexterous twist, he had left it in my grasp. Yet the check, momentary though it was, enabled her to slip through the door of that room which had once been Donald's, and, before he could reach it, I stood upon the threshold. He regarded me for a moment beneath his hat-brim, and seemed undecided how to act. "'My good fellow,' he said at last, "'I will buy your cottage of you, for tonight. Name your price.' I shook my head. Hereupon he drew a thick purse from his pocket and tossed it, chinking, to my feet. There are two hundred guineas, Bumpkin, maybe more. Pick them up and go. And turning, he flung open the door. Obediently I stooped, and taking up the purse, rolled it in the coat which I still held, and tossed both out of the cottage. Sir, said I, be so very obliging as to follow your property. Ah, he murmured, very pretty on my soul. And in that same moment, his knuckles caught me fairly between the eyes, and he was upon me swift and fierce and lithe as a panther. I remember the glint of his eyes and the flash of his bared teeth, now to one side of me, now to the other, as we swayed to and fro, overturning the chairs and crashing into unseen obstacles in that dim and narrow place. Small chance was there for feint or parry. It was blind, brutal work, fierce and grim and silent. Once he staggered and fell heavily, carrying the table crashing with him, and I saw him wipe blood from his face as he rose. And once I was beaten to my knees, but was up before he could reach me again, though the fire upon the hearth spun giddily round and round, and the floor heaved oddly under my feet. Then, suddenly, hands were upon my throat, and I could feel the hot pant of his breath in my face, breath that hissed and whistled between clenched teeth. Desperately, I strove to break his hold, to tear his hands asunder, and could not. Only the fingers tightened and tightened. Up and down the room we staggered, grim and voiceless, out through the open door, out into the whirling blackness of the storm. And there, amid the tempest, lashed by driving rain and deafened by the roaring rush of wind, we fought, as our savage forefathers may have done, breast to breast and knee to knee, stubborn and wild and merciless, the old, old struggle for supremacy and life. I beat him with my fists, but his head was down between his arms. I tore at his wrists, but he gripped my throat the tighter. And now we were down, rolling upon the sodden grass, and now we were up, stumbling and slipping, but ever the gripping fingers sank the deeper, choking the strength and life out of me. My eyes stared up into a heaven streaked with blood and fire. There was the taste of sulphur in my mouth. My arms grew weak and nerveless, and the roar of wind seemed a thousand times more loud. Then something clutched and dragged us by the feet. We tottered, swayed helplessly, and plunged down together. But as we fell, the deadly gripping fingers slackened for a moment, and in that moment I had broken free and, rolling clear, stumbled to my feet. Yet even then I was still encumbered, and, stooping down, found the skirts of the overcoat twisted tightly about my foot and ankle. Now, as I loosed it, I inwardly blessed that tattered garment, for it seemed that to it I owed my life. So I stood panting and waited for the end. I remember a blind groping in the dark, a wild hurly-burly of random blows, a sudden sharp pain in my right hand, a groan, and I was standing with the swish of the rain about me and the moaning of the wind in the woods beyond. 
How long I remained thus I cannot tell, for I was as one in a dream, but the cool rain upon my face refreshed me, and the strong clean winds in my nostrils was wonderfully grateful. Presently, raising my arm stiffly, I brushed the wet hair from my eyes, and stared around me into the pitchy darkness in quest of my opponent. "'Where are you?' said I at last, and this was the first word uttered during the struggle. "'Where are you?' Receiving no answer, I advanced cautiously, for it was, as I have said, black dark, and so presently touched something yielding with my foot. "'Come, get up,' said I, stooping to lay a hand upon him. "'Get up, I say,' but he never moved. He was lying upon his face, and, as I raised his head, my fingers encountered a smooth, round stone, buried in the grass, and the touch of that stone thrilled me from head to foot with sudden dread. Hastily I tore open waistcoat and shirt, and pressed my hand above his heart. At that one moment I lived an age of harrowing suspense, then breathed a sigh of relief, and, rising, took him beneath the arms, and began to half-drag, half-carry him towards the cottage. I had proceeded thus but some dozen yards or so, when, during a momentary lull in the storm, I thought I heard a faint, Hello? And looking about, saw a twinkling light that hovered to and fro, coming and going, yet growing brighter each moment. Setting down my burden, therefore, I hollowed my hands about my mouth and shouted, This way, I called. This way. Be that you, sir? cried a man's voice at no great distance. This way, I called again. This way. The words seemed to reassure the fellow, for the light advanced once more, and as he came up, I made him out to be a postillion by his dress, and the light he carried was the lantern of a chaise. Why, sir, he began, looking me up and down by the light of his lantern, strike me lucky if I'd a knowed you. You looks as if... "'Oh, Lord!' "'What is it?' said I, wiping the rain from my eyes again. The postillion's answer was to lower his lantern towards the face of him who lay on the ground between us, and point. Now, looking where he pointed, I started suddenly backwards, and shivered with a strange stirring of the flesh. For I saw a pale face with a streak of blood upon the cheek. There was blood upon my own, a face framed in lank hair, thick and black, as was my own, a pale aquiline face with a prominent nose and long cleft chin, even as my own. So as I stood looking down upon this face, my breath caught, and my fresh crept, for indeed I might have been looking into a mirror. The face was the face of myself. End of chapter 1 End of section 15「Section sixteen of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Section sixteen. Chapter two. The Postilion. Good Lord! exclaimed the Postilion and fell back a step. Well, said I, meeting his astonished look as carelessly as I might. Lord love me, said the postillion. What now? I inquired. I never see such a thing as this ere, said he, alternately glancing from me down to the outstretched figure at my feet. If it's bewitchments or only enchantments, I don't like it. Strike me pink if I do. What do you mean? Eyes, continued the postillion slowly and heavily, and with his glance wandering still. Eyes, same. Nose, identical. Mouth, when not bloody, same. Hair, same. Figure, same. No, I don't like it. It's unnatural, that's what it is. Come, come, I broke in, somewhat testily. Don't stand there staring like a fool. You see this gentleman is hurt. Unnatural's the word, went on the postillion, more as though speaking his thoughts aloud than addressing me. It's a unnatural night to begin with. See'd a many bad uns in my time, but nothing to equal this ear. 
that I lost my way aren't to be wondered at. Then him, and her a jumping out of the chaise and running off into the thick of the storm. That's unnatural in the second place. And then his face and your face, that's the most unnaturalest part of it all. Likewise, I never seen one man in two suits a closer for, nor yet a standing up and a laying down both at the same identical minute. Unnatural's the word, and I'm a-going. Stop, said I, as he began to move away. Not on no account. Then I must make you, said I, and doubled my fist. The postillion eyed me over from head to foot, and paused, irresolute. What might you be wanting with a peaceable, civil-spoke cove like me? he inquired. Where is your chaise? Up in the lane, somewhere's over yonder, answered he, with a vague jerk of his thumb over his shoulder. Then, if you will take this gentleman's heels, we can carry him well enough between us. It's no great distance. Easy, said the postillion, backing away again. Easy now. What might be the matter with him, if I might make so bold? Ain't dead, is he? Dead? No, fool, I rejoined angrily. Voice like his, too, muttered the postillion, backing away still farther. Yes, unnatural's the word. Strike me dumb if it ain't. Come, will you do as I ask, or must I make you? Why, I ain't got no objection to taking the gent's eels, if that's all you ask, though, mind ye, if I ever see such damned unnaturalness as this here in all my days, why, drowned me. So, after some delay, I found the overcoat and purse, which latter I thrust into the pocket ere wrapping the garment about him, and lifting my still unconscious antagonist between us, we started for the lane, which we eventually reached with no little labour and difficulty. Here, more by good fortune than anything else, we presently stumbled upon a chaise and horses, drawn up in the gloom of sheltering trees, in which we deposited our limp burden as comfortably as might be, and where I made some shift to tie up the gash in his brow. It would be a fine thing, said the postillion moodily, as I at length closed the chaise door, it would be a nice thing if he was to go a dying. By the looks of him, said I, he will be swearing your head off in the next ten minutes or so. Without another word, the postillion set the lantern back in its socket and swung himself into the saddle. Your best course would be to make for Tunbridge, bearing to the right when you strike the high road. The postillion nodded, and gathering up the reins, turned to stare at me once more while I stood in the gleam of the lantern. Well, I inquired. Eyes, said he, rubbing his chin very hard, as one at a loss. Eyes, identical. Nose, same. Mouth, when not bloody, same. Air, same. Everything, same. Lord love me. Pembry would be nearer, said I, and the sooner he is between the sheets, the better. Ah, exclaimed the postillion with a slow nod, and drawing out the word unduly, and talking of sheets and beds, what about my second passenger? I started with two, and ears only one. What about number two? What about er? Her, I repeated. Er as was with him, number one. Er what was a quarrelling with, number one, all the way from London. Er as run away from number one, into the wood yonder. What about number two? Er. Why, to be sure, I had forgotten her. Forgotten? repeated the postillion. Oh, Lord, yes, and leaning over, he winked one eye, very deliberately, forgotten her, ah, to be sure, of course, and he winked again. What do you mean, I demanded, nettled by the fellow's manner. Mean, said he, I means, as of all the damned unnaturalness as, as come on an honest, well-meaning, civil-spoke cove, why, I'm that there cove, so help me, saying which, he cracked his whip, the horses plunged forward, and almost immediately, as it seemed, horses, chaise, and postillion had lurched into the black murk of the night and vanished. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Which bears ample testimony to the strength of the gentleman's fists. Considering all that had befallen during the last half hour or so, it was not very surprising, I think, that I should have forgotten the very existence of this woman Charmian, even though she had been chiefly instrumental in bringing it all about, and to have her recalled to my recollection thus suddenly, and moreover the possibility that I must meet with and talk to her, 
perturbed me greatly, and I remained for some time quite oblivious to wind and rain, all engrossed by the thought of this woman. A dark, fierce Amazonian creature, I told myself, who had, abhorrent thought, already attempted one man's life tonight. Furthermore, a tall woman and strong, therefore unmaidenly, with eyes that gleamed wide in the shadow of her hair. And yet my dismay arose not so much from any of these as from the fact that she was a woman, and consequently beyond my ken. Hitherto I had regarded the sex very much from a distance, and a little askance, as creatures naturally illogical and given to unreasoning impulse, delicate, ethereal beings whose lives were made up of petty trifles and vanities, who were sent into this gross world to be admired, petted, occasionally worshipped, and frequently married. Indeed, my education in this direction had been shockingly neglected thus far, not so much from lack of inclination, for who can deny the fascination of the sex, as for lack of time and opportunity? For when, as a young gentleman of means and great expectations, I should have been writing sonnets to the eyebrow of some lady fair, or surreptitiously wooing some farmer's daughter, in common with my kind, I was hearkening to the plaint of some Greek or Roman lover, or chuckling over old Brantum. Thus women were to me practically an unknown quantity, as yet, and hence it was with no little trepidation that I now started out for the cottage, and this truly Amazonian Charmian, unless she had disappeared as suddenly as she had come, which I found myself devoutly hoping. As I went, I became conscious that I was bleeding copiously above the brow, and that my throat was much swollen, and that the thumb of my right hand pained exceedingly at the least touch added to which was a dizziness of the head and a general soreness of body that testified to the strength of my opponent's fists on i stumbled my head bent low against the stinging rain and with uncertain clumsy feet for reaction had come and with it a deadly faintness twigs swung out of the darkness to lash at and catch me as i passed invisible trees creaked and groaned above and around me and once, as I paused to make more certain of my direction, a dim, vague mass plunged down athwart my path with a rending crash. On I went, wearily enough, and with the faintness growing upon me, a sickness that would not be fought down. Guiding my course by touch rather than sight, until finding myself at fault, I stopped again, staring about me beneath my hand. Yet, feeling the faintness increase with inaction, I started forward, groping before me as I went. I had gone but a few paces, however, when I tripped over some obstacle and fell heavily. It wanted but this to complete my misery, and I lay where I was, overcome by a deadly nausea. Now presently, as I lay thus, spent and sick, I became aware of a soft glow, a brightness that seemingly played all around me. Wherefore, lifting my heavy head, I beheld a ray of light that pierced the gloom, a long gleaming vista jewelled by falling raindrops, whose brilliance was blurred now and then by the flitting shapes of wind-tossed branches. At sight of this my strength revived, and rising, I staggered on towards this welcome light, and thus I saw that it streamed from the window of my cottage. Even then, it seemed, I journeyed miles before I felt the latch beneath my fingers, and fumbling, opened the door, stumbled in, and closed it after me. For a space I stood dazed by the sudden light, and then, little by little, noticed that the table and chairs had been righted, that the fire had been mended, and that candles burned brightly upon the mantel. All this I saw, but dimly, for there was a mist before my eyes. Yet I was conscious that the girl had leapt up on my entrance, and now stood fronting me across the table. You, she said in a low, repressed voice, you now as she spoke i saw the glitter of steel in her hand keep back she said in the same subdued tone keep back i warn you but i only leaned there against the door even as she had done indeed i doubt if i could have moved just then had i tried and as i stood thus hanging my head and not answering her she stamped her foot suddenly and laughed a short fierce laugh so, he has hurt you, she cried. 
You are all blood. It is running down your face. The country bumpkin has hurt you. Oh, I am glad, glad, glad. And she laughed again. I might have run away, she went on mockingly. But you see, I was prepared for you. And she held up the knife. Prepared for you, and now you are pale and hurt and faint. Yes, you are faint. The country bumpkin has done his work well. I shall not need this after all. See? And she flung the knife upon the table. Yes, it is better there, said I, and I think, madam, is mistaken. Mistaken, she cried, with a sudden catch in her voice. What, what do you mean? That I am the bumpkin, said I. Now, as I spoke, a black mist enveloped all things. My knees loosened suddenly, and stumbling forward, I sank into a chair. I am very tired, I sighed, and so, as it seemed, fell asleep. End of chapter 3 End of section 16Section 17 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Section 17, Book 2, Chapter 4 which, among other matters, has to do with bruises and bandages. She was on her knees beside me, bathing my battered face, talking all the while in a soft voice that I thought wonderfully sweet to hear. Poor boy, she was saying over and over again, poor boy. And after she had said it perhaps a dozen times, I opened my eyes and looked at her. Madam, I am twenty-five, said I. Hereupon, sponge in hand, she drew back and looked at me. A wonderful face, low-browed, deep-eyed, full-lipped. The eyes were dark and swiftly changeful, and there was a subtle witchery in the slanting shadow of their lashes. Twenty-five, she repeated. Can it really be? Why not, madam? So very young? Why, I began, greatly taken aback. Indeed, I, that is... But here she laughed, and then she sighed, and sighing, shook her head. Poor boy, she said, poor boy. And when I would have retorted, she stopped me with the sponge. Your mouth is cut, said she, after a while, and there is a great gash in your brow. But the water feels delicious, said I, and your throat is all scratched and swollen. But your hands are very gentle and soothing. I don't hurt you, then? On the contrary, the pain is very trifling, thank you. Yet you fainted a little while ago. Then it was very foolish of me. Poor, she hesitated, and looking up at her through the trickling water, I saw that she was smiling. Fellow, said she, and her lips were very sweet, and her eyes very soft and tender for an Amazon. And, when she had washed the blood from my face, she went to fetch clean water from where I kept it in a bucket in the corner. Now, at my elbow upon the table, lay a knife, a heavy, clumsy contrivance I had bought to use in my carpentry, and I now mechanically picked it up. As I did so, the light gleamed evilly upon its long blade. "'Put it down,' she commanded. "'Put it away. It is a hateful thing.' For a woman's hand, I added, so hideously unfeminine. Some men are so hatefully, hideously masculine, she retorted, her lip curling. I expected him, and you are terribly like him. As to that, said I, I may have the same coloured eyes and hair, and be something of the same build. Yes, she nodded, it was your build, and the colour of your eyes and hair, that startled me. But, after all, said I, the similarity is only skin deep and goes no farther. No, she answered, kneeling beside me again. No, you are only twenty-five. And as she said this, her eyes were hidden by her lashes. Twenty-five is... Twenty-five, said I, more sharply than before. Why do you smile? The water is dripping from your nose and chin. 
stoop lower over the basin and yet said i as well as i could on account of the trickling water for she was bathing my face again and yet you must be years younger than i but then some women always feel older than a man more especially if he is hurt thank you said i thank you with the exception of a scratch or so i am very well but as i moved i caught my thumb clumsily against the table edge and winced with the sudden pain of it what is it your hand my thumb let me see obediently i stretched out my hand to her is it broken dislocated i think it is greatly swollen yes said i and taking firm hold of it with my left hand i gave it a sudden pull which started the sweat upon my temples and sent it back into joint poor well said i as she hesitated man said she and touched the swollen hand very tenderly with her fingers you do not fear me any longer no in spite of my eyes and hair in spite of your eyes and hair you see a woman knows instinctively whom she must fear and whom not to fear well and you are one i do not fear and i think never should hum said i rubbing my chin i am only twenty-five twenty-five is twenty-five said she demurely and yet i am very like him you said so yourself him she exclaimed starting i had forgotten all about him where is he what has become of him and she glanced apprehensively towards the door halfway to tunbridge or should be by now tunbridge said she in a tone of amazement and turned to look at me again tunbridge i repeated but he is not the man to to run away said she doubtfully even from you no indeed said i shaking my head he certainly did not run away but circumstances and a stone were too much even for him a stone upon which he happened to fall and strike his head very fortunately for me was he much hurt stunned only i answered she was still kneeling beside my chair but now she sat back and turned to stare into the fire and as she sat i noticed how full and round and white her arms were for her sleeves were rolled high and that the hand which yet held the sponge was likewise very white neither big nor little a trifle wide perhaps but with long slender fingers presently with a sudden gesture she raised her head and looked at me again a long searching look who are you she asked suddenly my name said i is peter yes she nodded with her eyes still on mine peter smith i went on and by that same token i am a blacksmith very humbly at your service peter smith she repeated as though trying the sound of it hesitating at the surname exactly as i had done peter smith and mine is charmian charmian brown and here again was a pause between the two names yours is a very beautiful name said i especially the charmian and yours she retorted is a beautifully ugly one yes especially the peter indeed i quite agree with you said i rising and now if i may trouble you for the towel thank you forthwith i began to dry my face as well as i might on account of my injured thumb while she watched me with a certain elusive merriment peeping from her eyes and quivering at me round her lips an expression half mocking half amused that i had seen there more than once already wherefore to hide from her my consciousness of this i fell to toweling myself vigorously so much so that forgetting the cut in my brow i set it bleeding faster than ever oh you are very clumsy she cried springing up and snatching the towel from me she began to stanch the blood with it if you will sit down i will bind it up for you really it is quite unnecessary i demurred quite said she is there anything will serve as a bandage there is the towel i suggested not to be thought of then you might tear a strip off the sheet said i nodding towards the bed ridiculous said she and proceeded to draw a handkerchief from the bosom of her dress and having folded it with great nicety and moistened it in the bowl she tied it about my temples 
Now, to do this, she had perforce to pass her arms about my neck, and this brought her so near that I could feel her breath upon my lips, and there stole to me out of her hair, or out of her bosom, a perfume very sweet, that was like the fragrance of violets at evening. But her hands were too dexterous, and, quicker than it takes to write, the bandage was tied, and she was standing before me, straight and tall. There! That is more comfortable, isn't it? she inquired, and with the words she bestowed a final little pat to the bandage, a touch so light, so ineffably gentle, that it might almost have been the hand of that long-dead mother whom I had never known. That is better, isn't it? she demanded. Thank you, yes, very comfortable, said I. But as the word left me, my glance by accident encountered the pistol nearby, and at sight of it a sudden anger came upon me, for I remembered that, but for my intervention, this girl was a murderess. Wherefore I would fain have destroyed the vile thing, and reached for it impulsively, but she was before me, and snatching up the weapon, hid it behind her, as she had done once before. "'Give it to me,' said I, frowning. "'It is an accursed thing.' "'Yet it has been my friend to-night,' she answered. "'Give it to me,' I repeated. She threw up her head and regarded me with a disdainful air, for my tone had been imperative. "'Come,' said I, and held out my hand. So, for a while, we looked into each other's eyes. Then, all at once, she dropped the weapon on the table before me and turned her back to me. "'I think,' she began, speaking with her back still turned to me. "'Well,' said I, "'that you have—' "'Yes,' said I, "'very unpleasant eyes.' "'I'm very sorry for that,' said I, dropping the weapon out of sight behind my row of books, having done which I drew both chairs nearer the fire and invited her to sit down. "'Thank you. I prefer to stand,' said she loftily. "'As you will,' I answered. But even while I spoke she seemed to change her mind, for she sank into the nearest chair and, chin in hand, stared into the fire. "'And so,' said she, as I sat down opposite her, "'And so your name is Peter Smith, and you are a blacksmith?' "'Yes, a blacksmith.' "'And make horseshoes?' "'Naturally, yes.' "'And do you live here?' "'Yes.' "'Alone?' "'Quite alone. "'And how long have you lived here alone?' "'Not so long that I am tired of it.' "'And is this cottage yours?' "'Yes. "'That is, it stands on the Sefton Estates, I believe, "'but nobody hereabouts would seem anxious "'to dispute my right of occupying the place.' Why not? Because it is generally supposed to be haunted. Oh! It was built by some wanderer of the roads, I explained, a stranger to these parts, who lived alone here, and eventually died alone here. Died here? Hanged himself on the staple above the door yonder. Oh! said she again, and cast a fearful glance toward the deep-driven, rusty staple. The country folk believe his spirit still haunts the place, I went on, and seldom or never venture foot within the hollow. And you are not afraid of this ghost? No, said I. It must be very lonely here. Delightfully so. Are you so fond of solitude? Yes, for solitude is thought, and to think is to live. And what did you do with the pistol? I dropped it out of sight behind my books yonder. I wonder why I gave it to you. "'Because, if you remember, I asked you for it. "'But I usually dislike doing what I am asked, "'and your manner was scarcely courteous. "'You also objected to my eyes, I think.' "'Yes,' she nodded. Hum," said I. "'The dark night outside was filled with malignant demons now, "'who tore at the rattling casements, "'who roared and bellowed down the chimney, "'or screamed furiously round the cottage. "'But here, in the warm firelight, I heeded them not at all, watching, rather, this woman, where she sat, leaned forward, gazing into the deep glow. And where the light touched her hair, it woke strange fires, red and bronze. And it was very rebellious hair, with little tendrils that gleamed here and there against her temples, and small, defiant curls that seemed to strive to hide behind her ear, or, bold and wanton, to kiss her snowy neck, out of sheer bravado. As to her dress, I, little by little, became aware of two facts, for whereas her gown was a rough, coarse material, 
such as domestic servants wear, the stockinged foot that peeped at me beneath its hem, her shoes were drying on the hearth, was clad in a silk so fine that I could catch through it the gleam of the white flesh beneath. From this apparent inconsistency, I deduced that she was of educated tastes but poor, probably a governess, or, more likely still, taking her hands into consideration with their long, prehensile fingers, a teacher of music, and she was going on to explain to myself her present situation as the outcome of beauty, poverty, and the devil, when she sighed, glanced toward the door, shivered slightly, and reaching her shoes from the hearth, prepared to slip them on. "'They are still very wet,' said I, deprecatingly. "'Yes,' she answered. "'Listen to the wind,' said I. "'It is terribly high.' "'And it rains very hard,' said I. "'Yes,' and she shivered again. "'It will be bad travelling for any one to-night,' said I. Charmian stared into the fire. "'Indeed, it would be madness for the strongest to stir abroad on such a night.' Charmian stared into the fire. "'What with the wind and the rain, the roads would be utterly impassable, "'not to mention the risks of falling trees or shattered boughs.' "'Charmian shivered again. "'And the inns are all shut long ago. "'To stir out, therefore, would be the purest folly.' "'Charmian stared into the fire. "'On the other hand, here are a warm room, a good fire, and a very excellent bed. She neither spoke nor moved. Only her eyes were raised suddenly and swiftly to mine. Also, I continued, returning her look, here, most convenient to your hand, is a fine sharp knife, in case you are afraid of the ghost or any other midnight visitant. And so, good night, madam. Saying which, I took up one of the candles and crossed to the door of that room, which had once been Donald's. But here I paused to glance back at her, Furthermore, said I, snuffing my candle with great nicety, Madam need have no farther qualms regarding the colour of my hair and eyes, none whatever. Whereupon I bowed somewhat stiffly on account of my bruises, and, going into my chamber, closed the door behind me. Having made the bed, for since Donald's departure I had occupied my two beds alternately, I undressed slowly, for my thumb was very painful. Also, I paused frequently to catch the sound of the light, quick footstep beyond the door, and the whisper of her garments as she walked. Charmian, I said to myself, when at length all was still. Charmian, and I blew out my candle. Outside, the souls of the unnumbered dead still rode the storm, and the world was filled with their woeful lamentation. But as I lay in the dark, there came to me a faint perfume as of violets at evening time, elusive and very sweet, breathing of Charmian herself, and putting up my hand. I touched the handkerchief that bound my brow. Charmian, said I to myself again, and so fell asleep. End of Which, among other matters, has to do with bruises and bandages. Section 18 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Book 2, Chapter 5. In which I hear ill news of George. The sun was pouring in at my lattice when I awoke next morning to a general soreness of body that at first puzzled me to account for. But as I lay in that delicious state between sleeping and waking, I became aware of a faint, sweet perfume, and, turning my head, espied a handkerchief upon the pillow beside me, and immediately I came to my elbow, with my eyes directed to the door, for now indeed I remembered all and beyond that door, sleeping or waking, lay a woman. In the early morning things are apt to lose something of the glamour that was theirs overnight. Thus I remained propped upon my elbow, gazing apprehensively at the door, and with my ears on the stretch, hearkening for any movement from the room beyond that should tell me she was up. But I heard only the early chorus of the birds and the gurgle of the brook, swollen with last night's rain. In a while, I rose and began to dress somewhat awkwardly on account of my thumb, 
yet with rather more than my usual care, stopping occasionally to hear if she was yet astir. Being at last fully dressed, I sat down to wait until I should hear her footstep, but I listened vainly, for minute after minute elapsed until, rising at length, I knocked softly, and having knocked twice, each time louder than before, without effect, I lifted the latch and opened the door. My first glance showed me that the bed had never been slept in, and that save for myself the place was empty, and yet the breakfast table had been neatly set, though with but one cup and saucer. Now beside this cup and saucer was one of my few books, and picking it up I saw that it was my Virgil. Upon the fly-leaf at which it was open I had years ago scrawled my name thus, Peter Vibart. But lo, close under this, written in a fine Italian hand, were the following words. To Peter Smith, Esquire, the Smith underlined, Blacksmith, Charmian Brown, Brown likewise underlined, desires to thank Mr. Smith, yet because thanks are so poor and small, and his service so great, needs must she remember him as a gentleman, yet oftener as a blacksmith, and most of all as a man. Charmian Brown begs him to accept this little trinket in memory of her. It is all she has to offer him. He may also keep her handkerchief. Upon the table, on the very spot where the book had lain, was a gold heart-shaped locket, very quaint and old-fashioned, upon one side of which was engraved the following posy. He who mine heart would keep for long shall be a gentle man and strong. Attached to the locket was a narrow blue ribbon, wherefore passing this ribbon over my head, I hung the locket about my neck, and having read through the message once more, I closed the Virgil, and, replacing it on a shelf, set about brewing a cup of tea, and so presently sat down to breakfast. I had scarcely done so, however, when there came a timid knock at the door, whereat I rose expectantly, and immediately sat down again. "'Come in,' said I. The latch was slowly raised, the door swung open, and the ancient appeared. If I was surprised to see him at such an hour, he was even more so, for, at sight of me, his mouth opened, and he stood staring speechlessly, leaning upon his stick. "'Why, ancient,' said I, "'you are early abroad this morning.' "'Lord!' he exclaimed, scarcely above a whisper. "'Come in and sit down,' said I. "'Lord! Lord!' he murmured. "'And a sat in his breakfast, too. "'Lordy, Lord!' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'And, such as it is, you are heartily welcome to share it. "'Sit down.' "'And I drew up my other chair. "'A eat in his breakfast, as ever was,' repeated the old man, without moving. "'And why not, Ancient?' "'Why not?' he repeated disdainfully. "'Cause breakfast can't be ate by a corp, can it?' "'A corpse, Ancient? What do you mean?' "'I means a corp ain't got no right to eat no breakfast, no.' "'Why, I... no, certainly not. "'Consequently, you aren't a corp, you'll be telling me.' "'I? No, not yet. God be thanked.' Peter, said the ancient, shaking his head and mopping his brow with a corner of his neckerchief, you do be forever a giving me turns, that you do. Do I, ancient? Ay, that you do, and me such an aged man too, such a very aged man. I wonders at ye, Peter, and me with my white airs. Oh, I wonders at ye, said he, sinking into the chair I had placed for him, and regarding me with a stern, reproving eye. If you will tell me what I have been guilty of, I began. I come down here, Peter, so early as it be, too. I come down here to look for your corp after the storm and what happened last night. I comes down here, and what does I find? I find ye eating your breakfast, just as if there never hadn't been no storm at all. No, nor nothing else. I'm sure, said I, pouring out a second cup of tea, I'm sure I would sooner you find my corpse than anyone else, and I'm sorry to have disappointed you again. "'But really, Ancient?' "'Oh, you aren't the disappointment, Peter. "'I found one corp, and that's enough, I suppose, for an aged man like me. "'No, it aren't that. "'It's finding you, eating your breakfast, just if there had hadn't been no storm. "'No, nor yet no devil, with horns and a tail, "'and running up and down in the oller ear, "'and a roaring and a bellering, as John Pringle said last night.' "'Ah, 
"'And what else did John Pringle say?' I inquired, setting down my cup. "'Why, he come into the ball all wet and wild-like, "'and with his two eyes a-sticking out like gooseberries, "'he comes a-busting into the tap, "'and never says a word till he's emptied old Amos's tankard, "'that being nighest. "'Then, by golds, he said, looking around, "'by golds, I just seen the ghost. "'Ghost?' says all on us, sitting up. "'Ye may be sure, Peter. "'Aye,' says John, looking over his shoulder, scared-like, "'seed him with my own two eyes. "'I did, and what's more, I heard him, too. "'Where?' says all on us, "'beginning to look over our shoulders likewise. "'Where?' says John. "'Where should I have seen him but in that there gashly holler? "'I see a light, first of all, "'a leaping and a dancing about among the trees. "'Ah, and I heard shouts as was enough to curdle a man's good blood. "'Pooh, what light?' said Joel Amos, "'cocking his eye into his empty tankard. "'That bain't so much frighten a man, no, nor shouts neither. "'Aren't I?' says John Pringle, fierce-like. "'What if I tell ye the place be full of flaming fire? "'What if I tell you I seen the devil hisself, "'all smoke and sparks and brimstone a floating and a flying "'and dragging a body through the tops of the trees? "'Lord,' said everybody, "'and well they might, Peter, and nobody says nothing for a while. "'I wonder,' says Joel Amos at last, "'I wonder who he was dragging through the tops of the trees, and why?' "'That'll be poor Peter being took away,' says I. "'I'll go and find the poor lad's corp in the morning, and here I be.' "'And you find me not dead after all your trouble?' said I. "'If,' said the ancient, sighing, "'if your arms was broke or your legs was broke now, "'or if your hair was singed or your face all burned and blackened with sulphur, "'I could have took it kinder. "'But to find ye sitting, eating and drinking, "'it aren't what I expected of you, Peter, no,' shaking his head moodily. He took from his hat his never-failing snuff-box, but, having extracted a pinch, paused suddenly in the act of inhaling it, to stare at me very hard. But, he said in a more hopeful tone, but your face be all bruised and swole up, to be sure, Peter. Is it ancient? Ah, that it be, that it be, he cried, his eyes brightening, and your thumb's all bandaged, too. Why, so it is ancient. And Peter... The pinch of snuff fell, and made a little brown cloud on the snow of his smock-frock as he rose, trembling, and leaned towards me across the table. Well, ancient, your throat. Yes, what of it? It be all marked, scratched if be, tore as if, as if claws had been at it, Peter, long, sharp claws. Is it ancient? Peter, oh, Peter, said he, with a sudden quaver in his voice. Who was it? What was it, Peter? and he laid a beseeching hand upon mine. Peter! His voice had sunk almost to a whisper, and the hand plucked tremulously at my sleeve, while in the wrinkled old face was a look of pitiful entreaty. Oh, Peter, a lad! T'were old Nick has done it. T'were the devil has done it, won't it? Oh, say t'were the devil, Peter! And seeing that hoary head, all a-twitch with eagerness as he waited my answer, how could I do other than nod? "'Yes, it was the devil, ancient.' "'The old man subsided into his chair, "'embracing himself exultantly. "'I knowed it. "'I knowed it,' he quavered. "'Twere the devil flying off with Peter,' says I. "'And they fuels laughed at me, Peter. "'I laughed at me, they did. "'And they won't laugh at the old man no more. "'Not they. "'Old I be, but they won't laugh at me no more. "'Not when they see your face and I tell them. "'Here he paused to fumble for his snuff-box.' and opening it held it towards me take a pinch with me peter no thank you ancient come twould be a wonderful thing as i took out snuff of my very own box with a man as fault with the devil come take a pinch peter he pleaded whereupon to please him i did so and immediately fell most violently a sneezing and pursued the old man when the paroxysm was over did ye see his horns peter and his "'Why, no, Ancient. You see, he happened to be wearing a bell-crowned hat and a long coat.' "'An at a coat?' said the man, in a disappointed tone. "'A at, Peter?' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'To be sure, the scriptures say, as he goeth up and down like a ravening lion, seeking whom he may devour.' "'Yes,' said I. "'But more often, I think, like a fine gentleman. "'I never heard tell of the devil in a bell-crowned hat before.' "'But perhaps you'm right, Peter. Take another pinch of snuff.' "'No more,' said I, shaking my head. 
Why, it's apt to catch you a bit at first, but, Lord, Peter, for a man as fought with a devil, one pinch is more than enough, ancient. Oh, Peter, tis a wonderful thing as you should be alive this day. And yet, ancient, many a man has fought the devil before now, and lived. Nay, has been better for it. Maybe, Peter, maybe, but not on such a terrible wild night as last night was. Saying which, the old man nodded emphatically, and, rising, hobbled to the door. Yet there he turned and came back. I nigh forgot, Peter. I have news for ye. News? News as ever was. News as will surprise ye, Peter. Well, I inquired. Well, Peter, Black George be took again. What? I exclaimed. Oh, I know twould come. I knowed he couldn't last much longer. I says to Simon, day afore yesterday it were. Simon, I says, mark my words, he'll never last the month out. No. How did it happen, ancient? Got terrible drunk he did over to Cranbrook. Throwed Mr. Scrope, the beadle, over the churchyard wall. Knocked down Jeremy Tullinger, the watchman, and then went to sleep. While he were asleep, they managed, cautious-like, to tie his legs and arms, and locked him up mighty secure in the vestry. As ever, when he woke up, he broke the door open and walked out, and nobody tried to stop him. Not a soul, Peter. And when was all this? Why, that was the very point, chuckled the ancient. That's the wonderful part of it, Peter. It all happened on Saturday night, day afore yesterday as ever was. The same day, I says to Simon, mark my words, he won't last the month out. And where is he now? Nobody knows, but there's them that says he's making for Sefton Woods. Hereupon, breakfast done, I rose and shook my hat. Where away, Peter? To the forge. There is much work to be done, ancient. But Jarge bain't there to help you. Yet the work remains, ancient. Well, then, if you'm going, I'll go with ye, Peter. So we presently set out together. All about us as we walked were mute evidences of the fury of last night's storm. Trees had been uprooted, and great branches torn from others, as if by the hands of angry giants, and the brook was a raging torrent. Down here, in the hollow, the destruction had been less, but in the woods above the giants had worked their will, and many an empty gap showed where, erstwhile, had stood a tall and stately tree. "'Trees be very like men,' said the ancient, nodding to one that lay prone beside the path. "'Ere to-day and gone to-morrow, Peter, gone to-morrow. The man in the Bible, him as was cured of his blindness by the blessed Lord, he said as men were like trees walking. But to my mind, Peter, trees is much more like men as standing still. "'You see, Peter, trees be such companionable things.' It's very seldom as you see a tree growing all by itself, and when you do, if you look at it, you can't help but notice how lonely it do look. Aye, its very leaves seem to have a downhearted sort of drop. I knowed three of em once, elm trees they was, growing all close together, so close that their branches used to touch each other when the wind blew, just as if they were shaking hands with one another, Peter. You could see as they was uncommon fond of each other, with half an eye. Well, one day, along comes a storm and blows one of them down, kills it dead, Peter, and a little while later they cuts down another, Lord knows why, and there was the last one, all alone and solitary. Now I used to watch that there tree, and here's the curious thing, Peter, day by day, I see that tree a-drooping and drooping, a-withering and a-pining for them other two, brothers, you might say, till one day I came by, and there it were, Peter, a-standing up so big and tall as ever, but dead. I, Peter, dead it were, and never put forth another leaf, and never will, Peter, never. And if you was to ask me, I should say it died because its art were broken, Peter. Yes, trees is very like men, and the older you grow, the more you'll see it. I listened. It was thus we talked, or rather, the ancient talked, and I listened, until we reached Sissinghurst. At the door of the smithy, we stopped. Peter, said the old man, staring very hard at the button on my coat, well, ancient, what about that there poor old rusty staple? Why, it is still above the door, ancient. You must have seen it this morning. Oh, ah, I seed it, Peter, I seed it, answered the old man, shifting his gaze to a rolling white cloud above. I give it a glimp over, Peter, but what do ye think of it? Well, said I, aware of the fixity of his gaze and the wistful note in his voice, it is certainly older and rustier than it was. 
rustier, Peter? Much rustier. Very slowly a smile dawned on the wrinkled old face, and very slowly the eyes were lowered till they met mine. E lad, I be glad o' that. We be all growing older, Peter. And, though I be a wonderful man for my age, and so strong as a cart horse, Peter, still I do sometimes feel I be growing rustier with length of days. And tis a comfort to know that that the staple a growing rustier along with me. Old I be, but the staple's old too, Peter, and I be waiting for the day when it shall rust itself away altogether. And when that day comes, Peter, then I'll say like the old patriarch in the Bible, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Amen, Peter. Amen, said I, and so, having watched the old man totter across to the bull, I turned into the smithy and set about lighting the fire. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Section 19 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Chapter 6 In Which I Learn of an Impending Danger I am at the forge, watching the deepening glow of the coals as I ply the bellows, and listening to their hoarse, not unmusical drone, it seems like a familiar voice, or the voice of a familiar, albeit a somewhat wheezy one, speaking to me in stertorous gasps, something in this wise. Charmian Brown desires to thank Mr. Smith, but because thanks are so poor and small, and his service so great, needs must she remember him. Remember me said I aloud, and letting go the shaft of the bellows, the better to think this over, it naturally followed that the bellows grew suddenly dumb, whereupon I seized the handle and recommenced blowing with a will. Remember him as a gentleman, wheezed the familiar. Psha! I exclaimed. Yet oftener as a smith. Hum! said I. And most of all, as a man. As a man, said I, and turning my back upon the bellows, I sat down upon the anvil, and, taking my chin in my hand, stared away to where the red roof of old Amos's oast house peeped through the swaying green of leaves. As a man, said I to myself again, and so fell a dreaming of this Charmian. And in my mind I saw her, not as she had first appeared, tall and fierce and wild, but as she had been when she stooped to bind up the hurt in my brow with her deep eyes brimful of tenderness, and her mouth sweet and compassionate. Beautiful eyes she had, though whether they were blue or brown or black, I could not for the life of me remember. Only I knew I could never forget the look they had held when she gave that final pat to the bandage. And here I found that I was turning a little locket round and round in my fingers, a little old-fashioned heart-shaped locket with its quaint inscription. He who mine heart would keep for long shall be a gentleman and strong. I was sitting thus, plunged in a reverie, when a shadow fell across the floor, and looking up, I beheld Prudence, and straightway, slipping the locket back into the bosom of my shirt, I rose to my feet, somewhat shamefaced, to be caught thus idle. Her face was troubled, and her eyes red, as from recent tears, while in her hand she held a crumpled paper. Mr. Peter, she began, and then stopped, staring at me. Well, Prudence, you, you've you seen him. Him? Who do you mean? Black George. No. What should make you think so? Your face be all cut. You've been fighting. And supposing I have, that is none of George's doing. He and I are very good friends. Why should we quarrel? Well, then it won't, George? No, I have not seen him since Saturday. Thank God, she exclaimed, pressing her hand to her bosom as if to stay its heaving. But you must go, she went on breathlessly. Oh, Mr. Peter, I've been so fearful for you, and, and, and you might meet each other any time, so, so you must go away. Prudence, said I, Prudence, what do you mean? For answer, she held out the crumpled paper, and, scrawled in great, straggling characters, I read these words. Prudence, I am going away. I shall kill him else, but I shall come back. 
Tell him not to cross my path or God help him and you and me George What does it all mean prudence said I like a fool? Now as I spoke glancing at her I saw her cheeks that had seemed hitherto more pale than usual grow suddenly scarlet and meeting my eyes she hid her face in her two hands then seeing her distress in that same instant i found the answer to my question and so stood turning poor george's letter over and over more like a fool than ever you must go away you must go away she repeated hum said i you must go soon he means it i i've seen death in his face she said shuddering Go today the longer you stay here the worse for all of us go now Prudence said I yes, mr. Peter from behind her hands you always loved black George didn't you? Yes, mr. Peter and you still love him don't you a moment's silence then yes, mr. Peter Excellent said I her head was raised a trifle and one tearful eye looked at me over her fingers I had always hoped you did I continued for his sake and for yours and in my way a very blundering way as it seems now I have tried to bring you two together Prudence only sobbed But things are not hopeless yet. I think we can see a means of straightening out this tangle Oh if we only could sobbed prudence you see I were very cruel to him mr. Peter Just a little perhaps said I and while she dabbed at her pretty eyes with her snowy apron I took pen and ink from the shelf where I kept them which together with George's letter I set upon the anvil now said I in answer to her questioning look Write down just here below where George signed his name what you told me a moment ago You mean that I that you love him? Yes. Oh mr. Peter Prudent said I it is the only way so far as I can see of saving George from himself and no sweet pure maid need be ashamed to tell her love Especially to such a man as this who worships the very ground that little shoe of yours has once pressed She glanced up at me under her wet lashes as I said this and a soft light beamed in her eyes and a smile hovered upon her red lips Do he really mr. Peter? Indeed he does prudence though. I think you must know that without my telling you so she stooped above the anvil blushing a little and sighing a little and crying a little and with fingers that trembled somewhat to be sure Wrote these four words George. I love you What now mr. Peter she inquired seeing me begin to unbuckle my leather apron now I answered I am going to look for black George No, no she cried laying her hands upon my arm no no if he do meet him he he'll kill he I Don't think he will said I shaking my head. Oh, don't go don't go she pleaded Shaking my arm in her eagerness He be so strong and wild and quick. He'll give me no chance to speak twill be murder Prudence said I my mind is set on it. I am going for your sake for his sake and my own saying which I loosened her hands gently and took down my coat from its peg Dear God she exclaimed staring down at the floor with wide eyes if he were to kill he Well said I my search would be ended and I should be a deal wiser in all things than I am today and He would be hanged said prudence shuddering Probably poor fellow said I at this she glanced quickly up and once again the crimson dyed her cheeks Oh, mr. Peter forgive me. I I were only thinking of George and and quite right too prudence I nodded he is indeed worth any good woman's thoughts Let it be your duty to think of him and for him henceforth Wait she said wait and turning she fled through the doorway and across the road Swift and graceful as any bird and presently was back again with something hidden in her apron he be a strong man and terrible in his wrath said she and I love him But take this with you and if it must be use it because I do love him Now as she said this she drew from her apron that same brass bound pistol that had served me so well against the ghost and Thrust it into my hand take it mr. Peter take it, but oh 
here a great sob choked her voice don't don't use it if if you can help it for my sake why prue said i touching her bowed head very tenderly how can you think i would go up against my friend with death in my hand heaven forbid so i laid aside the weapon and clapping on my hat strode out into the glory of the summer morning but left her weeping in the shadows chapter seven which narrates a somewhat remarkable conversation to find a man in camborne woods even so big a man as black george would seem as hard a matter as to find the needle in the proverbial bottle of hay the sun crept westward the day declined into evening yet hungry though i was i persevered in my search not so much in the hope of finding him in the which i knew i must be guided altogether by chance as from a disinclination to return just yet to the cottage it would be miserable there at this hour i told myself miserable and lonely yet why should i be lonely i who had gloried in my solitude hitherto whence then had come this change while i stood thus seeking an answer to this self-imposed question and finding none i heard someone approach whistling and looking about beheld a fellow with an axe upon his shoulder who strode along at a good pace keeping time to his whistle he gave me a cheery greeting as he came up but without stopping you seem in a hurry said i ah grinned the man over his shoulder cause why cause i be going home home said i to supper he nodded and forthwith began to whistle again while i stood listening till the clear notes had died away home said i for the second time and there came upon me a feeling of desolation such as i had never known even in my neglected boyhood's days home truly a sweet word a comfortable word the memory of which has been as oil and wine to many a sick and weary traveller upon this broad highway of life a little word and yet one which may come betwixt a man and temptation covering him like a shield roof and walls be they cottage or mansion do not make home thought i rather it is the atmosphere of mutual love the intimacies of thought the joys and sorrows endured together and the never failing sympathy that bond invisible yet stronger than death and because i had hitherto known nothing of this i was possessed of a great envy for this axe fellow as i walked on through the wood now as i went it was as if there were two voices arguing together within me whereof ensued the following triangular conversation myself yet i have my books i will go to my lonely cottage and bury myself among my books first voice assuredly is it for a philosopher to envy a whistling axe fellow go to second voice far better a home and loving companionship than all the philosophy of all the schools surely happiness is greater than learning and more to be desired than wisdom first voice better rather than destiny had never sent her to you myself rubbing my chin very hard and staring at nothing in particular her second voice her to be sure she who has been in your thoughts all day long first voice with lofty disdain crass folly a woman utterly unknown who came heralded by the roar of wind and the rush of rain a creature born of the tempest with flame in her eyes and hair and fire in the scarlet of her mouth a fierce passionate being given to hot impulse even to the taking of a man's life but said i somewhat diffidently the fellow was a proof scoundrel first voice bellowing sophistry sophistry even supposing he was the greatest of villains does that make her less a murderess in intent myself hum first voice roaring of course not again can this woman even faintly compare with your ideal of what a woman should be this shrew this termagant can a woman whose hand has the strength to level a pistol and whose mind the will to use it be of a gentle nature clinging sweet second voice sotto and sticky first voice howling of course not preposterous hereupon finding no answer i strode on through the alleys of the wood but when i had gone some distance i stopped again for there rushed over me the recollection of the tender pity of her eyes and the gentle touch of her hand as when she had bound up my hurts 
Nevertheless, said I doggedly, her face can grow more beautiful with pity, and surely no woman's hand could be lighter or more gentle. First voice, with withering contempt, our Peter fellow is like to become a preposterous ass. But unheeding, I thrust my hand into my breast, and drew out a small handful of cambric, whence came a faint perfume of violets, and, closing my eyes, it seemed that she was kneeling before me, her arms about my neck, as when she had bound this handkerchief about my bleeding temples. Truly, said I, for that one sweet act alone, a woman might be worth dying for. Second voice, or better still, living for. First voice, in high indignation, Boulder dash, sir, sentimental boulder dash. Second voice, a truth incontrovertible. Folly, said I, and threw the handkerchief from me. But next moment, moved by a sudden impulse, I stooped and picked it up again. First voice, our Peter fellow is becoming the fool of fools. Myself, no, of that there is not the slightest fear, because she is gone. And thus I remained staring at the handkerchief for a great while. End of section 19section twenty of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the broad highway by geoffrey farnell book two chapter eight in which i see a vision in the glory of the moon and eat of a poached rabbit the moon was rising as, hungry and weary, I came to that steep descent I have mentioned more than once, which leads down into the hollow, and her pale radiance was already upon the world, a sleeping world wherein I seemed alone, and as I stood to gaze upon the wonder of the heavens and the serene beauty of the earth, the clock in Cranbrook's church chimed nine. All about me was a soft stirring of leaves and the rustle of things unseen, which was the breathing of a sleeping host. Born to my nostrils came the scent of wood and herb and dewy earth, while up stealing from the shadow of the trees below, the voice of the brook reached me, singing its never-ending song, now loud and clear, now sinking to a rippling murmur. A melody of joy and sorrow, of laughter, and tears like the greater melody of life and presently i descended into the shadows and walking on the side of the brook sat me down upon a great boulder and straightway my weariness and hunger were forgotten and i fell a-dreaming truly it was a night to dream in a white night full of the moon and the magic of the moon slowly she mounted upwards peeping down at me through whispering leaves, checkering the shadows with silver, and turning the brook into a path of silver for the feet of fairies. Yes, indeed, the very air seemed fraught with a magic whereby the unreal became the real, and things impossible the manifestly possible. And so, staring up at the moon's pale loveliness, I dreamed the deathless dreams of long-dead poets and romancers, wherein were the notes of dreamy lutes the soft whisper of trailing garments and sighing voices that called beneath the breath between petrarch's laura and dante's beatrice came one as proud and gracious and beautiful as they deep-bosomed broad-hipped with a red red mouth and a subtle witchery of the eyes i dreamed of nymphs and satyrs of fauns and dryads and of the young Endymion, who, on just such another night, in just such another leafy bower, waited the coming of his goddess. Now, as I sat thus, chin in hand, I heard a little sound behind me, the rustling of leaves, and turning my head, beheld one who stood half in shadow, half in moonlight, looking down at me beneath the shy languor of drooping lids, with eyes hidden by their lashes a woman tall and fair as strong as diane's self very still she stood and half wistful 
as if waiting for me to speak and very silent i sat staring up at her as she had been the embodiment of my dreams conjured up by the magic of the night while from the mysteries of the woods stole the soft sweet song of a nightingale charmian said i at last speaking almost in a whisper surely this was the sweet goddess herself and i the wandering shepherd on mount ida's solitude charmian said i again you have come then with the words i rose you have come then i repeated but now she sighed a little and turning her head away laughed very sweet and low and sighed again were you expecting me i i think i was that is i i don't know i stammered then you are not very surprised to see me no and you are not very sorry to see me no and you are not very glad to see me yes here there fell a silence between us yet a silence that was full of leafy stirrings soft night noises and the languorous murmur of the brook presently charmian reached out a hand broke off a twig of willow and began to turn it round and round in her white fingers while i sought vainly for something to say when i went away this morning she began at last looking down at the twig i didn't think i should ever come back again no i i suppose not said i awkwardly but you see i had no money no money not a penny it was not until i had walked a long long way and was very tired and terribly hungry that i found i hadn't enough to buy even a crust of bread and there was three pounds fifteen shillings and sixpence in donald's old shoe said i sevenpence she corrected sevenpence said i in some surprise three pounds fifteen shillings and sevenpence i counted it oh said i she nodded and in the other i found a small very curiously shaped piece of wood ah oh, yes i've been looking for that all week you see when i made my table by some miscalculation one leg persisted in coming out shorter than the others which necessitated its being shored up by a book until i made that block mr peter vibart's virgil book she said nodding to the twig yes said i somewhat disconcerted it was a pity to use a book she went on still very intent upon the twig even if that book does belong to a man with such a name as peter vibart now presently seeing i was silent she stole a glance at me and looking laughed but she continued more seriously this has nothing to do with you of course nor me for that matter and i was trying to tell you how hungry how hatefully hungry i was and i couldn't beg could i and so i i you came back said i i came back being hungry famishing three pounds fifteen shillings and sevenpence is not a great sum said i but perhaps it will enable you to reach your family i'm afraid not you see i have no family your friends then I have no friends i am alone in the world oh said i and turned to stare down into the brook for i could think only that she was alone and solitary even as i which seemed like an invisible bond between us drawing us each nearer the other whereat i felt ridiculously pleased that this should be so no said charmian still intent upon the twig i have neither friends nor family nor money and so being hungry i came back here and ate up all the bacon why i hadn't much left if i remember six slices now as she stood half in shadow half in moonlight i could not help but be conscious of her loveliness she was no pretty woman beneath the high beauty of her face lay a dormant power that is ever at odds with prettiness and before which i vaguely felt at a loss and yet because of her warm beauty because of the elusive witchery of her eyes the soft sweet column of the neck and the sway of the figure in the moonlight because she was no goddess and i no shepherd in arcadia 
I clasped my hands behind me and turned to look down into the stream. Indeed, said I, speaking my thought aloud, this is no place for a woman, after all. No, she said very softly. No, although, to be sure, there are worse places. Yes, she said, I suppose so. Then again, it is very far removed from the world, so that a woman must needs be cut off from all those little delicacies and refinements that are supposed to be essential to her existence. Yes, she sighed. Though what, I continued, what on earth would be the use of a harp, let us say, or a pair of curling irons in this wilderness, I don't know. One could play upon the one and curl one's hair with the other. And there's a deal of pleasure to be had from both, said she. Then also, I pursued, this place, as I told you, is said to be haunted. Not, I went on, seeing that she was silent, not that you believe in such things, of course. But the cottage is very rough and ill and clumsily furnished, though, to be sure, it might be made comfortable enough, and... Well, she inquired as I paused, then said i and was silent for a long time watching the play of the moonbeams on the rippling water well said she again at last then said i if you are friendless god forbid that i should refuse you the shelter of even such a place as this so if you are homeless and without money stay here if you will so long as it pleases you i kept my eyes directed to the running water at my feet as I waited her answer, and it seemed a very long time before she spoke. Are you fond of stewed rabbit? Rabbit? said I, staring. With onions? Onions? Oh, I can cook a little, and supper is waiting. Supper? If you are hungry. I am ravenous. Then why not come home and eat it? Home? instead of echoing my words and staring the poor moon out of countenance. Come, and with the word she turned and led the way to the cottage, and behold, the candles were lighted, the table was spread with a snowy cloth, and a pot simmered upon the hob, a hob that gave forth an odour delectable, and over which Charmian bent forthwith, and into which she gazed with an anxious brow, and thrust an inquiring fork. I think it's all right. I'm sure of it, said I, inhaling the appetizing aroma. But pray, where did you get it? A man sold it to me. He had a lot of them. Huh, said I, probably poached. I bought this for sixpence out of the old shoe. Sixpence? Then they certainly were poached. These are the Camborne woods, and everything upon them, fish, flesh, or fowl, living or dead, belongs to the Lady Sophia Sefton of Camborne. Then perhaps we had better not eat it, said she, glancing at me over her shoulder. But meeting my eye, she laughed, and so we presently sat down to supper, and, poached though it may have been, that rabbit made a truly noble end notwithstanding. End of Book Two, Chapter Eight Section 21 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Book 2, Chapter 9. Which relates somewhat of Charmian Brown. We were sitting in the moonlight. Now, said Charmian, staring up at the luminous heaven, let us talk. Willingly, I answered, let us talk of stars. No, let us talk of ourselves. As you please. Very well, you begin. Well, I am a blacksmith. Yes, so you told me before. And I make horseshoes. He is a blacksmith and makes horseshoes, says Charmian, nodding at the moon. And I live here, in this solitude, very contentedly, so that it is only reasonable suppose that I shall continue to live here and make horseshoes, 
though really i broke off letting my eyes wander from my companion's upturned face back to the glowing sky once more there is little i could tell you about so commonplace a person as myself that is likely to interest you no said charmian evidently not here my gaze came down to her face again so quickly that I fancied I detected the ghost of a smile upon her lips. Then, said I, by all means let us talk of something else. Yes, she agreed. Let us talk of the woman Charmian. Charmian Brown. A tress of hair had come loose, and hung low over her brow, and in its shadow her eyes seemed more elusive, more mocking than ever and while our glances met she put up a hand and began to wind this glossy tress round and round her finger well said she well said i supposing you begin but is she likely to interest you i think so yes aren't you sure then quite sure certainly then why don't you say so i thought you would take that for granted a woman should take nothing for granted, sir. Then, said I, supposing you begin. I've half a mind not to, she retorted, curling the tress of hair again, and then suddenly, what do you think of Charmian Brown? I think of her as little as I can. Indeed, sir? Indeed, said I. And why, pray? Because, said I, knocking the ashes from my pipe, because the more I think about her, the more incomprehensible she becomes. Have you known many women? Very few, I confess, but... But... I am not altogether unfamiliar with the sex, for I have known a great number in books. Our blacksmith, said Charmian, addressing the moon again, has known many women in books. His knowledge is therefore profound. And she laughed. May I ask why you laugh at me? Oh, said she, don't you know that women in books and women out of books are no more the same than day and night, or summer and winter? And yet there are thousands of women who exist for us in books only. Laura, Beatrice, Trojan Helen, Aspasia, and Glorious Phryne, and hosts of others, I demurred. Yes, but they exist for us only as their historians permit them as their biographers saw or imagined them would petrarch ever have permitted laura to do an ungracious act or anything which to his masculine understanding seemed unfeminine and would dante have mentioned it had beatrice been guilty of one a man can no more understand a woman from the reading of books than he can learn latin or greek from staring at the sky of that said i shaking my head of that I am not so sure. Then, personally, you know very little concerning women, she inquired. I have always been too busy, said I. Here, Charmian turned to look at me again. Too busy, she repeated, as though she had not heard aright. Too busy? Much too busy. Now, when I said this, she laughed, and then she frowned, and then she laughed again. You would much rather make a horseshoe than talk with a woman, perhaps. Yes, I think I would. Oh, said Charmian, frowning again. But this time she did not look at me. You see, I explained, turning my empty pipe over and over rather aimlessly. When I make a horseshoe, I take a piece of iron and, having heated it, I bend and shape it, and with every hammer stroke I see it growing into what I would have it. I am sure of it from start to finish. Now, with a woman, it is different. You mean that you cannot bend and shape her like your horseshoe, still without looking towards me? I mean that, that I fear I should never be quite sure of a woman as I am of my horseshoe. Why, you see, said Charmian, beginning to braid the tress of hair, a woman cannot at any time be said to resemble a horseshoe very much, can she? Surely, said I, surely you know what I mean. 
There are Laura and Beatrice and Helen and Aspasia and Phryne and hosts of others, said Charmian, nodding to the moon again. Oh, yes, our blacksmith has read of so many women in books that he has no more idea of women out of books than I of Sanskrit. And in a little while, seeing I was silent, she condescended to glance towards me. Then, I suppose, under the circumstances, you have never been in love. In love, I repeated and dropped my pipe. In love. The Lord forbid. Why, pray? Because love is a disease, a madness coming between a man and his life's work. Love, said I, it is a calamity. Never having been in love himself, our blacksmith very naturally knows all about it, said Charmian to the moon. I speak only of such things as I have read, I began. More books, she sighed. Words of men much wiser than I. Poets and philosophers written when they were old and grey-headed, Charmian broke in, when they were quite incapable of judging the matter, though many a great philosopher loved now, didn't he? To be sure, said I, rather hipped. Dionysius Lambienus, I think, says somewhere, that a woman with a big mouth is infinitely sweeter in the kissing, and... Do you suppose he read that in a book? she inquired, glancing at me sideways. Why, as to that, I answered, a philosopher may love, but not for the mere sake of loving. For whose sake, then, I wonder? A man who esteems trifles for their own sake is a trifler, but one who values them rather for the deductions that may be drawn from them. He is a philosopher. Charmian rose and stood looking down at me very strangely. So, said she, throwing back her head, so throned in lofty might, superior Mr. Smith thinks love a trifle, does he? My name is Vibart, as I think you know, said I, stung by her look or her tone or both. Yes, she answered, seeming to look down at me from an immeasurable attitude. But I prefer to know him just now as superior Mr. Smith. As you will, said I, and rose also. But even then, though she had to look up to me, I had the same inward conviction that her eyes were regarding me from a great height, wherefore I attempted, quite unsuccessfully, to light my pipe. And after I had struck flint and steel vainly, perhaps a dozen times, Charmian took the box from me, and, igniting the tinder, held it for me while I lighted my tobacco. Thank you, said I, as she returned the box, and then I saw that she was smiling. Talking of Charmian Brown, I began, but we are not. Then suppose you begin. Do you really wish to hear about that humble person? Very much. Then you must know in the first place that she is old, sir, dreadfully old. But, said I, she really cannot be more than twenty-three or four at the most. She is just twenty-one, returned Charmian rather hastily, I thought quite a child no indeed it is experience that ages one and by experience she is quite two hundred the wonder is that she still lives indeed it is and being of such a ripe age it is probable that she at any rate has been in love scores of times oh said i puffing very hard at my pipe or fancied so said charmian that, I replied, that is a very different thing. Do you think so? Well, isn't it? Perhaps. Very well, then. Continue, I beg. Now this woman, Charmian went on, beginning to curl the tress of hair again, hating the world about her with its shams, its hypocrisy and cruelty, ran away from it all one day with a villain. And why with a villain? because he was a villain that said i turning to look at her that i do not understand no i didn't suppose you would she answered hm said i rubbing my chin and why did you run away from him because he was a villain that was very illogical said i but very sensible sir here there fell a silence between us 
and as we walked now and then her gown would brush my knee or her shoulder touch mine for the path was very narrow and did you i began suddenly and stopped did i what sir did you love him said i staring straight in front of me i ran away from him and do you love him I suppose, said Charmian, speaking very slowly, I suppose you cannot understand a woman hating and loving a man, admiring and despising him, both at the same time. No, I can't. Can you understand one glorying in the tempest that may destroy her, riding a fierce horse that may crush her, or being attracted by a will strong and masterful, before which all must yield or break? I think I can then said Charmian this man is strong and wild and very masterful and so I ran away with him and do you love him we walked on some distance ere she answered I don't know not sure then no after this we fell silent altogether yet once when I happened to glance at her I saw that her eyes were very bright beneath the shadow of her drooping lashes and that her lips were smiling and I pondered very deeply as to why this should be re-entering the cottage I closed the door and waited the while she lighted my candle and having taken the candle from her hand I bade her good night but paused at the door of my chamber you feel quite safe here quite safe Despite the color of my hair and eyes, you have no fear of Peter Smith? None. Because he is neither fierce nor wild nor masterful? Because he is neither fierce nor wild, she echoed. Nor masterful, said I. Nor masterful, said Charmian, with averted head. So I opened the door, but, even then, must needs turn back again. Do you think I am so very different from him? As different as day from night as the lamb from the wolf said she without looking at me good night Peter Good night said I and so going into my room. I closed the door behind me a Lamb said I tearing off my neckcloth and sat for some time listening to her footsteps and the soft rustle of her petticoats going to and fro a Lamb said I again and slowly drew off my coat as I did so a little cambric handkerchief fell to the floor and I kicked it forthwith into a corner a Lamb said I for the third time, but at this moment came a light tap upon the door Yes, said I without moving. Oh How is your injured thumb? Thank you. It is as well as can be expected Does it pain you very much? It is not unbearable said I Good night Peter and I heard her move away, but presently she was back again. Oh, Peter, well, are you frowning? I, I think I was. Why? When you frown, you are very like him, and have the same square set of the mouth and chin. When you are angry, so don't, please don't frown, Peter. Good night. Good night, Charmian, said I, and stooping, I picked up the little handkerchief and thrust it under my pillow. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine. Section Twenty Two of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE BROAD HIGHWAY BY GEOFFREY FARNELL BOOK TWO CHAPTER TEN I AM SUSPECTED OF THE BLACK ART VIBERT The word had been uttered close behind me, and very softly, yet I started at this sudden mention of my name, and stood for a moment with my hammer poised above the anvil, ere I turned and faced the speaker. He was a tall man with a stubbly growth of grizzled hair around his lank jaws, and he was leaning in at that window of the smithy, which gave upon a certain grassy back lane. "'You spoke, I think,' said I. 
I said, Vibert. Well? Well. And why should you say Vibert? And why should you start? Beneath the broad flapping hat his eyes glowed with a sudden intensity as he waited my answer. It is familiar, said I. Ha! Ah, familiar, he repeated, and his features were suddenly contorted as with a strong convulsion, and his teeth gleamed between his pallid lips. My hammer was yet in my grasp, and, as I met this baleful look, my fingers tightened instinctively around the shaft. Familiar? said he again. Yes, I nodded, like your face, for it would almost seem I have seen you somewhere before, and I seldom forget faces. Nor do I, said the man. Now, while we were thus fronted each other, there came the sound of approaching footsteps, and John Pringle, the carrier, appeared, followed by the pessimistic job. Marnin, Peter, the more shoes, began John, pausing just outside the smithy door, you was to finish em this afternoon, if so be as they been done, you being short-handed without George, why, I can wait. Now, during this speech, I was aware that both his and Job's eyes had wandered from my bandaged thumb to my bare throat, and become fixed there. Come in and sit down, said I, nodding to each as I blew up the fire. Come in. For a moment they hesitated, then John stepped gingerly into the smithy closely followed by Job, and watching them beneath my brows as I stooped above the shaft of the bellows, I saw each of them furtively cross his fingers. "'Why do you do that, John Pringle?' said I. "'Do what, Peter?' "'Cross your fingers.' "'Why, you see, Peter,' said John, glancing in turn at the floor, the rafters, the fire, and the anvil, but never at me. "'You see, it be just a kind of way of mine.' "'But why does Job do the same?' "'And why do you look at a man so sharp and sun-like?' retorted Job sullenly. "'Dang me, if it aren't enough to send cold shivers up a chap's spine. "'I never see such a pair of eyes afore, no, nor don't want to again.' "'Nonsense,' said I. "'My eyes can't hurt you.' "'And how am I to know that? "'How am I to be sure of that, and you with your throat all worn with devil's claws and demon's clutches? "'It being natural.' Old Amos says so, and I says so. Pure folly, said I, plucking the iron from the fire, and beginning to beat and shape it with my hammer. But presently, remembering the strange man who had spoken my name, I looked up, and then I saw that he was gone. Where is he? said I, involuntarily. Where's who? inquired John Pringle, glancing about uneasily. The fellow who was talking to me as you came up? I didn't see no fellow said Job, looking at John and edging nearer the door. "'Nor me neither,' chimed in John Pringle, looking at Job. "'Why, he was leaning in at the window here, not a minute ago,' said I, and plunging the half-finished horseshoe back into the fire, I stepped out into the road. But the man was nowhere to be seen. "'Very strange,' said I. "'What might he have been like now?' inquired John. "'He was tall and thin and wore a big flapping hat.' John Pringle coughed, scratched his chin, and coughed again. "'What is it, John?' I inquired. "'Why, then, you couldn't happen to notice, in wearing his hat, you couldn't happen to notice if he had ever a pair of horns, Peter?' "'Horns!' I exclaimed. Uh, "'Or a tail, Peter?' "'Or even a oof now,' suggested Job. "'Come,' said I, looking from one to the other. "'What might you be driving at?' "'Why, you see, Peter,' answered John, coughing again and scratching his chin harder than before, "'you see, Peter, it aren't natural for a human being to go vanishing away like this here. "'If it were a man, as you were a-talking to—' "'Which I doubt,' muttered Job. "'If it were a man, Peter, then I axes you, where is that man?' Before I could answer this pointed question, old Joel Amos hobbled up. He paused on the threshold to address someone over his shoulder. "'Come on, James, eerie be. Come forward, James, like a man.' Thus adjured, another individual appeared, a somewhat flaccid-looking individual, with colourless hair and eyes, one who seemed to exhale an air of apology, as it were, from the hobnailed boot upon the floor to the grimy forefinger that touched the straw-like hair in salutation. "'Morning, Peter,' said old Amos. 
This year is Dutton. How do you do? said I, acknowledging the introduction. And what can I do for Mr. Dutton? The latter, instead of replying, took out a vivid Belcher handkerchief and apologetically mopped his face. Speak up, James Dutton, said old Amos. Lord, exclaimed Dutton, Lord, I do be that ought. You speak for I, Amos, do. Well, began old Amos, not ill-pleased, this ere Dutton wants to ask you a question. E do, Peter. I shall be glad to answer it if I can, I returned. You ear that? Well, ax your question, James Dutton, commanded the old man. Why, you see, Amos, began Dutton, positively reeking apology, I do be that uncommon ought. You axin. Why, then, Peter, began Amos, with great unction, it's as pigs. Pigs? I exclaimed, staring. Ah, pigs, Peter, nodded old Amos. Dutton's pigs. Is thou farrowed last week, at three in the morning, nine of them? Well, said I, wondering more and more. Well, Peter, they was a fine hearty lot, and all a-doing well, till last Monday. Indeed, said I. Last Monday night, four of em sickened and died. Most unfortunate, said I. And the rest has never been the same since. Probably ate something that disagreed with them, said I, picking up my hammer and laying it down again. Old Amos smiled and shook his head. You know James Dutton's pigs died, don't you, Peter? I really can't say that I do. Yet you pass it every day on your way to the Aller. It lies just behind Simon's oast house, as James himself will tell ye. So it do, interpolated Dutton, with an apologetic nod, which, leastways, if it don't, can't be no of. Having delivered himself of which, he buried his face in the belcher handkerchief. Now, one evening, Peter, continued old Amos, one evening you leaned over the fence of that there pigsty, and stood a-looking at they pigs for, perhaps, ten minutes. Did I? Yeah, that ye did. James Dutton see thee, and his wife, she see ye too, and I see ye. Then, said I, probably I did, well? Well, said the old man, looking round upon his hearers, and bringing out each word with the greatest unction, that your evening were last Monday evening, as ever was, the very same hour as Dutton's pig sickened and died. Hereupon John Pringle and Job rose simultaneously from where they had been sitting, and retreated precipitately at the door. Lord! exclaimed John. I might a note it, said Job, drawing a cross in the air with his finger. And so James Dutton wants to ax you to take it off, Peter, said old Amos. To take what off? Why, the spell, for sure. Hereupon I gave free play to my amusement, and laughed and laughed, while the others watched me with varying expressions. And so you think that I bewitched Dutton's pigs, do you? said I at last, glancing from old Amos to this perspiring apology, who immediately began to mop his face and neck again. And why? I continued, seeing that nobody appeared willing to speak. Why should you think it of me? Why, Peter, you bean't like ordinary folk, your eyes go through and through a man, and then, Peter, I mind as you come a-walking into Sisner's one night from Lord knows where, all covered with dust and with a pack on your back. You are wrong there, Amos, said I. It was afternoon when I came, and the ancient was with me. Ah, and where did you find you, Peter? Come, speak up and tell us. In the hollow, I answered. Ah, he found he in the very spot where the wanderer o' the roads hung himself sixty and six years ago. There is nothing very strange in that, said I. What's more, you come into the village and beat Black George throwing the ammer and him the strongest man in all the south country. I beat him because he did not do his best. So there is nothing strange in that either. And then you lives all alone in that there ghastly oller, and you fights and struggles with devils and demons, all in the wind and rain and tearing tempest. And what's most of all, you comes back alive, and what's more yet, with devil marks upon ye and your throat all tore with claws. 
old gaffer be over proud of finding ye, but old gaffer be doddering, doddering ye be, and foolish with years, ye'd ha' done much better to left ye alone. I've eared of folk selling theirselves to the devil afore now. I've likewise eared of the evil eye afore now. Ah, and knows one when I sees it. Nonsense, said I sternly. Nonsense! This talk of ghosts and devils is sheer folly. I am a man like the rest of you, and could not wish you ill, even if I would come. Let us all shake hands and forget this folly. And I extended my hand to old Amos. He glanced from it to my face, and immediately lowering his eyes shook his head. "'It's the evil eye,' said he, and drew a cross upon the floor with his stick. "'The evil eye!' "'Nonsense!' said I again. "'My eye is no more evil than yours, or Job's. I never wished any man harm yet, nor wronged one, and I hope I never may. As for Mr. Dutton's pigs, if he take better care of them and keep them out of the damp, they will probably thrive better than ever. Come, shake hands!' But one by one they edged their way to the door after old Amos, until only John Pringle was left. He, for a moment, stood hesitating. Then, suddenly reaching out, he seized my hand and shook it twice. "'I'll call for them more shoes in the morning, Peter,' said he, and vanished. "'After all,' I heard him say as he joined the others, "'it's summat to have shook hands with a chap as fights with demons.' Chapter 11 A Shadow in the Hedge Over the uplands to my left the moon was peeping at me, very broad and yellow, as yet casting long shadows athwart my way. The air was heavy with the perfume of honeysuckle a bloom in the hedges, a warm, still air wherein a deep silence brooded, and in which leaf fluttered not and twig stirred not, but it was none of this I held in my thoughts as I strode along, whistling softly as I went. Yet in a while, chancing to lift my eyes, I beheld the object of my reverie coming towards me through the shadows. "'Why, Charmian,' said I, uncovering my head. "'Why, Peter! Did you come to meet me? It must be nearly nine o'clock, sir. Yes, I had to finish some work. Did anyone pass you on the road? Not a soul. Peter, have you an enemy? Not that I know of, unless it be myself.' Epictetus says somewhere that, "'Oh, Peter, how dreadfully quiet everything is,' said she, and shivered. "'Are you cold?' "'No, but it is so dreadfully still.' Now in one place the lane, narrowing suddenly, led between high banks crowned with bushes, so that it was very dark there. As we entered this gloom, Charmian suddenly drew closer to my side and slipped her hand beneath my arm and into my clasp and the touch of her fingers was like ice. "'Your hand is very cold,' said I, but she only laughed, yet I felt her shiver as she pressed herself close against me. And now it was she who talked, and I who walked in silence, or answered at random, for I was conscious only of the clasp of her fingers and the soft pressure of hip and shoulder. So we passed through this lane of shadows, walking neither fast nor slow, and ever her cold fingers clasped my fingers, and her shoulder pressed my arm while she talked and laughed, but of what I know not until we had left the dark place behind. Then she sighed deeply and turned, and drew her arm from mine almost sharply, and stood looking back, with her two hands pressed upon her bosom. "'What is it?' "'Look!' she whispered, pointing. "'There, where it's darkest, look!' Now, following the direction of her finger, I saw something that skulked amid the shadows, something that slunk away and vanished as I watched. "'A man!' I exclaimed, and would have started in pursuit, but Charmian's hands were upon my arm, strong and compelling. "'Are you mad?' cried she angrily. "'Would you give him the opportunity I prevented? He was waiting there to, to, to shoot you, I think.' And after we had gone on some little way, I spoke. "'Was that why you came to meet me?' "'Yes.' "'And kept so close beside me?' "'Yes.' "'Ah, oh, yes, to be sure,' said I, and walked on in silence, and now I noticed that she kept as far from me as the path would allow. "'Are you thinking me very unmaidenly again, sir?' "'No,' I answered, "'no.' "'You see, I had no other way.' 
Had I told you that there was a man hidden in the hedge, you would have gone to look, and then something dreadful would have happened. How came you to know he was there? Why, after I had prepared supper, I climbed that steep path which leads to the road, and sat down upon the fallen tree that lies there, to watch for you, and as I sat there I saw a man come hurrying down the road. A very big man? Yeah, very tall he seemed, and, as I watched, he crept in behind the hedge. While I was wondering at this, I heard your step on the road, and you were whistling. And yet I seldom whistle. It was you. I knew your step. Did you, Charmian? I do wish you would not interrupt, sir. I beg your pardon, said I humbly. And then I saw you coming, and the man saw you too, for he crouched suddenly. I could only see him dimly in the shadow of the hedge, but he looked murderous, and it seemed to me that if you reached his hiding place before I did, something terrible would happen, and so you came to meet me. Yes and walked close beside me so that you were between me and the shadow of the hedge? Yes. And I thought... I began and stopped. Well, Peter? Here she turned and gave me a swift glance beneath her lashes. That it was because you were, perhaps, rather glad to see me. Charmian did not speak. Indeed, she was so very silent that I would have given much to have seen her face just then, but the light was very dim, as I have said. Moreover, she had turned her shoulder towards me. But I am grateful to you, I went on, very grateful, and it was very brave of you. Thank you, sir, she answered in a very small voice, and I more than suspected that she was laughing at me. Not, I therefore continued, that there was any real danger. What do you mean? she asked quickly. I mean that in all probability the man you saw was Black George, a very good friend of mine who, though he may imagine he has a grudge against me, is too much of a man to lie in wait to do me hurt. Then why should he hide in the hedge? Because he committed the mistake of throwing the town beetle over the churchyard wall, and is, consequently, in hiding for the present. He has an ill-sounding name. And is the manliest, gentlest, truest, and the worthiest fellow that ever wore the leather apron. Seeing how perseveringly she kept the whole breadth of the path between us, I presently fell back and walked behind her. Now her head was bent, and thus I could not but remark the little curls and tendrils of hair upon her neck, whose sole object seemed to be to make the white skin more white, by contrast. Peter, said she suddenly, speaking over her shoulder, of what are you thinking? Of a certain steak pasty that was promised for my supper. I answered immediately, mendacious. Oh! And what? I inquired. What were you thinking? I was thinking, Peter, that the shadow in the hedge may not have been Black George after all. End of Book 2, Chapters 10 and 11all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Book 2, Chapters 12 and 13 Who comes? This table wobbles, said Charmian. It does, said I, but then I notice that the block is misplaced again. Then why use a block? A book is so clumsy, I began. Or a book. Why not cut down the long legs to match a short one? That is really an excellent idea. Then why didn't you before? Because, to be frank with you, it never occurred to me. I suppose you are better as a blacksmith than as a carpenter, aren't you, Peter? And seeing I could find no answer worthy of retort, she laughed, and sitting down, watched me while I took my saw forthwith and shortened the three long legs as she had suggested. Having done which, to our common satisfaction, seeing the moon was rising, we went and sat down on the bench beside the cottage door. And are you a very good blacksmith? she pursued, turning to regard me, chin in hand. I can swing a hammer or shoe a horse with any smith in Kent, except Black George, and he is the best in all the South Country. And is that a very great achievement, Peter? It is not a despicable one. 
Are you quite satisfied to be able to shoe horses well, sir? It is far better to be a good blacksmith than a bad poet or an incompetent prime minister. Meaning that you would rather succeed in the little thing than fail in the great? With your permission I will smoke, said I. Surely, she went on, nodding her permission, surely it is nobler to be a great failure rather than a mean success. Success is very sweet, Charmian, even in the smallest thing. For instance, said I, pointing to the cottage door that stood open beside her, when I built that door and saw it swing on its hinges, I was as proud of it as though it had been a really good door, interpolated Charmian, instead of a bad one. A bad one, Charmian? It's a very clumsy door, and has neither bolt nor lock. There are no thieves hereabouts, and even if they were, they would not dare to set foot in the hollow after dark. And then, unless one closes it with great care, it sticks very tight. That, obviating the necessity for a latch, is rather to be commended, said I. Besides, it is a very ill-fitting door, Peter. I have seen worse, and it will be very draughty in cold weather. A blanket hung across will remedy that. Still, it can hardly be called a very good door, can it, Peter? Here I lighted my pipe without answering. I suppose you make horseshoes much better than you make doors? I puffed at my pipe in silence. You are not angry because I found fault with your door, are you, Peter? Angry? said I. Not in the least. I am sorry for that. Why sorry? Are you never angry, Peter? Seldom, I hope. I should like to see you so just once. Finding nothing to say in answer to this, I smoked my negro head pipe and stared at the moon which was looking down at us through a maze of tree trunks and branches. Referring to horseshoes, said Charmian at last, are you content to be a blacksmith all your days? Yes, I think I am. Were you never ambitious then? Ambition is like rain, breaking itself upon what it falls on. At least so Bacon says, and... Oh, bother Bacon! Were you never ambitious, Peter? I was a great dreamer. A dreamer! she exclaimed with fine scorn. Are dreamers ever ambitious? Indeed, they are the most truly ambitious, I retorted. Their dreams are so vast, so infinite, so far beyond all puny human strength and capacity, that they, perforce, must remain dreamers always. Epictetus himself— I wish, sighed Charmian, I do wish— What do you wish? That you were not— That I was not— Such a pedant— Pedant? said I, somewhat disconcerted. And you have a way of echoing my words that is very irritating. I beg your pardon, said I, feeling much like a chidden schoolboy, and I am sorry you should think me a pedant. And you are so dreadfully precise and serious, she continued. Am I, Charmian? And so very solemn and austere and so ponderous and egotistical and calm. Yes, you are hatefully calm and placid, aren't you, Peter? And after I had smoked thoughtfully a while, I sighed. <sighs> yes, I fear I may seem so. Oh, I forgive you. Thank you. Though you needn't be so annoyingly humble about it, said she, and frowned, and even while she frowned, laughed and shook her head. And pray, why do you laugh? Because, oh, Peter, you're such a boy. So you told me once before, said I biting my pipe stem viciously. Did I, Peter? You also called me a lamb, I remember. At least you suggested it. Did I, Peter? And she began to laugh again, but stopped all at once and rose to her feet. Peter, said she with a startled note in her voice, don't you hear something? Yes, said I. Someone is coming. Yes. And they're coming this way. Yes. Oh, how can you sit there so quietly? Do you think... She began and stopped, staring into the shadows with wide eyes. I think, said I, knocking the ashes from my pipe and laying it on the bench beside me, that, all things considered, you were wiser to go into the cottage for a while. No, oh, I couldn't do that. You would be safer, perhaps. I'm not a coward. I shall remain here, of course. But I had rather you went inside. 
and I much prefer staying where I am. Then I must ask you to go inside, Charmian. No, indeed, my mind is made up. Then I insist, Charmian. Mr. Vibert, she exclaimed, throwing up her head, you forget yourself, I think. I permit no one to order my going and coming, and I obey no man's command. Then I beg of you. And I refuse, sir. My mind is made up. And mine also, said I, rising. Why, what, what are you going to do? She cried, retreating as I advanced towards her. I'm going to carry you into the cottage. You would not dare. If you refuse to walk, how else can you get there? Said I. Anger, amazement, indignation, all these I saw in her eyes as she faced me, but anger most of all. Ah, oh, you would not dare, she said again, and with a stamp of her foot. Indeed, yes, I nodded, and now her glance wavered beneath me, her head drooped, and, with a strange little sound that was neither a laugh nor a sob, and yet something of each, she turned upon her heel, ran into the cottage, and slammed the door behind her. CHAPTER Thirteen, A PEDDLER IN ARCADIA The cottage, as I have said, was entirely hidden from the chance observer by reason of the foliage. Ash, alder, and bramble flourished luxuriantly, growing very thick and high, with here and there a great tree, but upon one side there was a little grassy glade, or clearing rather, some ten yards square, and it was towards this that my eyes were directed, as I reseated myself upon the settle beside the door, and waited the coming of the unknown. Though the shadows were too deep for my eyes to serve me, yet I could follow the newcomer's approach quite easily by the sound he made. Indeed, I was particularly struck by the prodigious rustling of leaves. Whoever it was must be big and bulky, I thought, and clad probably in a long trailing garment. All at once I knew I was observed, for the sounds ceased, and I heard nothing save the distant bark of a dog and the ripple of the brook nearby. I remained there for maybe a full minute, very still, only my fists clenched themselves as I sat listening and waiting, and that minute was an hour. You won't be wanting ever a broom now? The relief was so sudden and intense that I had much ado to keep from laughing outright. You won't be wanting ever a broom now? inquired the voice again. No, I answered, nor yet a fine leather belt with a steel buckle made in Brahmagem as ever was. Ah, oh, it's you, is it? said the peddler, and forthwith gabbing Dick stepped out of the shadows, brooms on shoulder and bulging pack upon his back, a sight of which the leafy tumult of his approach was immediately accounted for. So it's you, is it? he repeated, setting down his brooms and spitting lugubriously at the nearest patch of shadow. Yes, I answered. But what brings you here? I be going to sleep here, my chap. Ah, oh, you don't mind the ghost, then? Oh, Lord, no. There be only two things as I can't abide. Trees as ain't trees is one of them, and women's another. Women? Come, didn't I once tell you I were married? You did. Very well, then. Trees as ain't trees is bad enough, Lord knows. But women's worse. Ah, oh, said the peddler, shaking his head. A sight worse. You see, trees ain't got tongues. Leastways, not as I've ever heard tell on, and a tree never told a lie, or ate an apple, did it? What do you mean by ate an apple? I means as a tree can't tell a lie, or eat an apple, but a woman can tell a lie, which she does, frequent, and as for apples. But, I began, Eve ate an apple, didn't she? The scriptures say so, I nodded, and told a lie afterwards, didn't she? So we are given to understand. Very well, then, said the peddler. There you are. And he turned to spit into the shadow again. What's more, he continued, it were a woman as done me at my birthright. How so? Why, it were Eve as got us drove out of the Garden of Eden, weren't it? If it hadn't been for Eve, I might have been living on milk and honey. Oh, and playing with butterflies instead of being married and peddling these ear brooms. Don't talk to me of women, my chap. I can't abide him. Bah! If there is any trouble of it, you may take your Bible oath, as there's a woman about somewheres. There always is. Do you think so? 
I know so. Ain't I hearing and a seeing such all day and every day? There's Black George for one. What about him? What about him? repeated the peddler. Why, ain't his life been ruined, broke, wore away by one of them eaves? Very well, then. What do you mean? How has his life been ruined? Ah, oh, the usual way of it. George loves a girl. Girl loves George. Sugar ain't sweeter. Very well, then. Along comes another cove, a strange cove, a cove with nice white hands and soft taking ways. He talks with her and walks with her, smiles at her, and poor George ain't nowheres. Poor George's cake is dough. Ah, oh, and doughy dough at that. How do you come to know all this? How should I come to know it but from the man himself? Dick, says he, baptismal name Richard, but Dick for short. Dick, says he, do you see this ear stick? And he shows me a good stout cudgel cut out of the edge, and very neatly trimmed it were too. Ah, I see, it, George, says I. And do you see this one? says he, holding up another as like the first one P to its fellow. I sees that one too, George, says I. Well, says George, one's for him and one's for me. He can take his choice, he says, and when we do meet it's a going to be one or the other of us, he says, and what's more, he looked it. If I have to wait and wait and follow him and follow him, says George, I'll catch him alone one of these fine nights and it'll be man to man. And when did it tell you all this? This morning as ever was. Where did you see him? Oh, no, said the peddler, shaking his head. Not by no manner of means. I'm married, but I ain't that kind of a cove. What do you mean? The runners is after him, looking for him high and low, and though married, I ain't one to give a man away. I ain't a friendly cove myself, never was and never shall be. Never had a friend all my days and don't want one, but I like Black George. I pities and I despises him. Why do you despise him? Because he carries on so, all about an eve. Why, there ain't a woman breathing, as is worth a man's troubling his lead over. No, nor ever will be. Yet here is Black George ready, ah, oh, and more than willing to get himself hung, and all for a wench, a eve. Get himself hanged? I repeated. Yeah, hung. Why ain't he a-waiting and a-waiting to get at this cove? This cove with the nice white hands and the taking ways. Ain't he a-watching and a-watching to meet him some lonely night? And when he do meet him? The peddler sighed. Well? Why, there'll be bloodshed, blood, quarts of it, buckets on it. Black George'll batter this ere cove's head soft. So sure as I was baptized Richard, he'll lift this cove up in his great strong arms, and he'll throw this cove down, and he'll gore him and stamp him down under his feet, and this cove's blood'll go a-soaking and a-soaking into the grass, somewhere beneath some edge, or in some quiet corner of the woods, and the birds'll perch on this cove's breast, and flutter their wings in the cove's face, cause they'll know as this cove can never do anyone no hurt any war. Ugh! There will be blood, gallons of it. I hope not, said I. You do, do you? Most fervently. And cause why? Cause I happen to be that cove, I answered. Ah, oh, said the peddler, eyeing me more narrowly. You are, are ye? I am. Yet you ain't got white hands. They were white ones, said I. And I don't see your ways is soft nor yet taking. Nonetheless, I am that cove. Oh, repeated the peddler, and having turned this intelligence over in his mind, spat thoughtfully into the shadow again. You won't be wanting ever a broom, I think you said? No, said I. Very well, then, he nodded, and lifting his brooms made towards the cottage door. Where are you going? To sleep in this here empty hut. But it isn't empty. So much the better, nodded the peddler. Good night. And with the words he laid his hand upon the door, but as he did so it opened, and Charmian appeared. The peddler fell back three or four paces, staring with round eyes. By goals, he exclaimed. So you're married, then? Now when he said this I felt suddenly hot all over, 
even to the very tips of my ears, and for the life of me I could not have looked at Charmian. Why, why, I began, but her smooth, soft voice came to my rescue. No, he is not married, said she, far from it. Not, said the peddler, so much the better, marriage ain't love. No, nor love ain't marriage. I'm a married cove myself, so I know what I'm a saying. If folk do talk and shake their heads over ye, why let them? Only don't, don't go a-spiling things by getting churched. You're a woman, but you're a fine un, a dasher by goals, nice and straight-backed, and round and plump if I was this ere cove. No, I know what. Here, I said hastily, here, sell me a broom. The peddler drew a broom from his bundle and passed it to me. One shilling and sixpence, said he, which sum I duly paid over. Don't, he continued, pocketing his money and turning to Charmian, don't go spiling things by letting this young cove go a marrying and a churching ye. Nobody ever got married as didn't repent it some time or other. And what's more, when marriage comes in at the door, love flies out up the chimbley. And there you are. Now if you loves this young cove, why very good. If this here young cove loves you, which ain't to be wondered at, so much the better, but don't, don't go a-marrying each other, and as for the children, come, I'll take a belt, give me a belt, said I, more hastily than before. A belt, said the peddler, a belt, yes, with a fine steel buckle made in, yes, yes, said I, two shilling and sixpence, said the peddler. When I saw you last time, you offered much the same belt for a shilling, I demurred. Ah, noted the peddler, but bolts is riz. Arfa crowns the price. Take it or leave it. It's getting late, said I, slipping the money into his hand, and I'll wish you a good night. You're in a hurry about it, ain't you? Yes. Ah, oh, to be sure, nodded the fellow, looking from me to Charmian with an evil leer. Early to bed and come, get off, said I angrily. What, are you going to turn me away at this time of night? It is not so far to Sissinghurst, said I. But, Lord, I won't disturb you, and there's two rooms, ain't there? There are plenty of comfortable beds to be had at the bull. So you won't give me a night's shelter, eh? No, I answered, greatly annoyed by the fellow's persistence. And you don't want to buy nothing for the young woman? A necklace, or, say, a pair of garters? And here, meeting my eye, he shouldered his brooms hastily and moved off. And after he had gone some dozen yards or so, he paused and turned. Very well, then, he shouted. I hope, says you, gets your head knocked off. Ah, oh, and gets it knocked off soon. Having said which, he spat up into the air toward me and trudged off. End of Book 2, Chapter 13this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Section 24. Chapter 14. Concerning Black George's Letter. It was with a feeling of great relief that I watched the fellow out of sight. Nevertheless, his very presence seems to have left a blight upon all things, for he, viewing matters with the material eye of common sense, had thereby contaminated them. Even the air seemed less pure and sweet than it had been heretofore, so that, glancing over my shoulder, I was glad to see that Charmian had re-entered the cottage. Here, said I to myself, here is common sense in the shape of a half-witted peddling fellow, blundering into arcadia in the shape of a haunted cottage a woman and a man straightway our peddler being common sense misjudges us as indeed would every other common sense individual the world over for arcadia being of itself abstract and immaterial is opposed to and incapable of being understood by concrete common sense and always will be and there's the rub and yet said i thanks to the wanderer of the roads who built this cottage and hanged himself here and thanks to a highland scot who performed wonderfully on the bagpipes 
there is little chance of any common-sense vagrant venturing near arcadia again at least until the woman is gone or the man is gone or here going on to rub my chin being somewhat at a loss i found that i had been standing all this while the broom in one hand and the belt in the other and now hearing a laugh behind me i turned and saw charmian was leaning in the open doorway watching me and so you are the the cove with the white hands and the taking ways are you peter why you were actually listening then why of course i was that said i that was very undignified but very feminine peter hereupon i threw the belt from me one way and the broom the other and sitting down upon the bench began to fill my pipe rather awkwardly being conscious of charmian's mocking scrutiny poor poor black george she sighed what do you mean by that said i quickly really i can almost understand his being angry with you why you walked with her and talked with her peter like caesar you came you saw you conquered here i dragged my tinder-box from my pocket so awkwardly as to bring the lining with it and even smiled at her peter and you so rarely smile having struck flint and steel several times without success i thrust the tinder-box back into my pocket and fixed my gaze upon the moon is she so very pretty peter i stared up at the moon without answering i wonder if you bother her with your epictetus and andreas dust quotations i bit my lips and stared up at the moon or perhaps she likes your musty books and philosophy but presently finding that i would not speak charmian began to sing very sweet and low as if to herself yet when i chanced to glance towards her i found her mocking eyes still watching me now the words of her song were these oh my love's like a red red rose that's newly sprung in june oh my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune and so at last unable to bear it any longer i rose and taking my candle went into my room and closed the door but i had been there scarcely five minutes when charmian knocked oh peter i wish to speak to you please obediently i opened the door what is it charmian you dropped this from your pocket when you took out your tinder box so clumsily said she holding towards me a crumpled paper and looking down at it i saw that it was black george's letter to prudence now as i took it from her i noticed that her hand trembled while in her eyes i read fear and trouble and seeing this i was for a moment unwontedly glad and then wondered at myself you did not read it of course said i well knowing that she had yes peter it lay open and then said i speaking my thought aloud you know that she loves george he means you harm said she speaking with her head averted and if he killed you i should be spared a deal of sorrow and and mortification and other people would be no longer bothered by epictetus and dry as dust quotations she turned suddenly and crossing to the open doorway stood leaning there but indeed i went on hurriedly there is no chance of such a thing happening not the remotest black george's bark is a thousand times worse than his bite this letter means nothing and er uh, nothing at all i ended somewhat lamely for she had turned and was looking at me over her shoulder if he has to wait and wait and follow you and follow you said she in the same low tone those are merely the words of a half mad peddler said i and your blood will go soaking and soaking into the grass our peddler has a vivid imagination said i lightly but she shook her head and turned to look out upon the beauty of the night once more while i watched her chin in hand i was angry with you tonight, peter said she at length because you ordered me to do something against my will and i did it and so i tried to torment you you will forgive me for that won't you there is nothing to forgive nothing and good-night charmian 
here she turned and coming to me gave me her hand charmian brown will always think of you as a blacksmith said i as a blacksmith she repeated looking at me with a gleam in her eyes but oftener as a pedant said i as a pedant she repeated obediently but most of all as a well said i as a man she ended speaking with bent head and here again i was possessed of a sudden gladness that was out of all reason as i immediately told myself your hand is very small said i finding nothing better to say smaller even than i thought is it and she smiled and glanced up at me beneath her lashes for her head was still bent and wonderfully smooth and soft is it said she again but this time she did not look up at me now another man might have stooped and kissed those slender shapely fingers but as for me i loosed them rather suddenly and once more bidding her good night re-entered my own chamber and closed the door but to-night lying upon my bed i could not sleep and fell to watching the luminous patch of sky framed in my open casement i thought of charmian of her beauty of her strange whims and fancies her swift changing moods and her contrariness comparing her in turn to all those fair women i had ever read of or dreamed over in my books little by little however my thoughts drifted to gabbing dick and black george and with my mind's eye i could see him as he was perhaps at this very moment fierce-eyed and grim of mouth sitting beneath some hedgerow while knife in hand he trimmed and trimmed his two bludgeons one of which was to batter the life out of me from such disquieting reflections i would turn my mind to sweet-eyed prudence to the ancient the forge and the thousand and one duties of the morrow i bethought me once more of the storm of the coming of charmian of the fierce struggle in the dark of the postillion and of charmian again and yet in spite of me my thoughts would revert to george and i would see myself even as the peddler pictured me out in some secluded corner of the woods lying stiffly upon my back with glassy eyes staring up sightlessly through the whispering leaves above while my blood soaked and soaked into the green and with a blackbird singing gloriously upon my motionless breast chapter fifteen which being in parenthesis may be skipped if the reader so desire as this life is a broad highway along which we must all of us pass whether we will or no as it is a thoroughfare sometimes very hard and cruel in the going and beset by many hardships sometimes desolate and hatefully monotonous so also must its aspect sooner or later change for the better and the stony track overpassed the choking heat and dust left behind we may reach some green refreshing haven shady with trees and full of the cool sweet sound of running waters then who shall blame us if we pause unduly in this grateful shade and lying upon our backs a while gaze up through the swaying green of trees to the infinite blue beyond ere we journey on once more as soon we must to front whatsoever of good or evil lies waiting for us in the hazy distance to just such a place i am now come in this my history the record of a period which i afterwards remembered as the happiest i had ever known the memory of which must remain with me green and fragrant everlastingly if in the forthcoming pages you shall find over much of charmian i would say in the first place that it is by her and upon her that this narrative hangs and in the second place that in this part of my story i find my greatest pleasure though here indeed i am faced with a great difficulty seeing that i must depict as faithfully as may be that most difficult that most elusive of all created things to wit a woman truly i begin to fear lest my pen fail me altogether for the very reason that it is of charmian that i would tell and of charmian i understand little more than nothing for what rule has ever been devised whereby a woman's mind may be accurately gauged 
and who of all those wise ones who have written hitherto poets romancers or historians has ever fathomed the why and wherefore of the mind feminine a fool indeed were i to attempt a thing impossible but i do seek to show her to you as i saw her and to describe her in so far as i learn to know her and yet how may i begin i might tell you that her nose was neither arched nor straight but perfect none the less i might tell you of her brows straight and low of her eyes long and heavy lashed of her chin firm and round and dimpled and yet that would not be charmian for i could not paint you the scarlet witchery of her mouth with the sudden bewildering changes nor show you how sweetly the lower lip curved up to meet its mate I might tell you that to look into her eyes was like gazing down into very deep water but i could never give you their varying beauty nor the way she had with her lashes nor can i ever describe her rich warm colouring nor the lithe grace of her body thus it is that i misdoubt my pen of its task and fear that when you shall have read these pages you shall at best have caught but a very imperfect reflection of charmian as she really is wherefore i will waste no more time or paper upon so unprofitable a task but hurry on with my narrative leaving you to find her out as best you may end of section twenty four section twenty five of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Arlene Stebbins. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Section 25. Book 2. Chapter 16. Concerning, among other matters, the price of beef and the Lady Sophia Sefton of Camborne. Charmian sighed, bit the end of her pen, and sighed again. She was deep in her housekeeping accounts, adding and subtracting, and, between whiles, regarding the result with a rueful frown. Her sleeves were rolled up over her round white arms, and I inwardly wondered if the much-vaunted frins were ever more perfect in their modelling, or of a fairer texture. Had I possessed the genius of a Praxiteles, I might have given to the world a masterpiece of beauty to replace his vanished Venus of Crydus. But, as it happened, I was only a humble blacksmith, and she a fair woman who sighed, and nippled her pen, and sighed again. What is it, Charmian? Compound addition, Peter, and I hate figures. I detest, loathe, and abominate them, especially when they won't balance. "'Then never mind them,' said I. "'Never mind them, indeed, the idea, sir. "'How can I help minding them when living costs so much and we are so poor?' "'Are we?' said I. "'Why, of course we are.' "'Yes, to be sure, I suppose we are,' said I dreamily. "'Lais was beautiful. "'Thais was alluring. "'And Berenice was famous for her beauty. "'But then—' Could either of them have shown such arms, so long, so graceful in their every movement, so subtly rounded in their lines, arms which, for all their seeming firmness, must, I thought, be wonderfully soft to the touch, and smooth as ivory, and which found a delicate sheen where the light kissed them? "'We have spent four shillings for meat this week, Peter,' said Charmian, glancing up suddenly. "'Good!' said I. Nonsense, sir, four shillings is most extravagant. Oh, is it, Charmian? Why, of course it is. Oh, said I, yes, perhaps it is. Perhaps, said she, curling her lip at me, perhaps, indeed. Having said which, Charmian became absorbed in her accounts again, and I in Charmian. In Homer we may read that the loveliness of Briseis caused Achilles much sorrow. Ovid tells us that Shione was beautiful enough to inflame two gods, and that Antiope's beauty drew down from heaven the mighty Jove himself. 
and yet was either of them formed and shaped more splendidly than she who sat so near me frowning at what she had written and petulantly biting her pen impossible said i so suddenly that charmian started and dropped her pen which i picked up feeling very like a fool what did you mean by impossible peter i was thinking merely then i wish you wouldn't think so suddenly next time i beg your pardon nor be so very emphatic about it no said i uh no hereupon deigning to receive her pen back again she recommenced her figuring while i began to fill my pipe two shillings for tea excellent said i i do wish she sighed raising her head to shake it reproachfully at me that you would be a little more sensible i'll try tea at twelve shillings a pound is a luxury undoubtedly and to pay two shillings for a luxury when we are so poor is sinful is it charmian of course it is oh said i and yet life without tea more especially as you brew it would be very stale flat and unprofitable and bacon and eggs one shilling and fourpence she went on consulting her accounts ah said i not venturing on good this time butter one shilling hm said i cautiously with an air of turning this over in my mind vegetables ten pence to be sure said i nodding my head ten pence certainly and bread peter this in a voice of tragedy eight pence excellent said i recklessly whereat charmian immediately frowned at me oh peter said she with a sigh of resignation you possess absolutely no idea of proportion here we pay four shillings for meat and only eight pence for bread had we spent less on luxuries and more on necessities we should have had money in hand instead of let me see and she began adding up the various items before her with soft quick little pats of her fingers on the table presently having found the total she leaned back in her chair and summoning my attention with a tap of her pen announced we have spent nine shilling and ten pence peter good indeed said i leaving exactly two pence over a penny for you and a penny for me i fear i am a very bad housekeeper peter on the contrary you earn ten shillings a week well and here is exactly two pence left oh peter you are forgetting the tea and the beef and and the other luxuries said i struck by the droop of her mouth but you work so very very hard and earn so little that the little i work that i may live charmian and lo i am alive and dreadfully poor and ridiculously happy i wonder why said she beginning to draw designs on the page before her indeed though i have asked myself that question frequently of late i have as yet found no answer unless it be my busy care-free life and with the warm sun about me and the voice of the wind in the trees yes perhaps that is it and yet i don't know i went on thoughtfully for now i come to think of it my life has always been busy and care-free and i have always loved the sun and the sound of the wind in the trees yet like horace have asked what is happiness and looked for it in vain and now here in this out-of-the-world spot working as a village smith it has come to me all unbidden and unsought which is very strange yes peter said charmian still busy with her pen upon consideration i think my thanks are due to my uncle for dying and leaving me penniless do you mean that he disinherited you in a way yes he left me his whole fortune provided that i marry a certain lady within the year a certain lady the lady sophia sefton of camborne said i charmian's pen stopped in the very middle of a letter and she bent down to examine what she'd been writing oh said she very softly the lady sophia sefton of camborne 
"'Yes,' said I. "'And your cousin, Sir Maurice, were the conditions the same in his case?' "'Precisely.' "'Oh,' said Charmian, just as softly as before. "'And this lady, she will not marry you?' "'No,' I answered. "'Are you quite sure?' "'Certain. You see, I never intend to ask her.' Charmian suddenly raised her head and looked at me. "'Why not, Peter?' "'Because should I ever marry, a remote contingency and most improbable, I am sufficiently self-willed to prefer to exert my own choice in the matter. Moreover, this lady is a celebrated toast, and it would be most repugnant to me that my wife's name should ever have been bandied from mouth to mouth, and hiccuped out over slopping wine-glasses.' The pen slipped from Charmian's fingers to the floor, and before I could pick it up she had forestalled me so that when she raised her head she was flushed with stooping. "'Have you never seen this lady, Peter?' "'Never, but I have heard of her. Who has not?' "'What have you heard?' "'That she galloped her horse up and down the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral, for one thing.' "'What more?' "'That she is proud and passionate and sudden of temper. In a word, a virago.' "'Virago?' said Charmian, flinging up her head. "'Virago,' I nodded. "'Though she is handsome, I understand, in a strapping way, and I have it on very excellent authority that she is a black-browed goddess, a peach, and a veritable plum.' "'Strapping is a hateful word, Peter.' "'But very descriptive. "'And doesn't she interest you a little, Peter?' "'Not in the least,' said I. "'And pray, why not?' "'Because I care very little for either peaches or plums.' "'Or black-browed goddesses, Peter?' "'Not if she is big and strapping and possesses a temper.' "'I suppose, to such a philosopher as you, "'a woman or a goddess, black-browed or not, "'can scarcely compare with, or hope to rival, an old book, can she, sir?' "'Why, that depends, Charmian.' "'On what?' "'On the book,' said I. Charmian rested her round elbows upon the table, and, setting her chin in her hands, stared squarely at me. "'Peter,' said she. "'Yes, Charmian.' "'If you did meet this lady, I think—' "'Well?' "'I know—' "'What?' that you would fall a very easy victim i think not said i you would be her slave in a month three weeks or much less preposterous i exclaimed if she set herself out to make you that would be very immodest said i besides no woman can make a man love her do your books teach you that peter here, finding I did not answer, she laughed and nodded her head at me. You would be head over ears in love before you knew it. I think not, said I, smiling. You are the kind of man who would grow sick with love and never know what ailed him. Any man in such a condition would be a pitiful ass, said I. Charmian only laughed at me again and went back to her scribbling. Then... "'If this lady married you,' said she suddenly, "'you would be a gentleman of good position and standing?' "'Yes, I suppose so, and probably miserable.' "'And rich, Peter. I should have more than enough. "'Instead of being a village blacksmith, with just enough, and absurdly happy and content,' I added, "'which is far more desirable. At least I think so.' "'Do you mean to say that you would rather—' exist here and make horseshoes all your life than live respected and rich and married to and married to the lady sophia infinitely said i then your cousin so far as you are concerned is free to woo and win her and your uncle's fortune and i wish him well of his bargain i nodded as for me i shall probably continue to live here and make horseshoes wifeless and content. 
Is marriage so hateful to you? In the abstract, no, for in my mind there exists a woman whom I think I could love, very greatly, but in the actual yes, because there is no woman in all the world that is like this woman of my mind. Is she so flawlessly perfect, this imaginary woman? She is one whom I would respect for her intellect. Yes. Whom I would honor for her proud virtue. Yes, Peter. Whom I would worship for her broad charity, her gentleness and spotless purity. Yes, Peter. And love with all my strength for her warm, sweet womanhood. In a word, she is the epitome of all that is true and womanly. That is to say, as you understand such things, sir, and all your knowledge of woman and her virtues and failings you have learned from your books. Therefore misrepresented by history and distorted by romance, it is utterly false and unreal. And, of course, this imaginary creature of yours is ethereal, bloodless, sexless, unnatural, and quite impossible. Now, when she spoke thus, I laid down my pipe and stared. But before I could get my breath, she began again with curling lip and lashes that drooped disdainfully. I quite understand that there can be no woman worthy of Mr. Peter Vibart. She whom he would honor with marriage must be specially created for him. Ah, but some day a woman, a real live woman, will come into his life and the touch of her hand. The glance of her eyes, the warmth of her breath will dispel this poor, flaccid, misty creature of his imagination who will fade and fade and vanish into nothingness. And when the real woman has shown him how utterly false and impossible this dream woman was, then, Mr. Peter Vibart, I hope she will laugh at you, as I do, and turn her back upon you, as I do, and leave you for the very superior, very pedantic pedant that you are, and scorn you as I do, most of all because you are merely a creature, with the word she flung up her head and stamped her foot at me, and turning swept out through the open door into the moonlight. Creature? said I, and so sat staring at the table, and the walls, and the floor, and the rafters in blank amazement. But in a while, my amazement growing, I went and stood in the doorway, looking at Charmian, but saying nothing. And as I watched, she began to sing softly to herself, and putting up her hand, drew the comb from her hair so that it fell down, rippling about her neck and shoulders. And singing softly thus, she shook her hair about her, so that I saw it curled far below her waist, stooped her head, and parting it upon her neck, drew it over either shoulder whence it flowed far down over her bosom in two glorious waves for the moon, peeping through the rift in the leaves above, sent down her beams to wake small fires in it that came and went, and winked with her breathing. Charmian, you have glorious hair, said I, speaking on the impulse, a thing I rarely do. But Charmian only combed her tresses and went on singing to herself. Charmian, I said again, what did you mean when you called me a creature? Charmian went on singing. You called me a pedant once before. To be told that I am superior also is most disquieting. I fear my manner must be very unfortunate to afford you such an opinion of me. Charmian went on singing. Naturally I am much perturbed and doubly anxious to know what you wish me to understand by the epithet creature. Charmian went on singing. Wherefore, seeing she did not intend to answer me, I presently re-entered the cottage. Now, it is ever my custom, when at all troubled or put out in any way, to seek consolation in my books. Hence I now took up my homer, and, trimming the candles, sat down at the table. In a little while Charmian came in, still humming the air of her song, and not troubling even to glance in my direction. Some days before, at her request, I had brought her linen and lace and ribbons from Cranbrook, and these she now took out, together with needle and cotton, and, sitting down at the opposite end of the table, began to sew. She was still humming, and this of itself distracted my mind from the lines before me, 
Moreover, my eye was fascinated by the gleam of her flying needle, and I began to debate within myself what she was making. It, whatever it might be, was ruffled and edged with lace, and caught here and there with little bows of blue ribband, and from these and diverse other evidences I had concluded it to be a garment of some sort, and was casting about in my mind to account for these bows of ribband, when, glancing up suddenly, she caught my eye. Whereupon, for no reason in the world, I felt suddenly guilty, to hide which I began to search through my pockets for my pipe. "'On the mantel-shelf,' said she, "'what is? Your pipe!' "'Thank you,' said I, and reached it down. "'What are you reading?' she inquired. "'Is it of Helen, or Asphasia, or Frin?' "'Neither. It is the parting of Hector and Andromache,' I answered. "'Is it very interesting?' "'Yes.' "'Then why do your eyes wander so often from the page?' "'I know many of the lines by heart,' said I, "'and, having lighted my pipe, I took up the book and once more began to read. "'Yet I was conscious all the time of Charmian's flashing needle. "'Also she had begun to hum again. "'And after I had endeavoured to read, and Charmian had hummed for perhaps five minutes,' I lowered my book, and, sighing, glanced at her. "'I am trying to read, Charmian. "'So I see. "'And your humming confuses me. "'It is very quiet outside, Peter. "'But I cannot read by moonlight, Charmian. "'Then don't read, Peter.' Here she nibbled her thread with white teeth, and held up what she had been sewing to view the effect of a bow of ribband, with her head very much on one side and I inwardly wondered that she should spend so much care upon such frippery, all senseless bows and laces. "'To hum is a very disturbing habit,' said I. "'To smoke an evil-smelling pipe is worse, much worse, Peter.' "'I beg your pardon,' said I, and laid the offending object back upon the mantel. "'Are you angry, Peter?' "'Not the least. I am only sorry that my smoking annoyed you, had I known before.' "'It didn't annoy me in the least. "'But from what you said I understood—' "'No, Peter, you did not understand. "'You never understand, and I don't think you ever will understand "'anything but your Helens and Frins, "'and your Latin and Greek philosophies, "'and that is what makes you so very annoying and so—so so quaintly original.' "'But you certainly found fault with my pipe.' "'Naturally. Didn't you find fault with my humming?' "'Really,' said I, "'really, I fail to see—' "'Of course you do,' sighed Charmian, whereupon there fell a silence between us during which she sewed industriously, and I went forth with brave Hector to face the mighty Achilles. But my eye had traversed barely twenty lines when— "'Peter?' "'Yes. Do you remember my giving you a locket?' "'Yes. Where is it?' "'Oh, I have it still, somewhere.' "'Somewhere, sir?' she repeated, glancing at me with raised brows. "'Somewhere safe,' said I, fixing my eyes upon my book. "'It had a ribbon attached, hadn't it?' "'Yes.' "'A pink ribbon, if I remember. Yes, pink.' "'No, it was blue,' said I unguardedly. "'Are you sure, Peter?' And here, glancing up, I saved that she was watching me beneath her lashes." "'Yes,' I answered. "'That is, I think so.' "'Then you are not sure?' "'Yes, I am,' said I. "'It was a blue ribbon,' and I turned over a page very ostentatiously. "'Oh,' said Charmian, and there was another pause during which I construed probably fifty lines or so. "'Peter?' "'Well?' "'Where did you say it was now, my locket?' "'I didn't say it was anywhere.' "'No, you said it was somewhere, in a rather vague sort of way, Peter.' "'Well, perhaps I did,' said I, frowning at my book. "'It is not very valuable, but I prized it for association's sake, Peter.' "'Ah, yes, to be sure,' said I, feigning to be wholly absorbed. "'I was wondering if you ever wear it, Peter.' "'Wear it!' I exclaimed, glancing furtively down at myself, I was relieved to see that there were no signs of a betraying blue ribbon. "'Wear it!' said I again. 
why should I wear it? Why, indeed, Peter, unless it was because it was there to wear. Suddenly she uttered an exclamation of annoyance, and, taking up a candle, began to look about the floor. "'What have you lost?' "'My needle, and I think it must have fallen under the table. And needles are precious in this wilderness. Won't you please help me to find it?' "'With pleasure,' said I, getting down upon my hands and knees, and together we began to hunt for the lost needle. Now, in our search it chanced that we drew near together— and once her hand touched mine, and once her soft hair brushed my cheek, and there stole over me a perfume like the breath of violets, the fragrance that I always associated with her, faint and sweet and alluring, so much so that I drew back from further chance of contact and kept my eyes directed to the floor. And after I had sought vainly for some time, I raised my head and looked at Charmian, to find her regarding me with a very strange expression. "'What is it?' I inquired. "'Have you found the needle?' Charmian sat back on her heels and laughed softly. "'Oh, yes, I've found the needle, Peter. That is, I never lost it.' "'Why, then, what—what what did you mean?' For answer she raised her head and pointed to my breast. Then, glancing hurriedly down, I saw that the locket had slipped forward through the bosom of my shirt and hung in plain view. I made an instinctive movement to hide it, but hearing her laugh, looked at her instead. "'So this was why you asked me to stoop to find your needle?' "'Yes, Peter.' "'Then you knew?' "'Of course I knew.' Hm," said I. A distant clock chimed eleven, and Charmian began to fold away her work seeing which I rose and took up my candle. "'And pray?' "'Well?' "'And pray,' said I, staring hard at the flame of my candle, "'how did you happen to find out?' "'Very simply I saw the ribbon round your neck days ago. "'Good night, Peter.' "'Oh,' said I, "'good night.'" End of section 25 Book 2 Chapter 16、section、26、of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall. Chapter 27 The Omen. My lady sweet arise, my lady sweet arise, with everything that pretty is, my lady sweet arise, arise, arise. It was morning, and Charmian was singing. The pure rich notes floated in at my open lattice, and I heard the clatter of her pail as she went to fetch water from the brook. Wherefore I presently stepped out into the sunshine, my coat and neckcloth across my arm, to plunge my head and face into the brook, and carry back the heavy bucket for her, as was my custom. Being come to the brook, I found the brimming bucket, sure enough, but no Charmian. I was looking about wonderingly when she began to sing again, and guided by this I espied her kneeling beside the stream. The water ran deep and very still just here, overhung by ash and alder and willow, whose slender curving branches formed a leafy bower wherein she half knelt, half sat, bending over to regard herself in the placid water. For a long moment she remained thus, studying her reflection, intent in this crystal mirror, and little by little her song died away. Then she put up her hands, and began to rearrange her hair with swift, dexterous fingers, apostrophizing her watery image the while in this wise. "'My dear, you are growing positively apple-cheeked. I vow you are. Your enemies might almost call you strapping, a lack. And then your complexion, my dear, your adorable complexion.' She went on with a rueful shake of her head. You are as brown as a gypsy. Not that you need go breaking your heart over it, for between you and me, my dear, I think it rather improves you. The pity of it is that you have no one to appreciate you properly, to render to your charms the homage they deserve. No one, not a soul, my dear. Your hermit, bless you, can see or think of nothing that exists out of a book, which between you and me and the bucket yonder is perhaps just as well. And yet, hi yo! To be so lovely and so forlorn, indeed I could shed tears for you if it would not make your eyelids swell and your classic nose turn red. 
Here she sighed again, and taking a tendril of hair between her fingers, transformed it, very cleverly, into a small curl. "'Yes, your tan certainly becomes you, my dear,' she went on, nodding to her reflection. "'Not that he will ever notice, dear heart, no. Were you suddenly to turn as black as a hottentot before his very eyes, he would go on serenely smoking his pipe, and talk to you of Epictetus. hi yo Sighing thus, she broke off a spray of leaves, and proceeded to twine them in among the lustrous coils of her hair, bending over her reflection meanwhile, and turning her head this way and that, to note the effect. "'Yes,' she said at last, nodding to her image with a satisfied air, "'that touch of green sets off your gypsy complexion admirably, my dear. I could positively kiss you. I vow I could, and I am hard to please. St. Anthony himself, meeting you alone in the desert, would at least have run away from you, and that would have been some tribute to your charms. But our philosopher will just glance at you with his slow, grave smile, and tell you in his solemn, affable way that it is a very fine morning. Hi-o! Here, somewhat late in the day, perhaps, perceiving that I was playing eavesdropper, I moved cautiously away, and taking up the pail, returned to the cottage. I now filled the kettle and set it upon the fire, and proceeded to spread the cloth, a luxurious institution of Charmian's, on which she insisted, and to lay out the breakfast things, in the midst of which, however, chancing to fall into a reverie, I became oblivious of all things, till roused by a step behind me, and turning, beheld Charmian standing, with the glory of the sun about her, like the spirit of summer herself, broad of hip and shoulder, yet slender and long of limb, all warmth and life, and long soft curves from throat to ankle, perfect with vigorous youth from the leaves that crowned her beauty, to the foot that showed beneath her gown. And as I gazed upon her, silent and wondering, lo, though her mouth was solemn, yet there was laughter in her eyes as she spoke. Well, sir, have you no greeting for me? It is a very fine morning, said I. And now the merriment overflowed her eyes, and she laughed, yet blushed a little too, and lowered her eyes from mine, and said, still laughing, Oh, Peter, the teapot, do mind the teapot, "'Teapot!' I repeated, and then I saw that I still held it in my hand. "'Pray, sir, what might you be going to do with the teapot in one hand and that fork in the other?' "'I was going to make tea, I remember,' said I. "'Is that why you were standing there staring at the kettle while it boiled over?' "'I forgot all about the kettle,' said I. So Charmian took the teapot from me and set about brewing the tea, singing merrily the while. Anon she began to fry the bacon, giving each individual slice its due amount of care and attention, but her eyes chancing to meet mine, the song died upon her lip. Her lashes flickered and fell, while up from throat to brow there crept a slow, hot wave of crimson, and in that moment I turned away and strode down to the brook. Now it happened that I came to that same spot where she had leaned, and flinging myself down I fell to studying my reflection in the water, even as she had done. Heretofore, though, I had paid scant heed to my appearance. I had been content, in a certain impersonal sort of way, had dressed in the fashion, and taken advantage of such adornments as were in favour, as much from habit as from any set design. But now, lying beside the brook with my chin propped in my hands, I began to study myself critically, feature by feature, as I had never dreamed of doing before. Mirrored in the clear waters I beheld a face lean and brown, and with lank black hair. Eyes, dark and of a strange brilliance, looked at me from beneath a steep prominence of brow. I saw a somewhat high-bridged nose, with thin, nervous nostrils, a long cleft chin, and a disdainful mouth. Truly a saturnine face, cold and dark and unlovely, and thus, even as I gazed, the mouth grew still more disdainful, the heavy brow lowered blacker and more forbidding, and yet in that same moment I found myself sighing, while I strove to lend some order to the wildness of my hair. Fool, said I, and plunged my head beneath the water, and held it there so long that I came up puffing and blowing, Whereupon I caught up the towel, and fell to rubbing myself vigorously, so that presently, looking down into the water again, I saw that my hair was wilder than ever, all rubbed into long elf-locks. Straight away I lifted my hands, and would have smoothed it somewhat, but checked the impulse. "'Let be,' said I to myself, turning away. "'Let be. I am as I am, and shall be henceforth in very truth a village blacksmith, and content so to be, absolutely content.' At sight of me, Charmian burst out laughing the which, though I had expected it, angered me nevertheless. "'Why, Peter!' she exclaimed. "'You look like—' "'A very low fellow,' said I. "'Say a village blacksmith who has been at his ablutions. "'If you only had rings in your ears and a scarf round your neck, "'you'd be the image of a Spanish brigand, "'or like the man Mina, whose exploits the Gazette is full of. 
a spanish general i think a guerrilla leader said i taking my place at the table and a singularly cold-blooded villain indeed i think it probable that we much resemble one another is it any wonder i am shunned by my kind avoided by the ignorant and regarded askance by the rest why peter said charmian regarding me with grave eyes what do you mean i mean that the country folk hereabout go out of their way to avoid crossing my path not that i suppose they ever heard of mina but because of my looks your looks they think me possessed of the evil eye or some such folly may i cut you a piece of bread oh peter already by diverse honest-hearted rustics i am credited with having cast a deadly spell upon certain unfortunate pigs with having fought hand to hand with the hosts of the nethermost pit and with having sold my soul to the devil may i trouble you to pass the butter oh peter how foolish of them and how excusable considering their ignorance and superstition said i mine i am well aware is not a face to win me the heart of man woman or child they especially women and children share in common with dogs and horses that divine attribute which for want of a better name will call instinct whereby they love or hate for the mere tone of a voice the glance of an eye the motion of a hand the love or hate once given the prejudice for or against is seldom wholly overcome indeed said charmian i believe in first impressions being a woman said i being a woman she nodded and the instinct of dog and child and woman has often proved true in the end surely instinct is always true said i i'd thank you for another cup of tea yet strangely enough dogs generally make friends with me very readily and the few children to whom i've spoken have neither screamed nor run away from me still as i said before i am aware that my looks are scarcely calculated to gain the love of man woman or child not that it matters greatly seeing that i am likely to hold very little converse with either there is one woman peter to whom you've talked by the hour together and who is doubtless weary enough of it all more especially of epictetus and trojan helen two lumps of sugar peter thank you women are very like flowers i began that is a very profound remark sir more especially coming from one who has studied and knows womankind so deeply and it is a pity that they should be allowed to waste their sweetness on the desert air and philosophical blacksmiths peter more so if they be poor blacksmiths i said philosophical peter you probably find your situation horribly lonely here i went on after a pause yes it's nice and lonely peter and undoubtedly this cottage is very poor and mean and er humble charmian smiled and shook her head but then charmian brown is a very humble person and you haven't even the luxury of a mirror to dress your hair by is it so very clumsily dressed sir no no said i hastily indeed i was thinking well peter that it was very beautiful why you told me that last night come what do you think of it this morning with those leaves in it it is even more so charmian laughed and rising swept me a stately curtsy after all sir we find there to be exceptions to every rule you mean even blacksmiths and in a while having finished my breakfast i rose and taking my hat bade charmian good morning and so came to the door but on the threshold i turned and looked back at her she had risen and stood leaning with one hand on the table now in the other she held the bread knife and her eyes were upon mine and lo wonder of wonders once again but this time sudden and swift up from the round full column of her throat up over cheek and brow there rushed that vivid tide of colour her eyes grew suddenly deep and soft and then were hidden neath her lashes and in that same moment the knife slipped from her grasp and falling point downward stood quivering in the floor between us an ugly thing that gleamed evilly was this an omen a sign vouchsafed of that which dark and terrible was even then marching to meet us on this broad highway oh blind and more than blind almost before it had ceased to quiver i stooped and plucking it from the floor gave it into her hand now as i did so her fingers touched mine and moved by a sudden impulse i stooped and pressed my lips upon them kissed them quick and fierce and so turned and hurried upon my way yet as i went i found that the knife had cut my chin and that i was bleeding oh blind and more than blind surely this was a warning an omen to heed to shiver over despite the warm sun but seeing the blood i laughed and strode villageward blithe of heart and light of foot oh blind and more than blind end of the omen Section 27 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Section 27. Book 2. Chapter 18. In which I hear news of Sir Maurice Vibart. Which I says, Lord love me. I plunged the iron back into the fire, and, turning my head, espied a figure standing in the doorway, and, though the leather hat and short round jacket had been superseded by a smart groom's livery, I recognized the postilion so help me bob if this ain't a piece o luck he exclaimed and with the words he removed his hat and fell to combing his short thick hair with the handle of his whip i'm glad you think so said i you can drown me if i ain't said he and pray how is the gentleman who happened to fall and hurt himself if you remember in the storm appen to fall and ert hisself repeated the postilion winking knowingly ert hisself says you walker says i walker with which he laid his forefinger against the side of his nose and winked again what might you be pleased to mean i means as a gent attenin to fall in the dark may p'raps cut his ed open but he don't give hisself two black eyes, a bloody nose, a split lip, and three broken ribs, all at once. It ain't natural, which if you says contrary, I remarks. Walker, Lord, continued the postilion, seeing I did not speak, Lord, it must have been a pretty warm go while it lasted. You put him to sleep sound enough. It took me over an hour to Tunbridge and he never moved till he'd been put to bed at the checkers and a doctor sent for ah and a nice time i ad of it what with chambermaids a runnin up and downstairs to see the poor gentleman and everybody a starin at me and a shakin their eds and all a axin questions one atop o the other till the doctor come ow did this appen me man says e a haxident says i a haxident says the doctor wi' a look in his eye as i didn't just like ah says i fell on his ed out o the chase says i struck a stone or summit says i did he fall of his own accord says the doctor ah for sure says i oomph says the doctor what wi his eyes and his nose and his lip looks to me as if some one ad elped him then you must be a damn fool says a voice and there's my gentleman number one you know a sittin up in bed and a doin is artist to frown sir says the doctor sir to you says my gentleman this honest fellow tells the truth i did fall out o the accursed chase and be damned to you says e don't excite yourself says the doctor in your present condition it would be dangerous then be so good as to go to the devil says my gentleman i will says the doctor and off e goes hi there you says my gentleman callin to me as soon as we were alone this accursed business has played the devil with me, and I need a servant. How much do you want to stay wi' me? Twenty-five shillin' a week, says I, doin' myself proud while I add the chance. I'll give ye thirty, says e. What's ye name? Jacob Trimble, sir, says I. And a most accursed name it is. I'll call you Parks, says e and when i ring let no one answer but yourself you can go parks anne parks get me another doctor well pursued the postilion seating himself near by 
we'd been there a couple o weeks and though he was better and his face near well again he still kept to his room when one day a smart feetin and blood osses drives up and out steps a fine gentleman one of them pale sleepy sort i was a standin in the yard brushin my master's coat a bottle green with silver buttons each button avin what they calls a monogram stamped on to it ha me man says the sleepy gent steppin up to me a fine coat deuced fashionable cut curse me your master's yes sir says i brushin away silver buttons too says the gent let me see ah yes a v yes to be sure have the goodness to step to your master and say as a gentleman begs to see him can't be done sir says i me master ain't seein nobody bein in indifferent elth nonsense says the gentleman yawnin and slippin a guinea into me and just run like a good feller and tell him as i bear a message from george from oo says i from george says the gent smilin and yawnin just say from george so to come to the end of it up i goes and finds me master walkin up and down and a swearin to isself as usual a gentleman to see you sir says i why devil burn your miserable carcass says e didn't i tell you as i'd seen nobody ay but this ere gent's a sayin e as a message from george sir my master raised both clenched fists above is ed and swore ah better than i'd heard for many a long day as ever downstairs e goes cursin on every stair in a time e comes back parks says e do you remember that that place where we got lost in the storm parks ah sir says i well go there at once says e an well e give me certain orders jumps into the phaeton with the sleepy gentleman and they drive off together and accordin to orders ere i am a very interesting story said i and so you are a groom now ah and you are a blacksmith eh yes well if it don't beat everything as i ever heard i'm a stiffen that's all what do you mean i means my droppin in on you like this ear just as if you wasn't the one man in all england as i was hopeful to drop in on and you find me very busy said i lord love me said the postilion combing his hair so very hard that it wrinkled his brow i comes up from tonbridge this ear very afternoon and avin drunk a pint over at the bull yonder and axed questions as none o they chaw bacons could give answer to i ears the chink o your ammer and comin over ear chance like i finds you i'll be gormed if it ain't the most onnatural and why cause you was the very identical chap as i come up from tonbridge to find were you sent to find me easy a bit you're a blacksmith ain't you i told you so before what's more you looks a blacksmith in that there leather apron and with your face all smutty to be sure you're powerful like im number one as was my master as now is did he send you to find me some folks might take you for a gentleman meeting you off and like but i knows different as how well i never eard of a gentleman turnin isself into a blacksmith afore for one thing still one might i ventured no answered the postilion with a decisive shake of the head 
it's agin nature when a gentleman gets down in the world and as to do summit for a living he generally shoots hisself ah and i've knowed em to do it too and then i've noticed as you don't swear nor yet curse not even a damn seldom said i but what of that i've seed a deal o quality in my time one way or another many's the fine gentleman as of druv or groomed for and never a one on em as didn't curse me ah said the postilion sighing and shaking his head ow they did curse me specially one a young lord uncommon fond o me e were too in his way to the day his oss fell and rolled on him jacob says e short like for e were a goin fast jacob says e damn your infernally ugly mug says e you bet me as that cursed brute would do for me i did my lord says i and i remembered as the tears were a runnin down all our faces as we carried him along on the five barred gate that be an andiest well devil take your soul you were right jacob and be damned to you says e you'll find a tenner in my coat pocket ere you've won it for i shan't last the day out jacob and he didn't either for he died afore we got him ome and left me a hundred pound in his will ah gentlemen as his gents is all the same lord love you there never was one on em but damned my legs or my liver or the chase or the osses or the road or the inns or all on em together if you was to strip me as naked as the palm o your and and to strip a lord or a earl or a gentleman as naked as the palm o your and and was to place us side by side where'd be the difference we're both men both flesh and blood ain't we then where'd be the difference ooze to tell which is lord and which is the postilion who indeed said i setting down my hammer jack is often as good as his master and a great deal better why nobody nodded the postilion not a soul till we opened our mouths and then twould be easy enough for my lord or earl or gentleman being naked and not liking it which would only be natural would fall a swearin evans ard damning everybody and cursin everything and never stop to think while i not bein born to it should stand there a shiverin and tryin a curse or two myself maybe but lord mine wouldn't amount to nothin at all me not bein naturally gifted nor yet born to it and this brings me round to er her ah er number two er as quarrelled wit number one all the way from london er as run away from number one what about er here he fell to combing his hair again with his whip handle while his quick bright eyes dodged from my face to the glowing forge and back again and his clean-shaven lips pursed themselves in a soundless whistle and as i watched him it seemed to me that this was the question that had been in his mind all along seeing she did manage to run away from him number one she is probably very well i answered ah to be sure very well you say ah to be sure said the postilion apparently lost in the contemplation of the bellows Anne, where might she be now that i am unable to tell you said i and began to blow up the fire while the postilion watched me sucking the handle of his whip reflectively you work uncommon ard drowned me if you don't pretty hard i nodded and gets well paid for it perhaps not so well as i could wish said i not so well as he could wish nodded the postilion apparently addressing the sledge-hammer 
for his gaze was fixed upon it. Of course not. The arder a man works the wuss he gets paid. How much did you say you got a week? I named no sum, I replied. Well, how much might you be getting a week? Ten shillings. Gets ten shillin a week, he nodded to the sledgehammer, that ain't much for a chap like him. Kick me, if it is. Yet I make it do very well. The postilion became again absorbed in contemplation of the bellows. Indeed he studied them so intently, viewing them with his head now on one side, now on the other, that I fell to watching him, under my brows, and so, presently, caught him furtively watching me. Hereupon he drew his whip from his mouth and spoke. Supposing, said he, and stopped. Well, I inquired, and, leaning upon my hammer, I looked him square in the eye. Supposing, what are you a-staring at, my feller? You have said supposing twice. Well? Well, said he, fixing his eye upon the bellows again, supposing you was to make a guinea over and above your wages this week. I should be very much surprised, said I. You would? I certainly should. Then, why not surprise yourself? You must speak more plainly, said I. Well then, said the postilion, still with his gaze abstracted, supposin' I was to place a guinea down on that there anvil o' yours, would that help you to remember where number two? Er, might be? No. It wouldn't? No. A guinea's a lot o' money. It is, I nodded. And you say it wouldn't? It would not, said I. Then say, oh, say two pun ten and have done with it. No, said I, shaking my head. What? Not? Do you say no to two pun ten? I do. Well, let's say three pound. I shook my head and, drawing the iron from the fire, began to hammer at it. Well then, shouted the postilion, for I was making as much din as possible, say four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five, fifty. Here I ceased hammering. Tell me when you've done, said I. You're a cool customer, you are? Ah, and a rummin at that. I never see a rummer. Other people have thought the same, said I, examining the half-finished horseshoe ere I set it back in the fire. Sixty guineas, said the postilion gloomily. Come again, said I. Seventy, then, said he, his gloom deepening. Once more, said I. A hundred. One hundred guineas, said he, removing his hat to mop at his brow. Any more? I inquired. No, returned the postilion sulkily, putting on his hat. I'm done. Did he set the figure at a hundred guineas? said I. I'm. Oh, he's mad for her, he is. It ruin his self, body and soul, for her he would but i ain't going to offer no more no woman has ever breathed no matter how handsome and upstandin is worth more na hundred guineas it ain't as if she was a blood mare and i'm done then i wish you good day but just think a hundred guineas is a fortune it is said i come think it over said the postilion persuasively think it over now let me fully understand you then said i 
you propose to pay me one hundred guineas on behalf of your master known heretofore as number one for such information as shall enable him to discover the whereabouts of a certain person known as her number two is that how the matter stands ah that's ow it stands nodded the postilion the money to be yours as soon as ever e lays his ands on her is it a go no 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 why you must be stark starin mad that you must unless you're sweet on er yourself you talk like a fool said i angrily so you are sweet on er then yes said i fool and dropping my hammer i made towards him but he darted nimbly to the door where seeing i did not pursue he paused i may be a hass he nodded and i may be a fool but i don't go a fallin in law wi ladies as is above me and out o my reach and i don't chuck away a undred guineas for one as ain't likely to look my way not me which i begs leave to say hass yourself and likewise fool bah with which expletive he set his thumb to his nose spread out his fingers wagged them and swaggered off above me and out of my reach one not likely to look my way and in due season having finished the horseshoe having set each tool in its appointed place in the racks and raked out the clinkers from the fire i took my hat and coat and closing the door behind me set out for the hollow end of section 27 book 2 chapter 18section 28 of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the broad highway by geoffrey farnall section 28 book 2 chapter 19 how i met black george again and wherein the patient reader shall find a little blood it was evening that time before the moon is up and when the earth is dark as yet and full of shadows now as i went by some chance there recurred to me the words of an old song i had read somewhere years ago words written in the glorious brutal knightly days of edward the first of warlike memory and the words ran thus for her love i cark and care for her love i droop and dare for her love my bliss is bare and i wax wan i wonder what poor lovesick long dead and forgotten fool wrote that i said aloud for her love in sleep i slake for her love all night i wake for her love i morning make more than any man some doughy squire at arms or perhaps some wandering knight probably of a dark unlovely look who rode the forest ways with his thoughts full of her and dreaming of her loveliness howbeit he was beyond all doubt a fool and a great one said i for it is to be inferred from these few words he has left us that his love was hopeless she was perhaps proud and of high estate one who was above him and far beyond his reach who was not likely even to look his way doubtless she was beautiful and therefore haughty and disdainful for disdainful pride is an attribute of beauty and ever was and ever will be and hence it came that our misfortunate squire or knight-errant was scorned for his pains 
poor fool. Which yet was his own fault, after all, and, indeed, his just reward, for what has any squire at arms or lusty knight, with the world before him, and glory yet unachieved, to do with love? Love is a bauble, a toy, a pretty pastime for idle folk who have no thought above such. Away with it! Bah! And, in my mind, that is to say, mentally, I set my thumb to my nose, and spread my fingers, and wagged them, even as the postilion had done. And yet, despite this, the words of the old song recurred again and again, pathetically insistent, voicing themselves in my footsteps so that, to banish them, I presently stood still. And in that very moment a gigantic figure came bursting through the hedge, clearing the ditch in a single bound, and Black George confronted me. Haggard of face, with hair and beard matted and unkempt, his clothes all dusty and torn, he presented a very wild and terrible appearance, and beneath one arm he carried two bludgeons. The peddler had spoken truly, then, and, as I met the giant's smoldering eye, I felt my mouth become suddenly parched and dry, and the palms of my hands grew moist and clammy. For a moment neither of us spoke, only we looked at each other steadily in the eye, and I saw the hair of his beard bristle, and he raised one great hand to the collar of his shirt, and tore it open as if it were strangling him. George, I said at last, and held out my hand. George never stirred. Won't you shake hands, George? His lips opened, but no words came. Had I known where to look for you, I should have sought you out days ago, I went on. As it is I have been wishing to meet you, hoping to set matters right. Once again his lips opened, but still no word came. You see, Prudence is breaking her heart over you. A laugh burst from him, sudden and harsh. You, my liar, said he, and his voice quavered strangely. I speak gospel truth, said I. I be note to prove since the day you beat me at the ammer throwin', and ye know it. Prudence loves you, and always has, said I. Go back to her, George, go back to her, and to your work be the man I know you are. Go back to her, she loves you. If you still doubt my word, here, read that, and I held out his own letter the letter on which Prudence had written those four words, George, I love you. He took it from me, crumpled it slowly in his hand and tossed it into the ditch. You, my liar, he said again, and a uh, coward. And you, said I, are a fool, a blind, gross, selfish fool, who, in degrading yourself, in skulking about the woods and lanes, is bringing black shame and sorrow to as sweet a maid as ever. It don't need you to tell me what she be and what she beant, said Black George, in a low, repressed voice. I knowed her long before you ever set eyes on her. Grew up wi' her, I did, and I beant deaf nor blind. You see, I loved her, all my life. That's why one o' us two's a gonna lie a ear all night. Ah, and all tomorrow, likewise, if someone don't chance to find us, saying which, he forced a cudgel into my hand. What do you mean, George? I means as if you don't do for me, then I be a gonna do for e. But why? I cried. In God's name, why? I be slow, p'raps, and thick, p'raps, but I be ant a fool. Come, 
man if she be worth winnin she be worth fightin for but i tell you she loves black george and no other she never had any thought of me or i of her this is madness and worse and i tossed the cudgel aside and i tell ee broke in the smith his repression giving way before a fury as fierce as it was sudden i tell ee you be a liar and a coward i know i know i heerd and i've seen your lying coward's tongue shan't save ee oh ye cod wi your white face and tremblin ands you be a shame to the woman as loves ye and the woman as bore ye stand up i say or by god i'll do for ye and he raised his weapon without another word i picked up the cudgel and pointing to a gate a little farther along the road i led the way into the meadow beyond on the other side of this meadow ran the lane i have mentioned before and beyond the lane was the hollow and glancing thitherward i bethought me that supper would be ready and charmaine waiting for me just about now and i sighed i remember as i drew off my coat and laid it together with my hat under the hedge the moon was beginning to rise casting the magic of her pale loveliness upon the world and as i rolled up my sleeves i glanced round about me with an eye that strove to take in the beauty of all things of hedge and tree and winding road the gloom of wood the sheen of water and the far soft sweep of hill and dale over all these my glance lingered yearningly for it seemed to me that this look might be my last and now as i stooped and gripped my weapon i remembered how i had that morning kissed her fingers and i was strangely comforted and glad the night air which had been warm heretofore struck chilly now and as i stood up fronting black george i shivered seeing which he laughed short and fierce and with the laugh came at me striking downwards at my head as he came and tough wood met tough wood with a shock that jarred me from wrist to shoulder to hit him upon the arm and disable him was my one thought and object i therefore watched for an opening parrying his swift strokes and avoiding his rushes as well as i might time and again our weapons crashed together now above my head now to right or left sometimes rattling in quick succession sometimes with pauses between strokes pauses filled in with the sound of heavy breathing and the ceaseless thud of feet upon the sward i was already bruised in a half a dozen places my right hand and arm felt numb and with a shooting pain in the shoulder that grew more acute with every movement my breath also was beginning to labor yet still black george pressed on untiring relentless showering blow on blow while my arm grew ever weaker and weaker and the pain in my shoulder throbbed more intensely how long had we fought five minutes ten half an hour an hour i could see the sweat gleaming upon his cheek his eyes were wild his mouth gaped open and he drew his breath in great sobbing pants but as i looked his cudgel broke through my tired guard and taking me full upon the brow drove me reeling back my weapon slipped from my grasp and blinded with blood i staggered to and fro like a drunken man and presently slipped to the grass and how sweet it was to lie thus with my cheek upon kind mother earth to stretch my aching body and with my weary limbs at rest but black george stood above me panting and as his eyes met mine he laughed a strange sounding broken laugh and rolled up his cudgel to beat out my brains even as the peddler had foretold 
tomorrow the blackbird would sing upon my motionless breast and looking into black george's eyes i smiled get up he panted and lowered the cudgel get up or by god i'll do for e sighing i rose and took the cudgel he held out to me wiping the blood from my eyes as i did so and now as i faced him once more all things vanished from my ken save the man before me he filled the universe and even as he leaped upon me i leaped upon him and struck with all my strength there was a jarring splintering shock and black george was beaten down upon his knees but as dropping my weapon i stepped forward he rose and stood panting and staring at the broken cudgel in his hand george said i you ma bleedin peter for that matter so are you bloodlettin be good for a man sometimes eases un it does i panted perhaps you are willing to hear reason now we be even so fur but fists be better nor sticks any day and i be goin to try ye with fists have we not bled each other sufficiently no cried george between set teeth there be more nor bloodlettin betwixt you and me i said as ow one of us would lie out ere all night and so ye shall by god come on fists be best arter all this was the heyday of boxing and while at oxford i had earned some small fame at the sport but it was one thing to spar with a man my own weight in a padded ring with limited rounds governed by a code of rules and quite another to fight a man like black george in a lonely meadow by light of moon moreover he was well acquainted with the science as i could see from the way he shaped the only difference between us being that whereas he fought with feet planted square and wide apart i balanced myself upon my toes which is i think to be commended as being quicker and more calculated to lessen the impact of a blow brief though the respite had been it had served me to recover my breath and though my head yet rung from the cudgel stroke and the blood still flowed freely getting every now and then into my eyes my brain was clear as we fronted each other for what we both knew must be the decisive bout the smith stood with his mighty shoulders stooped something forward his left arm drawn back his right flung across his chest and so long as we fought i watched that great fist and knotted forearm for though he struck oftener with his left it was in that passive right that i thought my danger really lay it is not my intention to chronicle this fight blow by blow enough and more than enough has already been said in that regard suffice it then that as the fight progressed i found that i was far quicker as i had hoped and that the majority of his blows i either blocked or avoided easily enough time after time his fist shot over my shoulder or over my head and time after time i countered heavily now on his body now on his face once he staggered and once i caught a momentary glimpse of his features convulsed with pain he was smeared with blood from the waist up but still he came on i fought desperately now savagely taking advantage of every opening for though i struck him four times to his once yet his blows had four times the weight of mine my forearms were bruised to either elbow and my breath came in gasps and always i watched that deadly right and presently it came with arm and shoulder and body behind it quick as a flash and resistless as a cannon-ball but i was ready and 
as i leaped i struck and struck him clean and true upon the angle of the jaw and spinning round black george fell and lay with his arms wide stretched and face buried in the grass slowly slowly he got upon his knees and thence to his feet and so stood panting hideous with blood and sweat bruised and cut and disfigured staring at me as one in amaze now as i looked my heart went out to him and i reached forth my right hand george i panted oh george but black george only looked at me and shook his head and groaned oh peter said he you be a man peter i fought ah many's the time and no man ever knocked me down afore oh peter i i could love ee for it if i didn't hate the very sight of ee come on and let's get it over and done with so once again fists were clenched and jaws set once again came the trampling of feet the hiss of breath and the thudding shock of blows given and taken a sudden jarring impact the taste of sulphur on my tongue a gathering darkness before my eyes and knowing this was the end i strove desperately to close with him but i was dazed blind my arms fell paralyzed and in that moment the smith's right fist drove forward a jagged flame shot up to heaven the earth seemed to rush up towards me a roaring blackness engulfed me and then silence End of section 28, book 2, chapter 19。section 29 of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ellen preckle the broad highway by geoffrey farnall chapter twenty how i came up out of the dark someone was calling to me a long way off someone was leaning down from a great height to call to me in the depths and the voice was wonderfully sweet but faint faint because the height was so very high and the depths so very great and still the voice called and called and I felt sorry that I could not answer, because, as I say, the voice was troubled, and wonderfully sweet. And little by little it seemed that it grew nearer, this voice. It was descending to me in these depths of blackness, or was I being lifted up to the heights where, I knew, blackness could not be? I, indeed, I was being lifted, for I could feel a hand upon my brow, a smooth, cool hand, that touched my cheek, and brushed the hair from my forehead. A strong, gentle hand it was, with soft fingers, and it was lifting me up and up from the loathly depths, which seemed more black and more horrible the further I drew from them. And so I heard the voice, nearer and ever nearer, until I could distinguish words. And the voice had tears in it, and the words were very tender. Peter, speak, speak to me, Peter. Charmian, said I, within myself, why, truly, whose hand but hers could have lifted me out of that gulf of death back to light and life? Yet I did not speak aloud, for I had no mind to yet a while. Ah, speak to me, speak to me, Peter! How can you lie there so still and pale? And now her arms were about me, strong and protecting, and my head was drawn down upon her bosom. Oh, Peter! My Peter! Nay, but this was Charmian, the cold, proud Charmian? Truly, I had never heard that thrill in her voice before. Could this indeed be Charmian? and lying thus with my head on this sweet pillow i could hear her heart whispering to me and it seemed that it was striving to tell me something striving striving to tell me something could i but understand ah could i but understand i waited for you so long so long peter and the supper's all spoiled a rabbit peter you liked rabbit and oh god i want you don't you hear me peter i want you want you and now her cheek was pressed to mine and her lips were upon my hair and upon my brow her lips 
Was this indeed Charmian, and was I Peter Vibart? Ah, if I could but know what it was in her heart was trying to tell me so quickly and passionately. And while I lay listening, listening, something hot splashed down upon my cheek, and then another, and another. Her bosom heaved tumultuously, and instinctively raising my arms, I clasped them about her. Don't, I said, and my voice was a whisper. Don't, Charmian. For a moment her clasp tightened about me. She was all tenderness and clinging warmth. Then I heard a sudden gasp. Her arms loosened and fell away, and so I presently raised my head, and supporting myself upon my hand, looked at her. And then I saw her cheeks were burning. Peter. Yes, Charmian. Did you— She paused, plucking nervously at the grass and looking away from me. Well, Charmian? Did you— Here— Again she broke off, and still her head was averted. I heard your voice calling to me from a great way off, and so I came, Charmian. Were you conscious when when I found you? No, I answered. I was lying in a very deep black pit. Here she looked at me again. I, I thought you were dead, Peter. My soul was out of my body until you recalled it. You were lying upon your back by the hedge here, and, oh, Peter, your face was white and shining in the moonlight, and there was blood upon it, and you looked like one that is dead, and she shivered. And you have brought me back to life, said I, rising, but being upon my feet, I staggered giddily to hide which I laughed and leaned back against a tree. Indeed, said I, I am very much alive still and monstrously hungry. You spoke of a rabbit, I think. A rabbit? said Charmian in a whisper, and as I met her eye, I would have given much to have recalled that thoughtless speech. I, I think you did mention a rabbit, I said, floundering deeper. So then, you deceived me. You lay there and deceived me with your eyes shut and your ears open, taking advantage of my pity. No, no, indeed no, I thought myself still dreaming it. It all seemed so unreal, so, so beyond all belief and possibility, and I stopped aghast at my crass folly, for with a cry she sprang to her feet and hid her face in her hands, while I stood dumbfounded like the fool I was. When she looked up her eyes seemed to scorch me, and I thought Mr. Vibart a man of honour, like a knight of his old-time romances, high and chivalrous. Oh, I thought him a gentleman! Instead of which, said I, speaking as it were despite myself, instead of which you find me only a blacksmith a low, despicable fellow, eager to take advantage of your unprotected womanhood. She did not speak, standing tall and straight, her head thrown back, wherefore, reading her scorn of me in her eyes, seeing the proud contempt of her mouth, a very demon seemed suddenly to possess me, for certainly the laugh that rang from my lip proceeded from no volition of mine. And yet, madam, my voice went on, this despicable blacksmith fellow refused one hundred guineas for you to-day. Peter, she cried, and shrank away from me as if I'd threatened to strike her. Ah, you start at that. Your proud lip trembles. Do not fear, madam. The sum did not tempt him, though a large one. Peter, she cried again, and now there was a note of appeal in her voice. Indeed, madam, even so degraded a fellow as this blacksmith could not very well sell that which he does not possess, could he? And so the hundred guineas go a-begging, and you are still unsold. Long before I had done, she covered her face again, and coming near, I saw the tears running out between her fingers and sparkling as they fell, and once again the devil within me laughed loud and harsh. But while it still echoed, I had flung myself down at her feet. Charmian, I cried, forgive me, you will, you must, and kneeling before her, I strove to catch her gown and kiss its hem, but she drew it close about her, and turning, fled from me through the shadows. Heedless of all else but that she was leaving me, I stumbled to my feet and followed. The trees seemed to beset me as I ran, and bushes reached out arms to stay me, but I burst from them, running wildly, blundering, for she was going, Charmian was leaving me, and so spent and panting I reached the cottage and met Charmian at the door. She was clad in the long cloak she had worn when she came, and the hood was drawn close about her face. I stood panting in the doorway, barring her exit. Let me pass, Peter. By God, no, I cried, and entering, closed the door and leaned my back against it and after we had stood thus a while, each looking upon the other, I reached out my hands to her, and my hands were torn and bloody. Don't go, Charmian, I mumbled, don't go. Oh, Charmian, I'm hurt. I didn't want you to know, but you mustn't leave me. I'm not well. It is my head, I think. I met Black George, and he was too strong for me. I'm deaf, Charmian, and half-blinded. Oh, don't leave me. I'm afraid, Charmian. Her figure grew more blurred and indistinct, 
and I sank down upon my knees. But in the dimness I reached out and found her hands and clasped them, and bowed my aching head upon them, and remained thus a great while, it seemed to me. And presently, through the mist, her voice reached me. Oh, Peter, I will not leave you. Lean on me. There, there. And little by little those strong, gentle hands drew me up once more to light and life. And so she got me to a chair, and brought cool water, and washed the blood and sweat from me, as she had done once before. Only now my hurts were deeper, for my head grew beyond my strength to support, and hung upon my breast, and my brain throbbed with fire, and a mist was ever before my eyes. Are you in much pain, Peter? My head, only my head, Charmian. There's a bell ringing there. N no, it's a hammer beating. And indeed I remembered little for a while, save the touch of her hand and the soothing murmur of her voice, until I found she was kneeling beside me, feeding me with broth from a spoon. Wherefore I presently took the basin from her, and emptied it at a gulp, and finding myself greatly revived thereby, made some shift to eat of the supper she set before me. So she presently came and sat beside me, and ate also, watching me at each morsel. "'Your poor hands,' said she, and looked down at them. I saw that my knuckles were torn and broken, and the fingers much swelled. "'And yet,' said Charmian, "'except for the cut on your head you are quite unmarked, Peter.' He fought mostly for the body, I answered, and I managed to keep my face out of the way. But he caught me twice, once upon the chin lightly, and once behind the ear heavily. Had his fist landed fairly, I don't think even you could have brought me back from those loathly depths, Charmian. And in a while, supper being done, she brought my pipe and filled it, and held the light for me. But my head throbbed woefully, and for once the tobacco was flavorless, so I sighed and laid the pipe by. "'Why, Peter,' said Charmian, regarding me with an anxious frown, "'can't you smoke?' "'Not just now, Charmian,' said I, and leaning my head in my hands, fell into a sort of coma, till feeling her touch upon my shoulder I started and looked up. "'You must go to bed, Peter.' "'No,' said I. "'Yes, Peter.' "'Very well, Charmian, yes. I will go to bed.' And I rose. "'Do you feel better now, Peter?' "'Thank you, yes, much better. Then why do you hold on to the chair?' I'm still a little giddy, but it will pass. And, Charmian, you forgive— Yes, yes, don't. Don't look at me like that, Peter, and— Oh, good night, foolish boy. I am twenty-five, Charmian, but as she turned away, I saw that there were tears in her eyes. Dressed as I was, I lay down upon my bed, and burying my head in the pillow, groaned, for my pain was very sore. Indeed, I was to feel the effects of George's fist for many a day to come, and it seems to me now that much of the morbid imaginings, the nightly horrors, and black despair that I endured in the time which immediately followed, was chiefly owing to that terrible blow upon the head. End of How I Came Up Out of the Dark Section 30 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 21. Of the Opening of the Door, and How Charmian Blew Out the Light. He bestrode a powerful black charger, and his armor glittered through the green. And as he rode beneath the leafy arches of the wood, he lifted up his voice and sang, and the song was mournful and of a plaintive seeming, and rang loud behind his visor bars. Therefore, as I sat beside the freshet, I hearkened to his song. For her love I cark and care, for her love I droop and dare, for her love my bliss is bare, and I wax wan. Forth he rode from the shadowy woodland, pacing very solemn and slow, and thrice he struck his iron hand upon his iron breast. For her love in sleep I slake, for her love all night I wake, for her love I mourning make, more than any man. Now being come to where I sat beside the brook, he checked his horse, and gazed full long upon me, and his eyes shone from the gloom of his helmet. Miss Iyer, quoth B, how like you my song? But little, sir, to be plain with you, not a whit, I answered. And beseech you, wherefore? Because it is folly, away with it, for if your head be full of such, how shall you achieve any lasting good? glory, learning, power. But sighing he shook his head. Quoth he, O blind one, glory is but a name, learning but a yearning emptiness, and whither leadeth ambition. Man is a mote dancing in a sun-ray, 
the world a speck hanging in space. All things vanish and pass utterly away, save only true love, and that abideth everlastingly. Tis sweeter than life, and stronger than death, and reacheth up beyond the stars. And thus it is, I pray, you tell me. Where is she? She? She whom you love. I love no woman, said I. Liar! cried he in a terrible voice, and the voice was the voice of Black George. And who are you that says so? I demanded, and stood upon my feet. Look! Behold, and know thyself, O blind and more than blind! And leaning down he raised his visor, so that the moonlight fell upon his face, and the face I looked upon was my own. And while I gazed he lifted up his voice, and cried, Ye spirits of the wood, I charge ye! Who is he that rideth in the green, dreaming ever of her beauty, and sighing forth his love everlastingly? Spirits of the wood, I charge ye! And out of the gloom of the wood, from every rustling leaf and opening bud, came a little voice that rose and blended in a soft, hushed, chorus, crying, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart, Spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that walketh to and fro in the world, and having eyes seeth not, and ears heareth not, a very fool of love? Once again the voices cried in answer, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart, Spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that shall love with a love mightier than most, who shall suffer greatly for love and because of it? Who shall think of it by day, and dream of it of nights? Who is he that must die to find love in the fullness of life? O spirits of the wood, I charge ye! Again from out the green came the soft, hushed chorus, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. But even as I laughed, came one from the wood with a horse and armor, and the armor he girded on me, and the horse I mounted, and there in the moonlit glade we fought and strove together, my other self and I, and sudden and strong he smote me, so that I fell down from my horse and lay there dead, with my blood soaking and soaking into the grass, and as I watched there came a blackbird that perched upon my breast, caroling gloriously. Yet little by little this bird changed, and lo, in its place was a new Peter Vibart, standing upon the old, and the new trampled the old down into the grass, and it was gone. Then, with his eyes on the stars, the new Peter Vibart fell a-singing, and the words I sang were these. For her love I cark and care, for her love I droop and dare, for her love my bliss is bare, and I wax wan. And thus there came into my heart that which had been all unknown, undreamed of hitherto, yet which, once there, could never pass away. O spirits of the wood, I charge ye, who is he that cometh, true love sweeter than life, greater than wisdom, stronger than death? O spirits of the wood, I charge ye. And the hushed voices chorused softly, Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart, and while I listened, one by one the voices ceased, till there but one remained, calling, calling, but ever soft and far away, and when I would have gone toward this voice, lo, there stood a knife quivering in the ground before me, that grew and grew until its haft touched heaven, yet still the voice called upon my name very softly, Peter, Peter, oh, Peter, I want you, oh, Peter, wake, wake! I sat up in bed, and as I listened grew suddenly sick, and a fit of trembling shook me violently, for the whisper was still in my ears, and the whisper was an agony of fear and dread indescribable. Peter! Oh, Peter, I am afraid! Wake! Wake! A cold sweat broke out upon me, and I glared helplessly toward the door. Quick, Peter! Come to me! Oh, God! I strove to move, but still could not. And now in the darkness hands were shaking me wildly, and Charmian's voice was speaking in my ear. The door, it whispered, the door. Then I arose and was in the outer room with Charmian close beside me in the dark, and my eyes were upon the door. And then I beheld a strange thing, for a thin line of white light traversed the floor from end to end. Now as I watched this narrow line I saw that it was gradually widening and widening. Very slowly, and with infinite caution, the door was being opened from without. In this remote place, in this still dead hour of the night, full of the ghostly hush that ever precedes the dawn, there was something devilish, something very like murder in its stealthy motion. I heard Charmian's breath catch, and in the dark her hand came and crept into mine, and her fingers were cold as death. And now a great anger came upon me, and I took a quick step forward, but Charmian restrained me. No, Peter, she breathed, not yet, wait, and wound her arms round mine. In a corner near by stood that same trusty staff that had been the companion of my wanderings, and now I reached and took it up, balancing it in my hand. 
and all the time I watched that line of light upon the floor, widening and widening, growing ever broader and more broad. The minutes dragged slowly by while the line grew into a streak and the streak into a lane, and upon the lane came a blot that slowly resolved itself into the shadow of a hand upon the latch. Slowly, slowly, to the hand came a wrist and the wrist an arm. Another minute and this maddening suspense would be over. Despite Charmian's restraining clasp, I crept a long pace nearer the softly moving door. The sharp angle of the elbow was growing obtuse as the shadowy arm straightened itself. Thirty seconds more, I began to count, and gripping my staff, braced myself for what might be, when, with a sudden cry, Charmian sprang forward and, hurling herself against the door, shut it with a crash. "'Quick, Peter!' she panted. I was beside her almost as she spoke and had my hand upon the latch. "'I must see who this was,' said I. "'You are mad!' she cried. "'Let me open the door, Charmian. "'No, no, I say no. "'Whoever it was must not escape. "'Open the door. "'Never, never, I tell you, death is outside. "'There's murder in the very air. "'I feel it. "'And, dear God, the door has no bolt. "'They're gone now, whoever they were,' said I reassuringly. "'The danger is over, if danger it could be called.' "'Danger!' cried Charmian. "'I tell you, it was death. "'Yet, after all, it may have been only some homeless wanderer. "'Then why that deadly silent caution?' "'True,' said I, becoming thoughtful. "'Bring the table, Peter, and set it across the door. "'Surely the table is too light to— "'But it will give sufficient warning. "'Not that I shall sleep again to-night. "'Oh, Peter, had I not been dreaming and happened to wake, "'had I not chanced to look toward the door, "'it would have opened wide, and then—oh, horrible! "'You were dreaming?' a hateful hateful dream it awoke in terror and being afraid glanced toward the door and saw it opening and now bring the table peter now groping about my hand encountered one of the candles and taking out my tinder box all unthinking i lighted it charmian was leaning against the door clad in a flowing white garment a garment that was wonderfully stitched all dainty frills and laces with here and there a bow of blue riband disposed as it would seem by the hand of chance and yet most wonderfully and up from this foam of laces her shoulders rose, white and soft and dimpled, sweeping up in noble lines to the smooth round column of her throat. But as I stared at all this loveliness, she gave a sudden gasp, and stooped her head and crossed her hands upon her bosom, while up over the snow of shoulder, over neck and cheek and brow, ebbed that warm crimson tide, and I could only gaze and gaze, till with a movement swift and light she crossed to that betraying candle, and stooping, blew out the light. Then I set the table across the door, having done which I stood looking toward where she stood. Charmian, said I. Yes, Peter. Tomorrow. Yes, Peter. I will make a bar to hold the door. Yes, Peter. Two bars would be better, perhaps? Yes, Peter. You would feel safe then, safer than ever? Safer than ever, Peter. End of the opening of the door and how Charmian blew out the light. Section 31 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 22. In which the ancient discourses on love. I am forging a bar for my cottage door, such a bar as might give check to an army, or resist a battering ram a bar that shall defy all the night prowlers that ever prowled a stout solid bar broad as my wrist and thick as my two fingers that looking upon it as it lies in its sockets across the door charmian henceforth may sleep and have no fear the ancient sat perched on his stool in the corner but for once we spoke little for i was very busy also my mind was plunged in a profound reverie and of whom should i be thinking but of charmian and of the dimple in her shoulder "'Tis bewitched you be, Peter,' said the old man suddenly, prodding me softly with his stick. "'Bewitched as ever was,' and he chuckled. "'Bewitched?' said I, starting. "'Ah, here you stand, with your hammer in your hand, and staring and a-staring at nobody nor nothing, leastways not as human I can see, and a-sighing and a-sighing. Did I indeed sigh, ancient? "'Ah, that you did, like a cow, Peter, or a horse, heavy and tired-like, and slow you be, and dreamy, you as was so bright and spry, there's some fools like Joel Amos, as might think as twere the work of ghostess, or demons, a castin' their spells on ye, or that some vampire had bit ye in the night and sucked your blood as ye lay asleep. But I know different, you'm just bewitched, Peter. 
and he chuckled again. Who knows, perhaps I am, but it will pass. Whatever it is, it will pass. Don't be ye too sure of that. There's bewitchments and bewitchments, Peter. Hereupon the smithy became full of the merry din of my hammer, and while I worked the ancient smoked his pipe and watched me, informing me, between whiles, that the Jersey cow was in calf, that the hops seemed more than usually forward, and that he had waked that morning with a touch of the rheumatics, but otherwise he was unusually silent. Moreover, each time that I happened to glance up it was to find him regarding me with a certain fixity of eye, which at another time would have struck me as portentous. "'You be palish this morning, Peter,' said he, dabbing me suddenly with his pipe-stem. "'Shouldn't wonder if you was to tell me as your appetite was bad. Come now, you didn't eat much of a breakfast this morning, did you?' "'I don't think I did, Ancient.' "'A course not,' said the old man, with a nod of profound approval. "'It aren't to be expected. Let's see, it be all of four months since I found you, bain't it?' Four months and a few odd days,' I nodded, and fell to work upon my glowing iron bar. "'You'll make a tidy smith one of these days, Peter,' said the old man encouragingly, as I straightened my back and plunged the iron back into the fire. "'Thank you, Ancient.' Ay, you've learned to use a hammer pretty well, considering though you be wasting your opportunity shameful, Peter, shameful. Am I, Ancient? Ay, that you be. Moon can't last much longer. She be on the way there, Eddie. Moon? said I, staring. Ah, moon, nodded the old man. There's nout like a moon, Peter, and if she be the full, so much the better. But what have the moon and I to do with each other, Ancient? old i be peter a old old man but i were young once and i tell ye the moon has a lot more to do it than some folks think why lord lovey there wouldn't be near so many children a playing in the sun if it wasn't for the moon ancient said i what might you be driving at love peter love said i letting go the handle of the bellows and marriage peter what in the world put such thoughts in your head you did peter i ah some men is born lovers peter and you be one i never see such eyes as yourn afore so burnin ought they be and peter some maid will see the love light aflame in em some day and drop her head and blush and tremble for she'll know peter she'll know maids was made to be loved peter but ancient i am not the kind of man women would be attracted by i love books and solitude and am called a pedant and besides i am not of a loving sort some men peter falls in love as easy as they falls out it comes to some soft and quiet like the dawn of a summer's day peter but to others it comes like a garden terrible storm oh that it do there is a fire ready to burn up inside of ye at the touch of some women's hand or the peep of her eye ah a fire as'll burn and burn and never go out again not even if you should live to be as old as i be and you'll be strong and wild and fierce with it and some day you'll find her, Peter, and she'll find you. And, said I, staring away into the distance, do you think that by any possible chance she might love me, this woman? Ay, for sure, said the ancient. For sure she will. Why don't ye up an ox, sir? Well, fine round moon or ed, and a pretty maid at your elber. It's easy enough to tell her you love her, ain't it? Indeed, yes, said I, beginning to rub my chin. Very easy. And I sighed and when you looks into a pair of sweet eyes and sees the shine of the moon in em why it aren't so fur to her lips are it peter no said i rubbing my chin harder than ever no and there's the danger of it where's the danger peter everywhere i answered in her eyes in her thick soft hair the warmth of her breath the touch of her hand the least contact of her garments her very step i knowed it cried the ancient joyfully peering at me under his brows i knowed it knew what you be in love good lad good lad and he flourished his pipe in the air in love i exclaimed in love i sure as sure but love according to aristotle is love peter is what makes a man forget his breakfast and his work and his but i work very hard besides love is what makes a man so brave as a lion peter and fall a-tremblin like a coward when she stands a-lookin up at him love makes the green earth greener and the long road short Ah almost too short sometimes the love of a woman comes betwixt a man and all evils and dangers why don't he up an axe her peter she'd laugh at me ancient not she that soft low laugh of hers well what of that besides she hardly knows me the ancient took out his snuff-box and gave two double knocks upon the lid 
a woman knows a man sooner than a man knows a woman ah a sight sooner why lord bless you peter she has him all reckoned up long afore he knows for sure if her eyes be black uns or brown uns and that she has here he extracted a pinch of snuff as for prudence she loves you with all her heart and soul prudence said i staring ah prudence i be her grandfather i know prudence said i again she am a handsome lass and so pretty as a victor you said so yourself and what's more she am a sensible lass and will make ye as fine a wife as ever was if only if only she loved me ancient to be sure peter but you see she doesn't eh what what peter prudence doesn't love me doesn't not by any means peter you're joking no ancient but i i be all took aback mazed i be not love ye and me with my art set on it are you sure certain how do you know she told me so but why why shouldn't she love ye why should she but i i'd set my art on it peter it is very unfortunate said i and began blowing up the fire peter yes ancient do ee love she no ancient the old man rose and hobbling forward tapped me on the breast with the handle of his stick then who was ye talking of a while back about her eyes and her hair and her dress and being afraid of em to be exact i don't know ancient oh peter exclaimed the old man shaking his head i wonders at ye arter me a thinkin and a thinkin and a plannin and a plannin all these months after me a sendin black jarge about his business ancient what do you mean why didn't die out and tell ye as you was sweet on pru did you tell him that i cried ay to be sure i did and what's more i says do an often and often when you wasn't by jarge i'd say prue's a lovely maid and peter's a fine young chap and they am beginning to find each other out they be all as talkin to each other and a lookin at each other morn and noon and night i says like as not we'll have a marryin each other afore very long and jarge jud up and wrinkle up his brows and walk away and never say a word but now it'll be terrible hard to be disappointed like this peter arter i set my heart on it and me such an old man such a very ancient man oh peter you be full of disappointments and all manner of contrariness sometimes i almost wishes as i'd never took the trouble to find you at all and with this parthian shot the old man sighed and turned his back upon me and tottered out of the forge chapter twenty three how gabbing dick the peddler set a hammer going in my head having finished my bars with four strong brackets to hold them i put away my tools and donned hat and coat it was yet early and there was besides much work waiting to be done but i felt unwontedly tired and out of sorts wherefore with my bars and brackets beneath my arm i set out for the hollow from the hedges on either side of me came the sweet perfume of the honeysuckle and beyond the hedges the fields stood high with ripening corn a yellow heavy-headed host nodding and swaying lazily i stood a while to listen to its whisper as the gentle wind swept over it and to look down the long green alleys of the hop gardens beyond and at the end of one of these straight arched vistas there shone a solitary great star and presently lifting my eyes to the sky already deepening to evening and remembering how i had looked round me ere i faced black george i breathed a sigh of thankfulness that i was yet alive with strength to walk within a world so beautiful now as i stood thus i heard a voice hailing me and glancing about espied one some distance up the road who sat beneath the hedge whom upon approaching i recognized as gabbing dick the peddler he nodded and grinned as i came up but in both there was a vague unpleasantness as also in the manner in which he eyed me slowly up and down you've stood a looking up in the sky for a good ten minutes said he and what if i have nothing said the peddler nothing at all though if the moon had been up a cove might have thought as you was dreaming of some eve or other love-sick folk always stares at the moon leastwise so they tell me any one stares at the moon when he might be doing summat better as a fool as great a fool as any man who stares at a eve for a eve never brought any man nothing but trouble and sorrow and never will now don't frown young cove nor shake your head for it's true what's caused more sorrow and blood than them eaves blood ah rivers of it oceans of good blood's been spilt all along o women from the eve as tricked old adam to the eve as tricks the like of me or say yourself here he regarded me with so evil a leer that i turned my back in disgust don't go young cove i ain't done yet i got summat to tell ye then tell it said i stopping again struck by the fellow's manner and tell it quickly i'm a-comin to it as fast as i can ain't i very well then 
you're a fine upstanding young cove and may have white hands which i don't see myself but no matter and may likewise be chock full of taking ways which though not noticing i won't go for to deny but a eve's a eve it always will be you'll mind as i warned you against the last time i see you very well then well said i impatiently well nodded the peddler and his eyes twinkled malevolently i says it again i warns you again you're a nice civil spoke young cove and quiet though i don't like the cock o your eye and mind i don't bear you no ill though you did turn me from your door on a cold dark night it was neither a cold nor a dark night said i well it might have been mightn't it very well then still i don't said the peddler spitting dejectedly into the ditch i don't bear you no hard feelings for it no how me always makin it a pint to forgive them as woefully oppresses me likewise them as despitefully uses me it might have been cold and dark with ice and snow and i might have froze to death and we won't say no more about it you've said pretty well i think said i supposing you tell me what you have to tell me otherwise good night very well then said the peddler let's talk of somebody else still living in the oller i suppose yes ah well i come through there to-day said he grinning and again his eyes grew malevolent indeed ah indeed i come through there this very afternoon and uncommon pretty everything was looking with the grass so green and the trees so so shady shady's the word nodded the peddler glancing at me through his narrowed eyelids and chuckling a paradise you might call it ah a paradise or a garden of eden with eve and the serpent and all and he broke out into a cackling laugh and in the look and the laugh indeed about his whole figure there was something so repellent so evil that i was minded to kick and trample him down into the ditch yet the leering triumph in his eyes held me yes said i you see by and by i happened to pass the cottage and very pretty that looked too and nice and neat inside yes said i and being so near i happened to glance in the winder and there sure enough i see her as ye might say eve in the garden and a fine figure of a eve she be and handsome with it tain't often you see a maid likes her so proud and naughty like well well i just happened to look in the winder she happened to be standing with an open book in her hand a old leather book with a broken cover yes said i and she was a laughing and a pretty soft eve's laugh it were too yes said i and he were a-looking at the book over her shoulder the irons slipped from my grasp and fell with a harsh clang catches ye does it said the peddler i did not speak but meet in my eye he scrambled hastily to his feet and catching up his pack retreated some little way down the road catches ye does it my cove he repeated turn me away from your door on a cold dark night would ya not as i bears ye any ill will for it being of a forgiven nature but i says to you i says look out a fine handsome lass she be with her soft eyes and red lips and long white arms the eyes and lips and arms of the eve and eve tricked adam didn't she and you ain't a better man nor adam are ye very well then saying which he spat once more into the ditch and shouldering his pack strode away and after some while i took up my iron bars and trudged on toward the cottage as i went i repeated to myself over and over again the word liar yet my step was very slow and heavy and my feet dragged in the dust and somewhere in my head a small hammer had begun to beat soft and slow and regular but beating beating upon my brain now the upper cover of my virgil book was broken end of how gabbing dick the peddler set a hammer going in my head section thirty two of the broad highway this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by lynn thompson the broad highway by geoffrey farnall book two chapter twenty four the virgil book a man was leaning in the shadow of a tree looking down into the hollow I could not see him very distinctly because though evening had scarcely fallen the shadows where he stood were very dense But he was gazing down into the hollow in the attitude of one who waits for what for whom a Sudden fit of shivering shook me from head to foot and while I yet shivered I grew burning hot the blood throbbed at my temples the small hammer was drumming much faster now and the cool night air seemed to be stifling me very cautiously i began creeping nearer the passive figure 
while the hammer beat so loud that it seemed he must hear it where he stood a shortish broad-shouldered figure clad in a blue coat he held his hat in his hand and he leaned carelessly against the tree and his easy assurance of air maddened me the more as he stood thus looking always down into the hollow his neck gleamed at me above the collar of his coat wherefore i stooped and laying my irons in the grass crept on once more and as i went i kept my eyes upon his neck a stick snapped sharp and loud beneath my tread and lounging back stiffened and grew rigid the face showed for an instant over the shoulder and with a spring he had vanished into the bushes it was a vain hope to find a man in such a dense tangle of boughs and underbrush yet i ran forward nevertheless but though i sought eagerly upon all sides he had made good his escape so after a while i retraced my steps to where i had left my irons and brackets and taking them up turned aside to that precipitous path which as i have already said leads down into the hollow now as i went listening to the throb of the hammer in my head whom should i meet but charmian coming gaily through the green and singing as she came at sight of me she stopped and the song died upon her lip why why peter you look pale dreadfully pale thank you i am very well said i you have not been fighting again why should i have been fighting charmian your eyes are wild and fierce peter were you coming to to meet me charmian yes peter now watching beneath my brows it almost seemed that her colour had changed and that her eyes of set purpose avoided mine could it be that she was equivocating but i am much before my usual time to-night charmian then there will be no waiting for supper and i am ravenous peter and as she led the way along the path she began to sing again being come to the cottage i set down my bars and brackets with a clang these said i in answer to her look are the bars i promised to make for the door do you always keep your promises peter i hope so then said she coming to look at the great bars with a fork in her hand for she was in the middle of dishing up then if you promise me always to come home by the road and never through the coppice you will do so won't you why should i i inquired turning sharply to look at her because the coppice is so dark and lonely and if i say if i should take it into my head to come and meet you sometimes there would be no chance of my missing you and so she looked at me and smiled and going back to her cooking fell once more a singing the while i sat and watched her beneath my brows surely surely no woman whose heart was full of deceit could sing so blithely and happily or look at one with such sweet candour in her eyes and yet the supper was a very ghost of a meal for when i remembered the man who had watched and waited the very food grew nauseous and seemed to choke me she's a eve a eve rang a voice in my ear eve tricked adam didn't she and you ain't a better man nor adam she's a eve a eve peter you eat nothing yes indeed said i staring unseeingly down at my plate and striving to close my ears against the fiendish voice and you are very pale i shrugged my shoulders peter look at me i looked up obediently yes you are frightfully pale are you ill again is it your head peter what is it and with a sudden half shy gesture she stretched her hand to me across the table and as i looked from the mute pity in her eyes to the mute pity of that would-be comforting hand i had a great impulse to clasp it close in mine to speak and tell her all my base and unworthy suspicions and once more to entreat her pardon and forgiveness the words were upon my lips but i checked them madman that i was and shook my head it is nothing i answered unless it be that i have not yet recovered from black george's fist it is nothing and so the meal drew to an end and though feeling my thoughts base i sat with my head on my hand and my eyes upon the cloth 
yet I knew she watched me, and more than once I heard her sigh. A man who acts on impulse may sometimes be laughed at for his mistakes, but he will frequently attain to higher things, and be much better loved by his fellows than the colder, more calculating logician, who rarely makes a blunder. And Simon Peter was a man of impulse. Supper being over and done, Charmian must needs take my coat, despite my protests, and fall to work upon its threadbare shabbiness, mending a great rent in the sleeve. And, watching her through the smoke of my pipe, noting the high mould of her features, the proud poise of her head, the slender elegance of her hands, I was struck sharply by her contrast to the rough, bare walls that were my home, and the toil-worn, unlovely garment beneath her fingers. As I looked, she seemed to be suddenly removed from me, far above and beyond my reach. That's the fourth time, Peter. What, Charmian? That is the fourth time you have sighed since you lighted your pipe, and it is out, and you never noticed it. Yes, said I, and laid the pipe upon the table, and sighed again, before I could stop myself. Charmian raised her head, and looked at me with a laugh in her eyes. Oh, my philosophical dreamy blacksmith, where be your thoughts? I was thinking how old and worn and disreputable my coat looked. Indeed, sir, said Charmian, holding it up and regarding it with a little frown. Forsooth, it is ancient and hath seen better days. Like the wearer, said I, and sighed again. Hark to this ancient man, she laughed, this hoary-headed blacksmith of ours, who sighs and for ever sighs. If it could possibly be that he had met any one sufficiently worthy, I should think that he had fallen, philosophically, in love. How think you, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance? I remember, said I, that among other things you once called me Superior Mr. Smith. Charmian laughed and nodded her head at me. You have been describing to me some quite impossible idealistic creature, alone worthy of your regard, sir. Do you still think me superior, Charmian? Do you still dream of your impalpable, bloodlessly perfect ideals, sir? No, I answered. No, I think I have done with dreaming. And I have done with this thy coat, for behold, it is finished. And rising, she folded it over the back of my chair. Now, as she stood thus behind me, her hand fell and, for a moment, rested lightly upon my shoulder. Peter. Yes, Charmian. I wish, yes, I do wish that you were either much younger or very much older. Why? Because you wouldn't be quite so, so cryptic. Such a very abstruse problem. Sometimes I think I understand you better than you do yourself, and sometimes I am utterly lost. Now, if you were younger, I could read you easily for myself, and if you were older, you would read yourself for me. I was never very young, said I. No, you were always too repressed, Peter. Yes, perhaps I was. Repression is good up to a certain point, but beyond that it is dangerous, said she, with a portentous shake of the head. Hey-ho, was it a week or a year ago that you avowed yourself happy and couldn't tell why? I was the greater fool, said I, for not knowing why, Peter, for thinking myself happy. Peter, what is happiness? An idea, said I, possessed generally of fools. And what is misery? Misery is also an idea. Possessed only by the wise Peter, surely he is wiser who chooses happiness. Neither happiness nor misery comes from choice. But if one seeks happiness, Peter? One will assuredly find misery, said I, and, sighing, rose, and taking my hammer from its place above the bookshelf, set to work upon my brackets, driving them deep into the heavy framework of the door. All at once I stopped, with my hammer poised, and, for no reason in the world, looked back at Charmian over my shoulder, looked to find her watching me with eyes that were, if it could well be, puzzled, wistful, shy, and glad at one and the same time, eyes that veiled themselves swiftly before my look, yet that shot one last glance between their lashes, 
in which were only joy and laughter Yes, said I answering the look but she only stooped her head and went on sewing yet the color was bright in her cheeks and Having driven in the four brackets or staples and closed the door I took up the bars and showed her how they were to lie crosswise across the door resting in the brackets We shall be safe now Peter said she those bars would resist an elephant I Think they would I nodded, but there is yet something more Going to my shelf of books. I took thence the silver mounted pistol She had brought with her and balanced it in my hand Tomorrow I will take this to Cranbrook and buy bullets to fit it why there are bullets there in one of the old shoes Peter They are too large. This is an unusually small caliber and yet it will be deadly enough at close range I will load it for you Charmian and give it into your keeping in case you should ever Grow afraid again when I am not by this is a lonely place for a woman at all times Yes, Peter she was busily employed upon a piece of embroidery and began to sing softly to herself again as she worked that old song which worthy mr Pepys mentions having heard from the lips of mischievous-eyed Nell Gwynn in Scarlet town where I was born there was a fair maid dwelling made every youth cry well away her name was Barbara Allen are you so happy Charmian oh sir indifferent well I thank you all in the merry month of May when green buds they were swelling young Jimmy Grove on his deathbed lay for love of Barbara Allen Are you so miserable Peter? Why do you ask? Because you sigh and sigh like poor Jimmy Grove in the song He was a fool said I for sighing Peter for dying I Suppose no philosopher could ever be so foolish Peter no said i certainly not it is well to be a philosopher isn't it peter hmm said i and once more set about lighting my pipe anon i rose and crossing to the open door looked out upon the summer night and sighed and coming back sat watching charmian's busy fingers charmian said i at last yes peter do you ever see any any men lurking about the hollow when I am away her needle stopped suddenly and she did not look up as she answered no Peter never are you sure Charmian the needle began to fly to and fro again but still she did not look up no of course not how should I see anyone I scarcely go beyond the hollow and I'm busy all day a Eve a Eve Said a voice in my ear Eve tricked Adam didn't she a Eve After this I sat for a long time without moving my mind harassed with doubts and a hideous morbid dread Why had she avoided my eye her own were pure and truthful and could not lie Why why had they avoided mine if only she had looked at me? Presently I rose and began to pace up and down the room you are very restless Peter yes said I yes I fear I am you must pardon me why not read indeed I had not thought of my books then read me something aloud Peter I will read you the sorrow of Achilles for the loss of precise and going into the corner I raised my hand to my shelf of books and stood there with hand upraised yet touching no book for a sudden spasm seemed to have me in its clutches and once again the trembling seized me and the hammer had recommenced its beat beating upon my brain and In a while I turned from my books and crossing to the door leaned there with my back to her lest she should see my face just then I I don't think I will read tonight said I at last Very well Peter. Let us talk Or talk said I I I think I'll go to bed Pray I went on hurriedly for I was conscious that she had raised her head and was looking at me in some surprise Pray excuse me. I'm very tired So while she yet stared at me I turned away and mumbling a good night went into my chamber and Closing the door leaned against it for my mind was sick with dread and sorrow and a great anguish 
for now i knew that charmian had lied to me my virgil book had been moved from its usual place end of book two chapter twenty four Section 33 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 25, in which the reader shall find little to do with the story, and may, therefore, skip. Is there anywhere in the world so damnable a place of torment as a bed? to lie awake through the slow dragging hours surrounded by a sombre quietude from whose stifling blackness thoughts like demons leap to catch us by the throat or like waves come rolling in upon us ceaselessly remorselessly burying us beneath their resistless flow catching us up whirling us dizzily aloft dashing us down into depths infinite now retreating now advancing from whose oncoming terror there is no escape until we are once more buried beneath their stifling rush. To lie awake staring wide-eyed into a crowding darkness, wherein move terrors unimagined, to bury our throbbing temples in pillows of fire, to roll and toss until the soul within us cries out in agony, and we reach out frantic hands into a void that mocks us by contrast of its deep, awful quiet. At such times fair reason runs affrighted to hide herself, and foaming madness fills her throne, at such times our everyday sorrows, howsoever small and petty they be, grow and magnify themselves until they overflow the night, filling the universe above and around us. And of all the woes the human mind can bear, surely suspicion gnaws deeper than them all. So I lay beneath the incubus, my temples clasped tight between my burning palms, to stay the maddening ring of the hammer in my brain. And suspicion grew into certainty, and with certainty came madness. Imagination ran riot. She was a Messalina, a Julia, a Joan of Naples, a veritable succuba, a thing polluted, degraded, and abominable. And because of her beauty I cursed all beautiful things, and because of her womanhood I cursed all women. And ever the hammer beat upon my brain, and foul shapes danced before my eyes, shapes so insanely hideous and revolting that of a sudden I rose from my bed groaning, and coming to the casement I leaned out. Oh, the cool, sweet purity of the night! I heard the soft stir and rustle of leaves all about me, and down from heaven came a breath of wind, and in the wind a great raindrop that touched my burning brow like the finger of God. And leaning there with parted lips and closed eyes, gradually my madness left me, and the throbbing in my brain grew less. How many poor mortals since the world began, sleepless and anguish-torn, even as I, have looked up into that self-same sky and sorrowed for the dawn. For her love in sleep I slake, for her love all night I wake, for her love I mourning make, more than any man. Poor fool, to think that thou couldst mourn more than thy kind. Thou art but a little handful of grey dust, ages since, thy name and estate long out of mind, Where'er thou art, thou shouldst have got you wisdom by now, perchance. Poor fool, that thou must love a woman and worship with thy love, building for her an altar in thine heart. If altar crumble and heart burst, is she to blame, who is but woman, or thou, who wouldst have made her all divine? Well, thou art dead, a small handful of grey dust long since. Perchance thou hast got thee wisdom ere now, poor fool, O oh, fool divine. As thou art now, thy sleepless nights forgot, the carking sorrows of thy life all overpast and done. So must I some time be, and, ages hence, shall smile at this, and reckon it no more than a broken toy, hi-o. And so I presently turned back to my tumbled bed, but it seemed to me that torment and terror still waited me there. Moreover, I was filled with a great desire for action. This narrow chamber stifled me, while outside was the stir of leaves, the gentle breathing of the wind, the cool murmur of the brook, with night brooding over all, deep and soft and still. Being now dressed, I stood a while, deliberating how I might escape, without disturbing her who slumbered in the outer room. So I came to the window, and thrusting my head and shoulders sideways through the narrow lattice, slowly and with much ado wriggled myself out. 
Rising from my hands and knees, I stood up and threw wide my arms to the perfumed night, inhaling its sweetness in great deep breaths, and so turned my steps toward the brook, drawn thither by its rippling melody. For a brook is a companionable thing at all times to a lonely man, and very full of wise counsel and friendly admonitions, if he but have ears to hear withal. Thus as I walked beside the brook, it spoke to me of many things, grave and gay, delivering itself of observations upon the folly of humans, comparing us very unfavorably with the godlike dignity of the trees, the immutability of mountains, and the profound philosophy of brooks. Indeed, it waged most eloquent upon this theme, caustic, if you will, but with a ripple between whiles, like the deep-throated chuckle of the wise old philosopher it was. "'Go to,' chuckled the brook. O oh, heavy-footed, heavy-sighing human, go to! It is written that man was given dominion over birds and beasts and fishes, and all things made, yet how doth man in all his pride compare with even a little mountain? And as to birds and beasts and fishes, they provide for themselves day in and day out, while man doth starve and famish. To what end is man born but to work, beget his kind, and die? O oh, man, lift up thy dull-sighted eyes, behold the wonder of the world, the infinite universe about thee, Behold thyself, and see thy many failings and imperfections, and thy stupendous littleness. Go to! Man was made for the world, and not the world for man. Man is a leaf in the forest, a grain of dust, borne upon the wind. And, when the wind faileth, dust to dust returneth, out upon thee with thy puny griefs and sorrows. O man who hath dominion over all things save thine own heart, and who in blind egotism setteth thyself much above me, who am but a runlet of water, O oh, man, I tell thee, when thou art dusty bones, I shall still be here, singing to myself in the sun, or talking to some other poor human fool in the dark. Go to, chuckled the brook. The wheel of life turneth ever faster and faster. The woes of to-day shall be the woes of last year, or ever thou canst count them all. Out upon thee, go to. Chapter 26 of Storm and Tempest and How I Met One Praying in the Dawn on I went, chin on breast, heedless of all direction, now beneath the shade of trees, now crossing grassy glades, or rolling meadow, or threading my way through long alleys of hop-vines, on and on, skirting hedges by haycocks looming ghostly in the dark, by rustling cornfields, through wood and coppice, where branches touched me as I passed, like ghostly fingers in the dark. On I went, lost to all things but my own thoughts, and my thoughts were not of life nor death, nor the world, nor the spaces beyond the world but of my Virgil book with the broken cover, and of him who had looked at it over her shoulder. And raising my hands, I clasped them about my temples, and leaning against a tree, stood there a great while. Yet when the trembling fit had left me, I went on again, and with every footstep there rose a voice within me, crying, Why? 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 Why should I, Peter Vibart, hale and well in body, healthy in mind, why should I fall thus into ague spasms because of a woman, of whom I knew nothing, who had come I knew not whence, accompanied by one whose presence under such conditions meant infamy to any woman. Why should I burn thus in a fever if she chose to meet another while I was abroad? Was she not free to follow her own devices? Had I any claim upon her? By what right did I seek to compass her goings and comings, or interest myself in her doings? Why? 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 As I went, the woods gradually fell away, and I came out upon an open place, the ground rose sharply before me, but I climbed on and up, and so in time stood upon a hill. Now standing upon this elevation, with the woods looming dimly below me, as if they were a dark tide hemming me in on all sides, I became conscious of a sudden greater quietude in the air, a stillness that was like the hush of expectancy. Not a sound came to me, not a whisper from the myriad leaves below. But as I stood there listening, very faint and far away, I heard a murmur that rose and died and rose again, that swelled and swelled into the roll of distant thunder. Down in the woods was a faint rustling, as if some giant were stirring among the leaves, and out of their depths breathed a puff of wind that fanned my cheek, and so was gone. But in a while it was back again, stronger, more insistent than before, till, sudden as it came, it died away again, and all was hushed and still, save only for the tremor down there among the leaves. But lightning flickered upon the horizon, the thunder rolled nearer and nearer, and the giant grew ever more restless. Round about me in the dark were imps that laughed and whispered together and mocked me amid the leaves. Who is the madman that stands upon a lonely hill at midnight, 
bareheaded, half-clad, and hungers for the storm. Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Who is he that having eyes sees not, and having ears hears not? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart! Blow, wind, and buffet him, flame, O lightning, that he may see, roar, O thunder, that he may hear and know. Upon the stillness came a rustling, louder and ever louder, drowning all else, for the giant was awake at last, and stretching himself, and now up he sprang with a sudden bellow, and gathering himself together, swept up toward me through the swaying tree-tops, pelting me with broken twigs and flying leaves, and filling the air with the tumult of his coming. Oh, the wind, the bellowing giant wind! On he came, exulting, whistling through my hair, stopping my breath, roaring in my ears his savage, wild halloo, and, as if in answer, forth from the inky heaven burst a jagged, blinding flame that zigzagged down among the tossing trees, and vanished with a roaring thunderclap that seemed to stun all things to silence. But not for long, for in the darkness came the wind again, fiercer, wilder than before, shrieking a defiance. The thunder crashed above me, and the lightning quivered in the air about me, till my eyes ached with the swift transitions from pitch darkness to dazzling light, light in which distant objects started out clear and well-defined, only to be lost again in a swirl of blackness. And now came rain, a sudden hissing downpour, long threads of scintillating fire, where the lightning caught it, rain that wetted me through and through. The storm was at its height and as I listened, rain and wind and thunder became merged and blended into awful music, a symphony of life and death played by the hands of God, and I was an atom, a grain of dust, an insect, to be crushed by God's little finger. And yet needs must this insect still think upon its little self, for half-drowned, deafened, blind, and half-stunned though I was, still the voice within me cried, Why? 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 Why was I here, instead of lying soft and sheltered and sleeping the blessed sleep of tired humanity? Why was I here with death about me? And why must I think, and think, and think of her? The whole breadth of heaven seemed torn asunder. Blue flame crackled in the air. It ran hissing along the ground, then blackness and a thunderclap that shook the very hill beneath me, and I was down on my knees with the swish of the rain about me. Little by little upon this silence stole the rustle of leaves, and in the leaves were the imps who mocked me. Who is he that doth love, in spite of himself, and shall do all his days, be she good or evil, whatever she was, whatever she is? Who is the very fool of love? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. And so I bowed my face upon my hands, and remained thus a great while, heeding no more the tempest about me, for now indeed was my question answered, and my fear realized. I love her. Whatever she was, whatever she is, good or evil, I love her. O oh, fool! O oh, most miserable fool! And presently I rose and went on down the hill. Fast I strode, stumbling and slipping, plunging on heedlessly through bush and brake, until at last, looking about me, I found myself on the outskirts of a little spinney or copse. Then I became conscious that the storm had passed, for the thunder had died down to a murmur, and the rain had ceased. Only all about me were little soft sounds, as if the trees were weeping silently together. Pushing on, I came to a sort of narrow lane, grassy underfoot, and shut in on either hand by very tall hedges that loomed solid and black in the night. And being spent and weary, I sat down beneath one of these, and propped my chin in my hands. How long I remained thus I cannot say, but I was at length aroused by a voice, a strangely sweet and gentle voice at no great distance, and the words it uttered were these, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth for ever. O Lord, I beseech thee, look down in thine infinite pity upon this thy world, for to-day is at hand, and thy children must soon awake to life and toil and temptation. O thou who art the lover of men, let thy Holy Spirit wait to meet with each one of us upon the threshold of the dawn, and lead us through this coming day. Like as a father pitieth his children, so dost thou pity all the woeful and heavy-hearted. Look down upon all those who must so soon awake to their griefs, Speak comfortably to them. Remember those in pain who must so soon take up their weary burdens. Look down upon the hungry and the rich, the evil and the good, that in this new day, finding each something of thy mercy, they may give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So the voice ended, and there was silence and a profound stillness upon all things. Wherefore, lifting my eyes into the east, I saw that it was dawn. End of section 33
Section 34 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 27. The Epileptic. Now when the prayer was ended, I turned my back upon the lightning east and set off along the lane. But as I went, I heard one hailing me, and glancing round, saw that in the hedge was a wicket gate, and over this gate a man was leaning. A little, thin man with the face of an ascetic, or a medieval saint, a face of a high and noble beauty, upon whose scholarly brow sat a calm serenity, yet beneath which glowed the full bright eye of the man of action. "'Good morning, friend,' said B. "'Welcome to my solitude. I wish you joy of this new day of ours.' It is cloudy yet, but there is a rift down on the horizon. It will be a fair day, I think. On the contrary, sir, said I, to me there are all evidences of the bad weather continuing. I think it will be a bad day, with rain, and probably thunder and lightning. Good morning, sir. Stay, cried he, as I turned away, and with the word set his hand upon the gate, and vaulting nimbly over, came toward me, with a broad-brimmed straw hat in one hand, and a long-stemmed wooden pipe in the other. Sir, said he, my cottage is close by. You look worn and jaded. Will you not step in and rest a while? Thank you, sir, but I must be upon my way. And whither lies your way? To Sissinghurst, sir. You have a long walk before you, and, with your permission, I will accompany you a little way. With pleasure, sir, I answered, though I fear you will find me a moody companion, and somewhat silent one. But then I shall be the better listener, so light your pipe, sir, and while you smoke, talk. "'My pipe,' said he, glancing down at it. "'Ah! Yes, I was about to compose my Sunday evening's sermon. "'You are a clergyman, sir?' "'No, no, a preacher, or, say, rather, a teacher, "'and a very humble one, who, striving himself after truth, "'seeks to lend such aid to others as he may.' "'Truth,' said I, "'what is truth?' "'Truth, sir, is that which can never pass away. "'The truth of life is good works which abide everlastingly.' Sir, said I, you smoke a pipe, I perceive, and should therefore be a good preacher, for smoking begets thought. And yet, sir, is not to act greater than to think? Why, thought far outstrips puny action, said I. It reaches deeper, soars higher. In our actions we are pygmies, but in our thoughts we may be gods, and embrace a universe. But, sighed the preacher, while we think, our fellows perish in ignorance and want. Huh, said I thought, pursued the preacher, may become a vice, as it did with the old-time monks and hermits, who, shutting themselves away from their kind, wasted their lives upon their knees, thinking noble thoughts, and dreaming of holy things, but leaving the world very carefully to the devil. And as to smoking, I am seriously considering giving it up. Here he took the pipe from his lips and thrust it behind his back. Why? It has become, unfortunately, too human. "'It is a strange thing, sir,' he went on, smiling and shaking his head, "'that this, my one indulgence, should breed me more discredit than all the cardinal sins, "'and become a stumbling-block to others. "'Only last Sunday I happened to overhear two white-headed old fellows talking. "'A fine sermon, Giles?' said the one. "'Ah, good enough,' replied the other. "'But it might have been better, you see. He smokes. "'So I am seriously thinking of giving it up, "'for it would appear that if a preacher prove himself as human as his flock, "'they immediately lose faith in him and become deaf to his teaching.' "'Very true, sir,' I nodded. "'It has always been human to admire and respect that only which is in any way different to ourselves. "'In archaic times, those whose teachings were above men's comprehension, "'or who were remarkable for any singularity of action, were immediately deified. Pythagoras recognized this truth when he shrouded himself in mystery, and delivered his lectures from behind a curtain, though to be sure he has become regarded as something of a charlatan in consequence. "'Pray, sir,' said the preacher, absent-mindedly puffing his pipe again, "'may I ask what you are?' "'A blacksmith, sir.' "'And where did you read of Pythagoras and the like?' "'At Oxford, sir.' "'How comes it, then, that I find you in the dawn, wet with rain, buffeted by wind, and most of all, a shewer of horses?' but instead of answering I pointed to a twisted figure that lay beneath the opposite hedge. "'A man!' exclaimed the preacher, "'and asleep, I think.' "'No,' said I, "'not in that contorted attitude.' "'Indeed you are right,' said the preacher. "'The man is ill, poor fellow.' And hurrying forward, he fell on his knees beside the prostrate figure. He was a tall man, roughly clad, 
and he lay upon his back, rigid and motionless, while upon his blue lips were flecks and bubbles of foam. "'Epilepsy,' said I. The preacher nodded, and busied himself with loosening the sodden neckcloth, while I unclasped the icy fingers to relieve the tension of the muscles. The man's hair was long and matted, as was also his beard, and his face all drawn and pale and very deeply lined. Now as I looked at him I had a vague idea that I had somewhere, at some time, seen him before. Sir, said the preacher, looking up, will you help me to carry him to my cottage? It is not very far. So we presently took the man's wasted form between us, and bore it easily enough to where stood a small cottage, bowered in roses and honeysuckle. And having deposited our unconscious burden upon the preacher's humble bed, I turned to depart. Sir, said the preacher, holding out his hand, it is seldom one meets with a blacksmith who has read the Pythagorean philosophy at Oxford, and I should like to see you again. I am a lonely man, save for my books. Come and sup with me some evening, and let us talk. And smoke, said I. The little preacher sighed. I will come, said I. Thank you, and good-bye. Now even as I spoke, chancing to cast my eyes upon the pale, still face on the bed, I felt more certain than ever that I had somewhere seen it before. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, IN WHICH I COME TO A DETERMINATION As I walked through the fresh green world there ensued within me the following dispute, as it were, between myself and two voices. The first voice I will call pro, and the other contra. Myself. May the devil take that gabbing dick. Pro. He probably will. Myself. Had he not told me of what he saw, of the man who looked at my Virgil over her shoulder. Pro. Or had you not listened? myself. Ah, yes, but then I did listen, and that he spoke the truth is beyond all doubt. The misplaced Virgil proves that. However, it is certain, yes, very certain, that I can remain no longer in the hollow. Contra. Well, there is excellent accommodation at the bull. Pro. And pray, why leave the hollow? Myself. Because she is a woman. Pro. And you love her? Myself. To my sorrow. Pro. Well, but woman was made for man, Peter, and man for woman myself, sternly, enough of that, I must go. Pro, being full of bitter jealousy, myself, no. Pro, being a mad, jealous fool, myself, as you will. Pro, who has condemned her unheard with no chance of justification, myself, to-morrow at the very latest I shall seek some other habitation. Pro, has she the look of guilt? Myself, no, but then women are deceitful by nature and very skilful in disguising their faults, at least so I have read in my books. Pro, contemptuously, books, books, books. Myself, shortly, no matter, I have decided. Pro, do you remember how willingly she worked for you with those slender, capable hands of hers? Myself, why remind me of this? Pro, you must needs miss her presence sorely, her footstep that was always so quick and light. Myself, truly wonderful in one so nobly formed. Pro, and the way she had of singing softly to herself. Myself, a beautiful voice. Pro, with a caress in it, and then her habit of looking at you over her shoulder. Myself, ah, yes, her lashes a little drooping, her brow a little wrinkled, her lips a little parted. Contra, a comfortable inn is the bull. Myself, hastily, yes, yes, certainly. Pro, ah, her lips, the scarlet witchery of her lips, do you remember how sweetly the lower one curved upward to its fellow, a mutinous mouth with its sudden bewildering changes? You never quite knew which to watch oftenest, her eyes or her lips. Contra, hoarsely, excellent cooking at the bowl. Pro, and how she would berate you and scoff at your master Epictetus and dry-as-dust philosophers. Myself, I have sometimes wondered at her pronounced antipathy to Epictetus. Pro, and she called you a creature myself, the meaning of which I never quite fathomed, pro, and frequently a pedant, myself, I think not more than four times, pro, on such occasions you will remember she had a petulant way of twitching her shoulder towards you and frowning, and occasionally stamping her foot, and deep within you, you loved it all, you know you did, contra, but that is all over, and you are going to the bull, myself, hurriedly, to be sure, the bull, pro, and lastly, you cannot have forgotten, you never will forget, the soft tumult of the tender bosom that pillowed your battered head, the pity of her hands, those great scalding tears, the sudden swift caress of her lips, and the thrill of her voice when she said, myself hastily, stop, that is all forgotten, 
pro you lie you have dreamed of it ever since working at your anvil or lying upon your bed with your eyes upon the stars you have loved her from the beginning of things myself and i did not know it i was very blind the wonder is that she did not discover my love for her long ago for not knowing it was there how should i try to hide it contra oh blind and more than blind why should you suppose she hasn't myself stopping short what can it be possible that she has contra didn't she once say that she could read you like a book myself she did contra and have you not often surprised a smile upon her lips and wondered myself many times contra have you not beheld a thin veiled mockery in her look why poor fool has she not mocked you from the first you dream of her lips were not their smiles but coquetry and derision myself but why should she deride me contra for your youth and innocence myself my youth my innocence contra being a fool in grain didn't you boast that you had known but few women myself i did but contra didn't she call you boy 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 and laugh at you myself well even so contra with bitter scorn oh boy oh innocent of the innocent go to for a bookish fool learn that lovely ladies yield themselves but to those who are masterful in their wooing who have wooed often and triumphed as often o oh, innocent of the innocent forget the maudlin sentiment of thy books and old romances thy pure sir galahads thy quote, very parfait gentil knights unquote, thy meek and lowly lovers serving their ladies on bended knee open thine eyes learn that women to-day love only the strong hand the bold eye the ready tongue kneel to her and she will scorn and contemn you what woman think you would prefer the solemn stern-eyed purity of a sir galahad though he be the king of men to the quick-witted gaiety of a debonair lothario though he be but the shadow of a man out upon thee pale-faced student thy tongue hath not the trick nor thy mind the nimbleness for the winning of a fair and lovely lady thou art well enough in want of a better but when lothario comes must she not run to meet him with arms outstretched to-morrow said i clenching my fists to-morrow i will go away being now come to the hollow i turned aside to the brook at that place where was the pool in which i was wont to perform my morning ablutions and kneeling down i gazed at myself in the dark still water and i saw that the night had indeed set its mark upon me to-morrow said i again nodding to the wild face below to-morrow i will go far hence now while i yet gazed at myself i heard a sudden gasp behind me and turning beheld charmian peter is it you she whispered drawing back from me who else charmian did i startle you yes oh peter are you afraid of me you are like one who has walked with death i rose to my feet and stood looking down at her are you afraid of me charmian no peter i am glad of that said i because I want to ask you to marry me, Charmian. End of In Which I Come to a Determination Section 35 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall. Chapter Twenty Nine, in which Charmian answers my question. Peter, yes, I wish you wouldn't. Wouldn't what, Charmian? Stir your tea round and round and round. It's really most exasperating. I beg your pardon, said I humbly. And you eat nothing, and that is also exasperating. I am not hungry, and I was so careful with the bacon. See, it is fried beautifully. Yes, you are very exasperating, Peter. Here, finding I was absent-mindedly stirring my tea round and round again, I gulped it down out of the way, whereupon Charmian took my cup and refilled it, having done which she set her elbows upon the table, and propping her chin in her hands looked at me. "'You climbed out through your window last night, Peter?' "'Yes.' "'It must have been a dreadfully tight squeeze.' "'Yes.' "'And why did you go by the window? I did not wish to disturb you.' "'That was very thoughtful of you, only, you see, I was up and dressed.' The roar of the thunder woke me. It was a dreadful storm, Peter. Yes. The lightning was awful. Yes. And you were out in it? Yes. 
Oh, you poor, poor Peter, how cold you must have been. On the contrary, I began, I, and wet, Peter, miserably wet and clammy. I did not notice, I murmured. Being a philosopher, Peter, and too much engrossed in your thoughts? I was certainly thinking. Of yourself? Yes. You are a great egoist, aren't you, Peter? Am I, Charmian? Who but an egoist could stand with his mind so full of himself and his own concerns as to be oblivious to thunder and lightning, and not know that he is miserable, clammy, and wet? I thought of others beside myself. But only in connection with yourself. Everything you have ever read or seen you apply to yourself, to make that self more worthy in Mr. Vibart's eyes. Is this worthy of Peter Vibart? Can Peter Vibart do this, that, or the other, and still retain the respect of Peter Vibart? Then why, being in all things so very correct and precise, why is Peter Vibart given to prowling abroad at midnight, quite oblivious to thunder, lightning, wet, and clamminess? I answer, because Peter Vibart is too much engrossed by Peter Vibart. There! That sounds rather cryptic and very full of Peter Vibart, but that is as it should be. And she laughed. And what does it mean, Charmian? Good sir, the Sibyl hath spoken. Find her meaning for yourself. You have called me on various occasions a creature, a pedant, very frequently a pedant, and now it seems I'm an egoist, and all because... Because you think too much, Peter. You never open your lips without having first thought out just what you are going to say. You never do anything without having laboriously mapped it all out beforehand, that you may not outrage Peter Vibrart's tranquillity by an impulsive act or speech. Oh, you are always thinking and thinking, and that is even worse than stirring and stirring at your tea as you are doing now. I took the spoon hastily from my cup and laid it as far out of reach as possible. If ever you write the book you once spoke of, it would be just the sort of book that I should hate. Why, Charmian? Because it would be a book of artfully turned phrases, a book in which all the characters, especially women, would think and speak and act by rote and rule, as according to Mr. Peter Vibart. It would be a scholarly book of elaborate finish and care of detail, with no irregularities of style or anything else to break the monotonous harmony of the whole. Indeed, sir, it would be a most unreadable book. Do you think so, Charmian? said I once more, taking up the teaspoon. Why, of course, she answered with raised brows, it would probably be full of Greek and Latin quotations, and you would polish and rewrite until you had polished every vestige of life and spontaneity out of it, as you do out of yourself with your thinking and thinking. But I never quote you Greek or Latin, that is surely something, and as for thinking, would you have me a thoughtless fool or an impulsive ass? Anything rather than a calculating, introspective philosopher, seeing only the mote in the sunbeam and nothing of the glory. Here she gently disengaged the teaspoon from my fingers and laid it in her own saucer, having done which she sighed and looked at me with her head to one side. Were they all like you, Peter, I wonder, those old philosophers, grim and stern and terribly repressed with burning eyes, Peter, and very long chins? Epictetus was, of course. And you dislike Epictetus, Charmian? I detest him. He was just the kind of person, Peter, who, being unable to sleep, would have wandered out into a terrible thunderstorm in the middle of the night, and being cold and wet and clammy, Peter, would have drawn moral lessons and made epigrams upon the thunder and lightning. Epictetus, I am sure, was a person. He was one of the wisest, gentlest, and most lovable of all the Stoics, said I. Can a philosopher possibly be lovable, Peter? Here I very absent-mindedly took up a fork, but finding her eye upon me laid it down again. You are very nervous, Peter, and very pale and worn and haggard, and all because you habitually overthink yourself. And indeed there is something very far wrong with a man who perseveringly stirs an empty cup with a fork, and with a laugh she took my cup and, having once more refilled it, set it before me. And yet, Peter, I don't think, no, I don't think I would have you very much changed after all. You mean that you would rather I remained the pedantic, egotistical creature? I mean, Peter, that being a woman I naturally love novelty, and you are very novel, and very interesting. Thank you, said I, frowning, and more contradictory than any woman. Hm, said I. You are so strong and simple, so wise and brave, so very weak and foolish and timid. Timid? said I. Timid, nodded she. I am a vast fool, I acknowledged and I never knew a man anything like you before, Peter. And you have known many, I understand. Very many. 
"'Yes, you told me so once before, I believe. "'Twice, Peter, and each time you became very silent and gloomy. "'Now you, on the other hand,' she continued, "'have known very few women, "'and my life has been calm and unruffled in consequence. "'You had your books, Peter, and your horseshoes. "'My books and horseshoes, yes. "'And were content? "'Quite content. "'Until one day a woman came to you. "'Until one day I met a woman, and then... "'and then I asked her to marry me, Charmian.' "'Here there ensued a pause, "'during which Charmian began to pleat a fold in the tablecloth. "'That was rather unwise of you, wasn't it?' said she at last. "'How unwise? "'Because she might have taken you at your word, Peter. "'Do you mean that, that you won't, Charmian? "'Oh, dear, no. "'I have arrived at no decision yet. "'How could I? "'You must give me time to consider.' "'Here she paused in her pleading to regard it critically, "'with her head on one side. "'To be sure,' said she with a little nod, to be sure you need some one to look after you, that is very evident. Yes. To cook and wash for you? Yes. To mend your clothes for you? Yes. And you think me sufficiently competent? Oh, Charmian, I... Yes. Thank you, said she, very solemnly, and though her lashes had drooped, I felt the mockery of her eyes, wherefore I took a sudden great gulp of tea and came near choking, while Charmian began to pleat another fold in the tablecloth. And so Mr. Vibart would stoop to wed so humble a person as Charmian Brown. Mr. Vibart would, actually, marry a woman of whose past he knows nothing. Yes, said I. That again would be rather unwise, wouldn't it? Why? Considering Mr. Vibart's very lofty ideals in regard to women. What do you mean? Didn't you once say that your wife's name must be above suspicion, like Caesar's, or something of the kind? Did I? Yes, perhaps i did well well this woman this humble person has no name at all and no shred of reputation left her she has compromised herself beyond all redemption in the eyes of the world but then said i this world and i have always mutually despised each other she ran away this woman eloped with the most notorious the most accomplished rake in london well oh is that not enough enough for what charmian i saw her busy fingers falter and tremble but her voice was steady when she answered, enough to make any wise man think twice before asking this humble person to marry him. I might think twenty times, and it would be all one. You mean that if Charmian Brown will stoop to marry a village blacksmith, Peter Vibart will find happiness again, a happiness that is not of the sunshine, nor the wind in the trees. Lord, what a fool I was! Her fingers had stopped altogether now, but she neither spoke nor raised her head. Charmian, said I, leaning nearer across the table, speak. Oh, Peter, said she, with a sudden break in her voice, and stooped her head lower, yet in a little she looked up at me, and her eyes were very sweet and shining. Now as our glances met thus, up from throat to brow, there crept that hot slow wave of color, and in her face and in her eyes I seemed to read joy and fear and shame and radiant joy again. But now she bent her head once more, and strove to plead another fold, and could not. While I grew suddenly afraid of her, and of myself, and longed to hurl aside the table that divided us, and thrust my hands deep into my pockets, and finding there my tobacco pipe, brought it out, and fell to turning it aimlessly over and over. I would have spoken, only I knew that my voice would tremble. So I sat mum chance, staring at my pipe with unseeing eyes, and with my brain in a ferment, and presently came her voice, cool and sweet and sane. "'Your tobacco, Peter,' and she held the box toward me across the table. "'Ah, thank you,' said I, and began to fill my pipe, while she watched me, with her chin propped in her hands. "'Peter!' "'Yes, Charmian. I wonder why so grave a person as Mr. Peter Vibart should seek to marry so impossible a creature as the humble person.' "'I think,' I answered. "'I think if there is any special reason it is because of your mouth.' "'My mouth?' or your eyes, or the way you have with your lashes. Charmian laughed, and forthwith drooped them at me, and laughed again and shook her head. But surely, Peter, surely there are thousands, millions of women with mouths and eyes like the humble persons. It is possible, said I, but none who have the same way with their lashes. What do you mean? I can't tell. I don't know. Don't you, Peter? No, it is just a way. And so it is that you want to marry this very humble person? I think I have wanted to from the very first, but did not know it, being a blind fool. And did it need a night walk in a thunderstorm to teach you? 
No, that is, yes, perhaps it did. And are you quite, quite sure? Quite, quite sure, said I. And as I spoke, I laid my pipe upon the table and rose, and because my hands were trembling, I clenched my fists. But as I approached her, she started up and put out a hand to hold me off. And then I saw that her hands were trembling also. And standing thus, she spoke very softly. Peter. Yes, Charmian. Do you remember describing to me the perfect woman who should be your wife? Yes. How, that you must be able to respect her for her intellect? Yes. Honor her for her virtue? Yes, Charmian. And worship her for her spotless purity? I dreamed a paragon, perfect and impossible. I was a fool, said I. Impossible? Oh, Peter! W what do you mean? She was only an impalpable shade, quite impossible of realization, a bloodless thing, as you said and quite unnatural, a sickly figment of the imagination. I was a fool. And you are too wise now to expect such virtues in any woman? Yes, said I. N no. Oh, Charmian, I only know that you have taken this phantom's place, that you fill all my thoughts, sleeping and waking. No, no, she cried, and struggled in my arms so that I caught her hands, and held them close and kissed them many times. Oh, Charmian, Charmian, don't you know? Can't you see? It is you I want, you and only you forever. Whatever you were, whatever you are, I love you, love you and always must. Marry me, Charmian, marry me and you shall be dearer than my life, more to me than my soul. But as I spoke, her hands were snatched away, her eyes blazed into mine and her lips were all bitter scorn, and at the sight fear came upon me. Marry you, she panted. Marry you? No and no and no and so she stamped her foot and sobbed, and turning fled from me out of the cottage. And now to fear came wonder, and with wonder was despair. Truly was ever man so great a fool. End of In Which Charmian Answers My Question Section 36 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 30. Concerning the Fate of Black George. A broad white road, on either hand some half-dozen cottages, with roofs of thatch or red tile, backed by trees gnarled and ancient, among which rises the red conical roof of some Osthaus. Such, in a word, is Sissinghurst. Now upon the left-hand side of the way there stands a square, comfortable, whitewashed building, peaked of roof, bright as to windows, and with a mighty sign before the door, whereon you shall behold the picture of a bull, a bull rolling of eye, astonishingly curly of horn, and stiff as to tail, and with a prodigious girth of neck and shoulder. Such a snorting, fiery-eyed, curly-horned bull, as was never seen off an inn sign. It was at this bull that I was staring with much apparent interest, though indeed had that same curly-horned monstrosity been changed by some enchanter's wand into a green dragon, or a griffin, or swan with two necks, the chances are that I should have continued sublimely unconscious of the transformation. Yet how should honest Silas Hoskins, ostler, and general factotum of the Bull Inn be aware of this fact, who, being thus early at work, and seeing me lost in contemplation, paused to address me in all good faith. "'A fine bully be, eh, Peter? Look at them horns! And that dear tail! It's seldom as you sees horns or a tail like a them, eh?' "'Very seldom,' I answered, and sighed. "'And then is nose-holes, Peter. Just cast your eyes on them nose-holes, will ya? Why, dang me, I can't hear him a-snortin' when I looks at him. And you were all painted by a chap, a little old chap with grey whiskers no taller'n your elber, Peter. Think of that, a little chap no taller'n your elber. I seen him do, my own two eyes, a-sittin' on a box. Drored to bull wi' a bit of chalk first, then he outs wi' a couple of brushes. Dab he goes, and dab, dab again, and by goals, there was a pair of eyes a-rollin' themselves at me. Just a pair of eyes, Peter. Ah! He were a wonder, that little chap with grey whiskers, the way he went at that dear bull, a-dabbin' at him here, and a-dabbin' at him there, till he come to his tail. 
He done his tail last of all, Peter. Given a good tail, I says. Aye, that I will, says he, and a good stiff un, says I. Ye just keep your eye on it and watch, says he. Talk about tails, Peter. He put in that there tail so quick, nigh made me eyes water, and as for stiffness, well, look ye that. I'll tell ye that chap could paint a bull with his eyes shut, I had he could, and him such a very small man with grey whiskers. No, nope, you don't see many bulls like that in there, I'm thinking, Peter. They would be very hard to find, said I, and sighed again. Whereupon Silas sighed for company's sake, and nodding, went off about his many duties, whistling cheerily. So I presently turned about and crossed the road to the smithy, but upon the threshold I stopped all at once and drew softly back, for despite the early hour Prudence was there, upon her knees before the anvil, with George's great hand-hammer clasped to her bosom, sobbing over it, and while she sobbed she kissed its worn handle, and because such love was sacred and hallowed that dingy place, I took off my hat as I once more crossed the road. Seeing the bull was not yet astir, for the day was still young, as I say, I sat me down on the porch and sighed. And after I had sat there for some while, with my chin sunk upon my breast, plunged in bitter meditation, I became aware of the door opening, and the next moment a tremulous hand was upon my head, and looking round I beheld the ancient. Bless ye, Peter, bless ye, lad, and an old man's blessing be no light thing, specially such a old, old man as I be, and if it ain't as often as I feels in a blessing spirit, but, oh, Peter, twere me as found ye, weren't it? Why, to be sure it was, ancient, very nearly five months ago. And I be all us ready with some news for ye, bain't I? Yes, indeed. Well, I got more news for ye, Peter, girt news. And what is it this time? I be all us full up a news, bain't I? He repeated. Yes, ancient, said I, and sighed. And what is your news? Why, first of all, Peter, just reach me my snuff-box, will ye? Here it be, in my back hind pocket. Thank ye, thank ye. Hereupon he knocked upon the lid with a bony knuckle. Oh, I do be that full o' news this marnin' that my innards be all of a quake, Peter, all of a quake, he nodded, saying which he sat down close beside me. Peter. Yes, ancient. Some day when dear old staple be all rusted away, and these old bones are restin' in the churchyard over to Cranbrook, Peter, you'll think, sometimes, of the very old man as was always so full o' news, won't we, Peter? Surely, ancient, I shall never forget you, said I, and sighed. And now, Peter, said the old man, extracting a pinch of snuff, now for your news, about Black Jarge it be. What of him, Ancient? The old man shook his head. It took eight on em to do it, Peter, and all four on em's layin' in their beds, and four on em's oblin' on crutches, and all over a couple of rabbits, though dear be some fools who say it was partridges. Why, what do you mean? Why, you see, Peter, Black Jarge be such a girt strong man. I were much such another when I were young, like lion in his wrathy be, ah, a bull be ain't nothing to black jarge. And the keepers come and found him under a tree fast asleep, like David in the cave of Adullam, Peter, where a couple of rabbits he'd snared. And when they keepers tried to tack him, he rose up, he did, and throwed some on em this way and some on em that way, twere like Samson and the Philistines. If only he'd happened to find the jawbone of an ass lying handy, he'd a killed them all and got away, sure as sure. But it weren't to be, Peter. No, dead donkeys be scarce nowadays, and as for asses, jawbones, do you mean that George is taken prisoner? The ancient nodded and inhaled his pinch of snuff with much evident relish. It be girt news, bain't it, Peter? What have they done with him? Where is he, ancient? But before the old man could answer, Simon appeared. Oh, Peter, said he, shaking his head. The gaffer's been telling ye they've took charge for poaching, I suppose. Simon, cried the ancient, shut thy mouth, lad, hold thy gab, and give thy poor old feather a chance. I be telling him so fast as I can. As I was a-saying, Peter, like a furish lion were jarge with the keepers, ate on em, Peter, like dogs a-growling and growling and leaping and worrying all around him. Ah, like a lion he were! Waiting for a chance to use is right, do you see, Peter? added Simon. With his eyes a rolling and flaming, Peter, and his mane all bristling, cool as any cucumber, Peter, a roaring and lashing of his tail, and sparring for an opening, Peter, and when he sees one, down in his mouth every time, leaping in the air, rolling in the grass, with thy keepers clinging to him like leeches, ah, leeches! And every time they rush, 
but go his left, and bang, and go his right. And up he'd get like Samson again, Peter, and give himself a shake, bellering like a bull of Bashan. You see, they fought so close together that the keepers were afeard to use their guns. Guns? Who's a talking of guns? Simon, me boy, ye be all as a maggin and a maggin. Bridle thy tongue, lad. Bridle thy tongue afore it runs away wi ye. All right, Holden, fire away. But at this juncture, old Amos hove in view, followed by the apologetic Dutton with Job and sundry others on their way to work. And as they came, they talked together with much solemn wagging of heads. Having reached the door of the bull, they paused and greeted us, and I thought old Amos's habitual grin seemed a trifle more pronounced than usual. So poor George has been gone and done for himself at last, eh? Oh, my soul, think of that now, sighed old Amos. All as knowed he would, added Job. Many's the time I've said he would, and you know it, all on ya. It be the Barbadies or Australia, grinned Amos. Transportation it'll be. Oh, my soul, think of that now, and him a Sissonhurst man. And all along a couple of rabbits, said the ancient, emphasizing the last word with a loud rap on his snuff-box. Partridges, gaffer. They was partridges, returned old Amos. I always said as Black Jarge had come to a bad end, reiterated Job. And what's more, he aren't got nobody to blame but hisself. And all for a couple of rabbits, sighed the ancient, staring old Amos full in the eye. Patridges, gaffer, they was patridges. You, James Dutton, was they patridges or was they not? Speak up, James. Hereupon the man Dutton, all perspiring apology, as usual, shuffled forward and mopping his reeking brow, delivered himself in this wise. Which I must say, meanin' no offence to nobody, and if is so be apologizin', which I must say, me avin' seen em, they was, least a ways, he added as he met the ancient's piercing eye, least a ways they might have been, which, if they ain't, no matter. Having said which, he apologetically smeared his face all over with his shirt-sleeve and subsided again. He do wring my heart eye that it do, to think of poor Jarge a convict at Botany Bay, said old Amos, a workin and diggin and slavin with irons on his legs and arms, a jinglin and a janglin when he walks. "'Well, but it's justice, aren't it?' demanded Job. "'A poacher's a thief, and a thief's a convict, or should be.' "'I've heard,' said old Amos, shaking his head, "'I've heard as they ties their convicts to posts, "'and lashes and lashes them with the cat nine tails.' "'They generally most deserves it,' nodded Job. "'But tis hard to think of poor Jarge, "'tied up to one of them flogging posts with his back all raw and bleeding,' "'pursued old Amos.' Grow are to be, and him such a fine strapping young chap. He were always a sight too fond of pitchin into folk, George were, said Job. It'd be a mercy as my back weren't broke more'n once. Ah, nodded the ancient, you must be amazin strong in the back, Job. The way I've seen he come a rollin and a wallerin out of that dear Smithy's wonderful, wonderful. Lord Job, how you did roll. "'Well, he won't never do it no more,' said Job, glowering. "'Well, with poachin' his game and knockin' his keepers about, "'tarn't likely a squire Beverly'll let him off very easy.' "'Who?' said I, looking up and speaking for the first time. "'Squire Beverly'll burn em all.' "'Sir Peregrine Beverly?' "'Aye, for sure. And how far is it to Burnham Hall?' "'How fur?' repeated Job, staring. "'Why, it lays to other side of horse Monden. "'It'll be a matter of eight miles, Peter.' said the ancient. Nine, Peter, cried old Amos. Nine mile it be. Though I won't swear, Peter, continued the ancient, I won't swear as it aren't seven. Call it six and three quarters, said he, with his eagle eye on old Amos. Then I'd better start now, said I, and rose. Why, Peter, where you be going? To Burnham Hall, ancient. What? You? exclaimed Job. Do you think the squire'll see you? I'd think so, yes. Well, you won't. They'll never let the likes of you or me be on the gates. That remains to be seen, said I. So you am goin', are ya? I certainly am. All right, nodded Job. If they sets the dogs on you or chucks you into the road, don't go blamin' it on me, that's all. What, be really a goin', Peter? I really am, ancient. Then, by the Lord, I'll go wi ya. It's a long walk. Nay, Simon shall drive us in the cart. That I will, nodded the innkeeper. 
ay lad cried the ancient laying his hand upon my arm we'll up and see squire you and me shall us pierre there'll be some fuels said he looking round upon the staring company some fuels as talk of botany bay and irons and whipping posts all i say is let em peter let em you and me'll up and see squire peter shan't us black jarge aren't a convict yet let fuels say what they will we'll show em peter we'll show em so saying the old man led me into the kitchen of the bull while simon went to have the horses put to End of chapter 30 Concerning the Fate of Black George Section 37 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Book 2, Chapter 31 In Which the Ancient is Surprised a cheery place at all times is the kitchen of an english inn a comfortable place to eat in to talk in or to doze in a place with which your parlours and with the drawing-rooms your salons a la the three louis with their irritating rococo their gilt and satin and spindle-legged discomforts are not to my mind worthy to compare and what inn kitchen in all broad england was ever brighter neater and more comfortable than this kitchen of the bull where sweet Prue held supreme sway, with such grave dignity, and with her two white-capped maids to do her bidding and behests. Surely none. And surely in no inn, tavern, or hostelry soever, great or small, was there ever seen a daintier, prettier, sweeter hostess than this same Prue of ours. And her presence was reflected everywhere, and if ever the kitchen of an inn possessed a heart to lose then beyond all doubt this kitchen had lost its heart to prue long since even the battered cutlasses crossed upon the wall the ponderous jack above the hearth with its legend anno domini sixteen forty three took on a brighter sheen to greet her when she came and as for the pots and pans they fairly twinkled but to-day prue's eyes were red and her lips were all a-droop the which, though her smile was brave and ready, the ancient was quick to notice. "'Why, Prue, lass, you've been weeping. "'Yes, Granfer. "'Your pretty eyes be all swole, red they be. "'What's the trouble?' "'Oh, tis nothing, dear. "'Tis just a maid's foolishness. "'Never mind me, dear. "'Ah, but I love ye, Prue. "'Come, kiss me. "'There now, tell me all about it. "'All about it, Prue.' "'Oh, Granfer," said she, from the hollow of his shoulder, "'tis just Jarge. The old man grew very still. His mouth opened slowly and closed with a snap. "'Did he—did he say, Jarge, Prue? Is it breaking your art ye be for that dear poachin' black Jarge? To think as my Prue should come down to a poachin—' Prudence slipped from his encircling arm and stood up very straight and proud. There were tears thick upon her lashes, but she did not attempt to wipe them away. Granfer, she said very gently, "'You mustn't speak of Jarge to me like that. "'Ye mustn't. "'Ye mustn't, because I love him. "'And if he ever comes back, I'll marry him, "'if if he will only ax me. "'And if he never comes back, then I think I shall die.' The ancient took out his snuff-box, knocked it, opened it, glanced inside, and shut it up again. "'Did he tell me as you love Black Jarge, Prue?' "'Yes, Granfer, I always have, and always shall.' "'Loves Black Jarge,' he repeated. "'Allus has, allus will. Oh, Lord, what have I done?' Now, very slowly, a tear crept down his wrinkled cheek, at sight of which Prue gave a little cry and kneeling beside his chair took him in her arms oh my lass my little prue tis all my doin i thought oh prue twere me as parted you i thought the quivering voice broke off tis all right granfer never think of it see there i be smilin and she kissed him many times a danged fool i be said the old man shaking his head "'No, no, Granfer.' "'That's what I be, Prue, a danged fool. 
If I do go afore that dear old rusty staple, twill serve me right. A danged fool I be. Allus loved him, allus will, and wishful to wed with him. Why then, said the ancient, swallowing two or three times, so he shall, my sweet, so he shall, sure as sure. So come and kiss me, and forgive the old man as loves he so. What do we mean, Granfer? said Prue between two kisses. A fine strappin' chap be Jarge. After all, Peter, you been to patch on Jarge for looks, be you? No, indeed, ancient. Wishful to wed him she is, and so she shall. Lordy, Lord! Kiss me again, Prue, for I be goin' to see Squire. Ay, I be goin' to up and speak with Squire for Jarge, and Peter be comin' too. Oh, Mr. Peter, faltered Prudence, be this true? And in her eyes was the light of a sudden hope. Yes, I nodded. Do you think Squire'll see you, listen to you? she cried breathlessly. I think he will, Prudence, said I. God bless you, Mr. Peter, she murmured. God bless you. But now came the sound of wheels and the voice of Simon, calling. Wherefore I took my hat and followed the ancient to the door. But there Prudence stopped me. Last time you met with George, he tried to kill you. Oh, I know, and now you be going to— Nonsense, Prue, said I. But as I spoke, she stooped and would have kissed my hand, but I raised her and kissed her upon the cheek instead. For good luck, Prue, said I, and so turned and left her. In the porch sat Job, with old Amos and the rest, still in solemn conclave over pipes and ale, who watched with gloomy brows as I swung myself up beside the ancient in the cart. "'A fool's journey,' remarked old Amos sententiously with a wave of his pipe. "'A fool's journey!' The ancient cast an observing eye up at the cloudless sky, and also nodded solemnly. There be some fools in this world, Peter, as mixes up rabbits with partridges, and honest men, like Jarge, with thieves, and lazy wagabones, like Job. But we'll show em, Peter, we'll show em, dang em. Drive on, Simon, my boy. So with this Parthian shot, feathered with the one strong word the ancient kept for such occasions, we drove away from the silenced group, who stared mutely after us until we were lost to view. But the last thing I saw was the light in Prue's sweet eyes as she watched us from the open lattice. CHAPTER Thirty Two: HOW WE SET OUT FOR BURNHAM HALL Peter, said the ancient, after we had gone a little way, Peter, I do opes as you aren't been and gone and rose my Prue's opes only to dash em down again. I can but do my best, ancient. Olden, said Simon, "'Twer't Peter as rose her hopes. "'Twer you. "'Peter never said naught about bringing Jarge home. "'Simon,' commanded the ancient, "'hold thy tongue, lad. "'I says again, if Peter's been and rose Prue's opes only to dash em, "'twill be a bad day for Prue. "'You mark my words. "'Prue's a lass as don't love easy, and don't forget easy.' "'Why, true, gaffer, true, God bless her.' She'd be one as a'd pine, slow and quiet, like a flower in the woods or a leaf in autumn. Ah, fade she would, fade and fade. Well, she bain't a goin' to do no fadin, please the Lord. Not if me and Peter and you can help it, Simon, my boy. But we'm but poor worms after all, as the Bible says. And if Peter has been in roser hopes of freein' Jarge, and don't free Jarge, if Jarge should have to go a convict to Australia, or to the other place, why then she'll fade, fade as ever was, and be laid in the churchyard afore her poor old grandfather. "'Lord, Olden!' exclaimed Simon. "'Who's a-talkin' of fadins in churchyards? I don't like it. Let's talk of summit else.' "'Simon,' said the ancient, shaking his head reprovingly, "'ye be a good boy.' Ah, a steady, dutiful lad ye be, I don't deny it. But the Lord aren't give you no imagination, which, after all, you should be main thankful for. An imagination's a troublesome thing, aren't it, Peter? It is, said I, a damnable thing. Ay, many's the man as have been ruinated by his imagination. There was one, Nicodemus Blight were his name. 
"'And a very miserable covey sound, too,' added Simon. "'But a very decent, civil-spoke, quiet young chap he were,' continued the ancient. "'Only for his imagination, Lord. "'He were that full of imagination he couldn't drink his ale like an ordinary chap. "'Sip, he'd go, and sip, sip, till twere all gone. "'And then he'd forget as ever he'd add any, and go away without paying for it, "'if someone didn't remind him. "'He were no fool, olden.' nodded Simon. "'And that weren't all, neither, not by no manner of means,' the ancient continued. "'I've knowed that there chap sit and listen to a pretty lass by the hour together, and never say a word, not one.' "'Didn't get a chance to, perhaps?' said Simon. "'It weren't that. No, it were just his imagination a-workin' and workin' inside of him and fillin' him up. How's ever, at last, one day, he up and axed her to marry him, and she, being all took by surprise, said yes, and went and married someone else. "'Lord,' said Simon, "'what did she go and marry another chap for?' "'Simon,' returned the ancient, "'don't go asking foolish questions. How's ever, she did, and poor Nicodemus growed more imaginative than ever. After that he took to turnips.' "'Turnips!' exclaimed Simon, staring. "'Turnips, as ever was.' nodded the ancient, used to stand for hours at a time a-looking at his turnips and shaking his head over em. "'But what for? A man must be a danged fool to go shaking of his head over a lot of turnips.' "'Well, I don't know,' rejoined the ancient. "'His turnips was very good uns as a rule, and fetched top prices in the markets.' At this juncture there appeared a man in a cart ahead of us, who flourished his whip and roared a greeting a coarse-visaged, loud-voiced fellow, whose beefy face was adorned with a pair of enormous fiery whiskers that seemed forever striving to hide his ears, which last, being very large and red, stood boldly out at right angles to his head, refusing to be thus ambushed and scorning all concealment. "'What, be that the olden? Be you alive and kicking yet?' "'Aye, God be thanked, John!' "'And what be all this I ear about that dear black jarge? "'He never were much good. "'But what be all this?' "'Lies, mostly, you may take your oath,' nodded the ancient. "'But he've been took for poaching, ah, and locked up at the all. "'And we'm going to fetch him. "'We be going to see Squire.' "'What? You, olden? "'You see Squire? "'Ah, ha! "'Ah, me, and Peter.' "'And Simon here. Why not?' "'You see his worship, Sir Peregrine, Beverly, Baronet, and Justice of the Peace? "'You? He cod, that's a good un. Danged if it ain't. "'And what might you be wishful to do when you see him? Which you won't? "'Fetch back George, of course. "'Olden, you must be crazed in your head, and after George killing four keepers, "'Sir Peregrine's own keepers, too, shooting em stone dead, and three more a-dying.' "'John,' said the ancient, shaking his head, "'that's the worst of being cursed with ears like yourn.' "'My ears is all right,' returned John, frowning. "'Oh, ah,' chuckled the old man. "'Your ears is all right, John. "'Prize ears, you might call em. "'I never seed a pair better growed. "'Never, no.' "'A bit large they may be,' growled John, "'giving a furtive pull to the nearest ambush. "'But—' "'Large as ever was, John,' nodded the ancient. "'Uncommon large. "'And consequent, they catches a lot too much. "'I've kept my eye on them ears of yourn for thirty years and more, John. "'If so be as they grows any bigger, "'you'll be earing things afore they're spoke, and—' "'John gave a fierce tug to the ambush, muttered an oath, "'and lashing up his horse, disappeared down the road in a cloud of dust.' "'Twere nigh on four year ago since Black Jarge thrashed John, weren't it, Simon?' "'Ah,' nodded Simon. "'John were in the ring then, Peter, and a pretty tough chap he were, too, "'though a bit too fond of swingin' with his right to please me. "'He were very sweet on Prue then, weren't he, Simon?' "'Ah,' nodded Simon again. "'He were always hangin' around the bull, till I warned him off.' "'And he laughed at he, Simon.' "'Ah, he did that, and I were going to have a go at him myself, "'and the chances are he'd have beat me, "'seeing I hadn't been inside of a ring for ten year when—' 
"'Up comes Jarge,' chuckled the ancient. "'What's all this?' say Jarge. "'I be going to teach John here to keep away from my prue,' says Simon. "'No, no,' says Jarge. "'John's young, and you beat the man you was ten years ago. "'Let me,' says Jarge. "'You,' says John, "'you get back to your bellers. "'You be pretty big, but I've beat the heads off better men nor you.' "'Why, then, have a try at mine,' says Jarge. "'And with the word, bang, comes John's fist again his jaw, "'and they was at it. "'Oh, Peter, that were a fight. "'I seed a few in my time, but nothing like that air. And when were all over, added Simon, Jarge went back to his ammer and bellers, and we picked John up, and I drove him home in this ere very cart, and nobody's cared to stand up to Jarge since. You have both seen Black George fight, then? I inquired. Many's the time, Peter. And have you ever seen him knock down? No, returned the ancient, shaking his head. I've seen him all blood from head to foot and once a girt big sailor-man knocked him sideways, after which Jarge got up furious-like and put him to sleep. No, Peter, added Simon. I don't think as there be a man in all England as could knock Black Jarge off his pins in a fair stand-up fight. Hm, said I. You see, he be that ard, Peter, nodded the ancient. Why, look, he cried, looky there. Now, looking where he pointed, I saw a man dart across the road some distance away. He was hidden almost immediately, for there were many trees thereabouts, but there was no mistaking that length of limb and breadth of shoulder. "'Twere Black Jarge's self!' exclaimed Simon, whipping up his horses. But when we reached the place, George was gone, and though we called and sought for some time, we saw him no more. So in a while we turned and jogged back toward Sissinghurst. "'What be you a-shaking your head over, Olden?' inquired Simon, after we had ridden some distance. "'I were wondering what that old fool Amos'll say when we drive back without Jarge.' Being come to the parting of the ways, I descended from the cart, for my head was strangely heavy, and I felt much out of sorts. And though the day was still young, I had no mind for work. Therefore I bade adieu to Simon and the Ancient, and turned aside towards the hollow, leaving them staring after me in wonderment. End of Book 2, Chapter 32 Read by Laurie Ann Walden Section 38 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Ellen Preckle The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall Chapter 33. In which I fall from folly into madness. It was with some little trepidation that I descended into the hollow and walked along beside the brook, for soon I should meet Charmian, and the memory of our parting, and the thought of this meeting, had been in my mind all day long. She would not be expecting me yet, for I was much before my usual time, wherefore I walked on slowly beside the brook, deliberating on what I should say to her, until I came to that large stone where I had sat dreaming the night when she had stood in the moonlight, and first bidden me in to supper. And now, sinking upon this stone, I set my elbows upon my knees and my chin in my hands, and fixing my eyes upon the ever-moving waters of the brook, fell into a profound meditation. From this I was suddenly aroused by the clink of iron and the snort of a horse. Wondering, I lifted my eyes, but the bushes were very dense and I could see nothing. But in a little, borne upon the gentle wind, came the sound of a voice, low and soft and very sweet, whose rich tones there was no mistaking, followed almost immediately by another, deeper, gruffer, the voice of a man. With a bound I was upon my feet, and had somehow crossed the brook, but even so I was too late. There was the crack of a whip, followed by the muffled thud of a horse's hoofs, which died quickly away and was lost in the stir of leaves. I ground my teeth and cursed that fate which seemed determined that I should not meet this man face to face, this man whose back I had seen but once, a broad-shouldered back clad in a blue coat. I stood where I was, dumb and rigid, staring straight before me, and once again a tremor passed over me that came and went, growing stronger and stronger, and once again in my head was the thud, thud, thud of the hammer. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwellin'. 
made every youth cry well away her name was barbara allen she was approaching by that leafy path that wound its way along beside the brook and there came upon me a physical nausea and ever the thud of the hammer grew more maddening all in the merry month of may when green buds they were swellin young jemmy grove on his deathbed lay for love of barbara allen now as she ended the verse she came out into the open and saw me and seeing me looked deliberately over my head and went on singing while i stood shivering so slowly slowly raised she up and slowly she came nigh him and when she drew the curtain by young man i think you're dying and suddenly the trees and bushes swung giddily round the grass swayed beneath my feet and charmian was beside me with her arm about my shoulders but i pushed her from me and leaned against a tree near by and hearkened to the hammer in my brain why peter said she oh peter please charmian said i speaking between the hammer strokes do not touch me again it is too soon after what do you mean peter what do you mean he has been with you again what do you mean she cried i know of his visits if he was the same as last time in a blue coat no don't don't touch me but she had sprung upon me and caught me by the arms and shook me in a grip so strong that giddy as i was i reeled and staggered like a drunken man and still her voice hissed what do you mean and her voice and hands and eyes were strangely compelling i mean i answered in a low even voice like one in a trance that you are a messalina a julia a joan of naples beautiful as they and as wanton now at the word she cried out and struck me twice across the face blows that burnt and stung beast she cried liar oh that i had the strength to grind you into the earth beneath my foot oh you poor blind self-deluding fool and she laughed and her laughter stung me most of all as i look at you she went on the laugh still curling her lip you stand there what you are a beaten hound this is my last look and i shall always remember you as i see you now scarlet-cheeked shame-faced a beaten hound and speaking she shook her hand at me and turned upon her heel but with that word and in that instant the old old demon leapt up within me and as he leapt i clasped my arms about her and caught her up and crushed her close and high against my breast go said i go no no not yet and now as her eyes met mine i felt her tremble yet she strove to hide her fear and heaped me with bitter scorn but i only shook my head and smiled and now she struggled to break my clasp fiercely desperately her long hair burst its fastenings and enveloped us both in its rippling splendor she beat my face she wound her fingers in my hair but my lips smiled on for the hammer in my brain had deadened all else and presently she lay still. I felt her body relax and grow suddenly pliable and soft. Her head fell back across my arm, and as she lay, I saw the tears of her helplessness ooze out beneath her drooping lashes. But still I smiled. So, with her long hair trailing over me, I bore her to the cottage. Closing the door behind me with my foot, I crossed to the room and set her down upon the bed. She lay very still, but her bosom heaved tumultuously, and the tears still crept from beneath her lashes but in a while she opened her eyes and looked at me, and shivered and crouched farther from me among the pillows. Why did you lie to me, Charmian? Why did you lie to me? She did not answer, only she watched me as one might watch some relentless oncoming peril. I asked you once if you ever saw men hereabouts, when I was away, do you remember? You told me no, and while you spoke I knew you lied, for I had seen him standing among the leaves, waiting and watching for you. I once asked you if you were ever lonely when I was away, and you answered no. You were too busy, seldom went beyond the hollow, do you remember? And yet you had brought him here, here into the cottage. He had looked at my Virgil over your shoulder, do you remember? You played the spy, she whispered with trembling lips, yet with eyes still fierce and scornful. You know I did not. Had I seen him, I should have killed him, because I loved you. I had set up an altar to you in my heart where my soul might worship. Poor fool that I was! I loved you with every breath I drew. I think I must have shown you something of this from time to time, for you are very clever, and you may have laughed over it together, you and he. And lately I have seen my altar foully desecrated, shattered, and utterly destroyed, and with it your sweet womanhood dragged in the mire, and yet I loved you still. 
Can you imagine, I wonder, the agony of it, the haunting horrors of imagination, the bitter days, the sleepless nights? To see you so beautiful, so glorious, and know you so base. Indeed, I think it came near driving me mad. It has sent me out into the night. I have held out my arms for the lightning to blast me. I have wished myself a thousand deaths. If Black George had but struck a little harder, or a little lighter, I am not the man I was before he thrashed me. My head grows confused and clouded at times. Would to God I were dead! But now you would go? Having killed my heart, broken my life, driven away all peace of mind, you would leave me. No, Charmian, I swear by God you shall not go yet a while. I have bought you very dear, bought you with my bitter agony, and by all the blasting torments I have suffered. Now as I ended she sprang from the bed and faced me, but meeting my look she shrank a little and drew her long hair about her like a mantle, then sought with trembling hands to hold me off. Peter, be sane! Oh, Peter, be merciful and let me go! Give me time, let me explain! My books, said I, have taught me that the more beautiful a woman's face the more guileful is her heart, and your face is wonderfully beautiful, and as for your heart, you lied to me before. I... Oh, Peter, I am not the poor creature you think me. Were you the proudest lady in the land, you have deceived me and mocked me and lied to me. So saying, I reached out and seized her by each rounded arm, and slowly drew her closer. And now she strove no more against me. Only in her face was bitter scorn and an anger that cast out fear. I hate you, despise you, she whispered. I hate you more than any man was ever hated. Inch by inch I drew her to me, until she stood close within the circle of my arms. And I think I love you more than any woman was ever loved, said I. For the glorious beauty of your strong, sweet body, for the temptation of your eyes, for the red lure of your lips. And so I stooped and kissed her full on the mouth. She lay soft and warm in my embrace, all unresisting, only she shivered beneath my kiss, and a great sob rent her bosom. And I also think, said I, that because of the perfidy of your heart I hate you as much as you do me, as much as ever woman, dead or living, was hated by man, and shall, forever. And while I spoke I loosed her and turned, and strode swiftly out and away from the cottage. CHAPTER Thirty Four, IN WHICH I FIND PEACE AND JOY AND AN ABIDING SORROW I hurried on, looking neither to right nor left, seeing only the face of Charmian, now fearful and appealing, now blazing with scorn, and coming to the brook I sat down, and thought upon her marvellous beauty, of the firm roundness of the arms that my fingers had so lately pressed. Anon I started up again, and plunged knee-deep through the brook, and strode on and on, bursting my way through bramble and briar, heedless of their petty stings, till at last I was clear of them, being now among trees. And here, where the shadow was deepest, I came upon a lurking figure, a figure I recognized, a figure there was no mistaking in which I should have known in a thousand. A shortish, broad-shouldered man, clad in a blue coat, who stood with his back towards me, looking down into the hollow, in the attitude of one who waits. For what? For whom? He was cut off from me by a solitary bush, a bramble that seemed to have strayed from its kind and lost itself, and running upon my toes I cleared this bush at a bound, and before the fellow had realized my presence I had pinned him by the collar. "'Damn you! Show your face!' I cried, and swung him round so fiercely that he staggered and his hat fell off. Then, as I saw, I clasped my head between my hands and fell back, staring. A grizzled man with an honest open face, a middle-aged man whose homely features were lighted by a pair of kindly blue eyes, just now round with astonishment. "'Lord! Mr. Peter!' he exclaimed. "'Adam!' I groaned. "'Oh, God forgive me, it's Adam!' "'Lord, Mr. Peter!' said he again. "'You sure give me a turn. "'What's the matter with you, sir? "'Come, Mr. Peter, never stare so wild-like. "'Come, sir, what is it?' "'Tell me quick,' said I, catching his hand in mine. "'You have been here many times before of late?' "'Why, yes, Mr. Peter, but quick,' said I. "'On one occasion she took you into the cottage yonder "'and showed you a book. "'You looked at it over her shoulder?' "'Yes, sir, but what sort of book was it?' "'An old book, sir, with the cover broken, "'with your name writ down inside of it. "'Twas that way she found out who you was. "'Oh, Adam!' I cried. "'Oh, Adam, now may God help me!' "'And dropping his hand I turned and ran until I reached the cottage. But it was empty. Charmian was gone. In a fever of haste I sought her along the brook, among the bushes and trees, even along the road. And as I sought, night fell, 
and in the shadows was black despair. I searched the hollow from end to end, calling upon her name, but no sound reached me save the hoot of an owl and the far-off dismal cry of a corncrake. With some faint hope that she might have returned to the cottage, I hastened thither, but finding it dark and desolate, I gave way to my despair. Oh, blind, self-deceiving fool! She had said that, and she was right, as usual. She had called me an egoist. I was an egoist, a pedant, a blind, self-deceiving fool, who had willfully destroyed all hopes of a happiness, the very thought of which had so often set me trembling. And now she had left me, was gone. The world, my world, was a void. Its emptiness terrified me. How could I live without Charmian, the woman whose image was ever before my eyes, whose soft low voice was ever in my ears? And I had thought so much to please her. I, who had set my thoughts to guard my tongue, lest by word or look I might offend her. And this was the end of it. Sitting down at the table I leaned my head there, pressing my forehead against the hard wood, and remained thus a great while. At last, because it was very dark, I found and lighted a candle, and came and stood beside her bed. Very white and trim it looked, yet I was glad to see its smoothness rumpled where I had laid her down, and to see the depression in the pillow that her head had made. And while I stood there, up to me stole a perfume very faint, like the breath of violets in a wood at evening time, wherefore I sank down upon my knees beside the bed. And now the full knowledge of my madness rushed upon me in an overwhelming flood, but with misery was a great and mighty joy, for now I knew her worthy of all respect and honor and worship, for her intellect, for her proud virtue, for her spotless purity. And thus with joy came remorse, and with remorse an abiding sorrow. And gradually my arms crept about the pillow where her head had so often rested, wherefore I kissed it, and laid my head upon it, and sighed, and so fell into a troubled sleep. End of In Which I Find Peace and joy, and an abiding sorrow. Section 39 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 35. How Black George Found Prudence in the Dawn. The chill of dawn was in the air when I awoke, and it was some few moments before, with a rush, I remembered why I was kneeling there beside Charmian's bed. Shivering, I rose and walked up and down to reduce the stiffness in my limbs. The fire was out, and I had no mind to light it, for I was in no mood to break my fast, though the necessary things stood ready as her orderly hands had set them, and the plates and cups and saucers twinkled at me from the little cupboard I had made to hold them, a cupboard whose construction she had overlooked with a critical eye and I must needs remember how she had insisted on being permitted to drive in three nails with her own hand. I could put my finger on those very nails, how she had tapped at those nails for fear of missing them, how beautiful she had looked in her coarse apron with her sleeves rolled up over her round white arms, how womanly and sweet, yet I had dared to think, had dared to call her a Messalina. Oh, that my tongue had withered, or ever I had coupled one so pure and noble with a creature so base and common. So thinking, I sighed and went out into the dawn. As I closed the door behind me, its hollow slam struck me sharply, and I called to mind how she had called it a bad and ill-fitting door. And indeed, so it was. With dejected step and hanging head, I made my way toward Sissinghurst, for since I was up, I might as well work, and there was much to be done. And as I went, I heard a distant clock chime four. Now when I reached the village, the sun was beginning to rise, and thus lifting up my eyes, I beheld one standing before the bull, a very tall man, much bigger and greater than most, a wild figure in the dawn, with matted hair and beard, clad in tattered clothes. Yet hair and beard gleamed a red gold where the light touched them, and there was but one man I knew so tall and so mighty as this. Wherefore I hurried toward him all unnoticed, for his eyes were raised to a certain latticed casement of the inn. And being come up, I reached out and touched this man upon the arm. "'George,' said I, and held out my hand. He turned swiftly, but seeing me, started back a pace, staring. "'George,' said I again, "'oh, George!' But George only backed still further, passing his hand once or twice across his eyes. "'Peter,' said he at last, speaking hardly above a whisper, "'but you am dead, Peter, dead. I killed thee. "'No,' I answered, "'you didn't kill me. George, indeed, I wish you had. You came pretty near it. 
but you didn't quite manage it. And, George, I'm very desolate. Won't you shake hands with a desolate man? If you can, believing that I have always been your friend, and a true and loyal one, then give me your hand. If not, if you think me still the despicable traitor you once did, then let us go into the field yonder, and if you can manage to knock me on the head for good and all this time, why, so much the better. Come, what do you say? Without a word, Black George turned and led the way to a narrow lane a little distance beyond the bull, and from the lane into a meadow. Being come thither, I took off my coat and neckerchief, but this time I cast no look upon the world about me, and though indeed it was fair enough. But Black George stood half turned from me, with his fists clenched and his broad shoulders heaving oddly. Peter! said he, in his slow, heavy way. Never clench your fist to me. I don't, I can't abide it. But, oh, man, Peter, how may I clasp hands with a chap as I've tried to kill? I can't do it, Peter. But don't, don't clench your fists again me no more. I were jealous of you from the first, you see. You beat me at thammer throwing, and she took your part again me, and, and then you be so taken in your ways, and I be so big and clumsy so very slow and heavy. There beat no chance betwixt us for a maid like Prue. She always was different from the likes of me, and any lass with half an eye could see you as be a, a gentleman. Ah, and a good un, and so, Peter, and so. I be going away, a soldier, perhaps. I shan't love the dear lass quite so much after her a bit, perhaps. It won't be so sharp-like, arter a bit. But what's to be is to be. I've learned wisdom, and you and she was made for each other, and meant for each other from the first. So don't go to clench your fist again me no more, Peter. Never again, George, said I. Unless, he continued, as though struck by a bright idea, unless you are minded to have a whack at me. If so be, why, take it, Peter, and welcome. You see, I tried so hard to kill he, so cruel hard, Peter, and I thought I had. I thought twere for that as they took me. And so I broke my way out of the lock-up, and come to say good-bye to Prue's winder, and then I were going back to give myself up and let em hang me if they wanted to. Were you, George? Yes. Here George turned to look at me, and looking, drooped his eyes, and fumbled with his hands, while up under his tanned skin there crept a painful burning crimson. Peter, said he, yes, George, I got summit more to tell thee, summit as I never meant to tell a soul, when you was down, lying at my feet. Yes, George, I... I kicked ee once. Did you, George? I, I were mad, mad with rage and bloodlust. Oh, man, Peter, I kicked ee. Veer, said he, straightening his shoulders, leastwise I can look ee in the eye. Now that be off my mind. And now, if so be you am wishful to tack your whack at me, let it be a good un, Peter. No, I shall never raise my hand to you again, George. Tis likely you be thinking me a poor sort of man, arter what what I just told ye. A coward? I think you're more of a man than ever, said I. Why, then, Peter, if you do that, here's my hand, if you'll take it, I bid you good-bye. I'll take your hand, and gladly, George, but not to wish you good-bye. It shall be rather to bid you welcome home again. No, he cried, no, I couldn't. I couldn't abide to see you and Prue married, Peter. No, I couldn't abide it. And you never will, George. Prue loves a stronger, a better man than I, and she has wept over him, George, and prayed over him, such tears and prayers as surely might win the blackest soul to heaven, and has said that she would marry that man. Ah, even if he came back with fetter marks upon him, even then she would marry him if he would only ask her. Oh, Peter, cried George, seizing my shoulders in a mighty grip, and looking into my eyes with tears in his own. Oh, man, Peter! You has knocked me down, and as I love for it, be this true. It is God's truth, said I, and look, there's a sign to prove I'm no liar. Look! And I pointed toward the bull. George turned, and I felt his fingers tighten suddenly, for there, in the open doorway of the inn, with the early glory of the morning all about her, stood Prue. As we watched, she began to cross the road toward the smithy, with laggard step and drooping head. Do you know where she's going, George? I can tell you. She's going to your smithy to pray for you. Do you hear? To pray for you. Come, and I seized his arm. No, Peter, no, I durst not I couldn't. But he suffered me to lead him forward nevertheless. Once he stopped and glanced round, but the village was asleep about us, so we presently came to the open door of the forge. 
and behold, Prue was kneeling before the anvil, with her face hidden in her arms and her slender body swaying slightly, but all at once, as if she felt him near her, she raised her head and saw him, and sprang to her feet with a glad cry, and as she stood George went to her and knelt at her feet, and raising the hem of her gown stooped and kissed it. "'Oh, my sweet maid,' said he, "'oh, my sweet Prue, I bain't worthy, I bain't,' but she caught the great shaggy head to her bosom and stifled it there. And in her face was a radiance, a happiness beyond words, and the man's strong arms clung close about her. So I turned and left them in paradise together. Chapter 36 Which Sympathizes with a Brass Jack, a Brace of Cutlasses, and Diverse Pots and Pans I found the ancient sunning himself in the porch before the inn as he waited for his breakfast. Peter, says he, I be turble cold sometimes. It comes a creepin' on me all at once, even if I'd be sittin' before a roarin' fire or a baskin' in this good warm sun. A cold as reaches down to me poor old art. Grave chills, I calls him, Peter. Ah, grave chills. Catches me by the art they do. You see, I be that old, Peter, that old and wore out. But you're a wonderful man for your age, said I, clasping the shriveled hand in mine, and very lusty and strong. So strong as a bull I be, Peter, he nodded readily, but then even a bull gets old and wore out, and these grave chills catches me oftener and oftener. Tis like as if the angel of death reached out and touched me, just touched me with his finger soft-like, as much to say, Here be a poor old wore-out creeter, as I shall be wantin' soon. Well, I be ready. Tis only the young or the fool who fears to die. Three score years and ten, says the Bible, and I be years and years older than that. Oh, I shan't be afeard to answer when I'm called, Peter. Here I be, Lord, I'll say, here I be, thy poor old servant. But, oh, Peter, if I could be sure that dear roll rusty staple be and took first, why, then I'd go joyful, joyful. But, why, there be that old fool Amos. Lord, what a daughter an old fool he be, and there be Job and Dutton. They be coming to plague me, Peter, I can feel it in me bones. Just reach me my snuff-box out of my iron pocket and you shall see me smite they Amalekites ip and thigh. Gaffer, began old Amos, saluting with his usual grin as he came up, we be wishful to wax ye a question. We be wishful to know where be Black Jarge, which you haven't gone to fetch him, and bring him home again, them was you words. Ah, nodded Job, them was your very words. Bring him home again, says you. But you didn't bring him home, continued old Amos, leastwise not in the cart with you, Dutton here. James Dutton, see you come driving home. But he didn't see no jarge along with you. No, not so much as you could shake a stick at, you might say. Speak up, James Dutton, that you was a-leanin' over your front gate as Gaffer came drivin' home, wasn't you? And you see Gaffer plain as plain, didn't you? Which me wish no offence, and no one objectin' I did, began the apology, perspiring profusely as usual. But I takes the liberty to say as it were a spade and not a gate, leastways. But you didn't see no sign of jarge, did you? demanded old Amos, as you might say, neither I'd nor heir of him. Speak up, James Dutton. Which, since you axes me, I make so bold as to answer, and very glad, I'm sure, no, though as to I'd or heir, I aren't wishing to swear to, me not being near enough, which could only be expected, and very much obliged, I'm sure. You see, Gaffer, pursued Amos, if you didn't bring Jarge back with you, which you said you would, the question we axes is, where be Jarge? Ah! Where? nodded Job gloomily. Here the ancient was evidently at a loss, to cover which he took a vast pinch of snuff. I'll be we know as he bean't pining away in a dungeon cell, irons on his legs, strapped in a straight jacket, and old Amos stopped, open mouthed and staring, for out from the gloom of the smithy issued Black Jarge himself, with Prue upon his arm. The ancient stared also, but dissembling his vast surprise, he dealt the lid of his snuff box two loud triumphant knocks. Peter, said he, rising stiffly, Peter, lad, I were beginning to think as Jarge were never coming in to breakfast at all. I've waited and waited till I be so ravenous as a lion and tiger. But here he be at last, Peter, here he be. So let's go in and eat some it. Saying which, he turned his back upon his discomfited tormentors, and led me into the kitchen of the inn. And there were the white-capped maids, setting forth such a breakfast as only such a kitchen could produce. And presently there was Prue herself, with George hanging back, something shamefaced, till the ancient had hobbled forward to give him welcome. And there was honest Simon, all wonderment and hearty greeting. And last, but by no means least, there were the battered cutlasses, the brass jack, and the glittering pots and pans, 
glittering and gleaming and twinkling a greeting likewise, and with all their might. Ah! but they little guessed why Prue's eyes were so shy and sweet, or why the colour came and went in her pretty cheeks. Little they guessed why this gold-haired giant trod so lightly, and held his tall head so very high. Little they dreamed of the situation as yet. Had they done so, surely they must, one and all, have fallen upon that curly golden head, and buried it beneath their gleaming, glittering, twinkling jealousy. And what a meal was that! With those deft, white-capped maids to wait upon our wants, and with prudence hovering here and there to see that all were duly served, and refusing to sit down until George's great arm, a very gentle arm for one so strong and big, drew her down beside him. Guess truly what a meal that was, and how the ancient chuckled and dug me with one bony elbow, and George with the other, and chuckled again till he choked and choked, till he gasped and gasped, till he had us all on our feet, and then demanded indignantly why we couldn't let him enjoy himself in peace. And now, when the meal was nearly over, he suddenly took it into his head that Prue didn't love George as she should, and as he deserved to be, and nothing would content him but that she must kiss him then and there, and not on the forehead, mind, nor on the cheek, but on the place as God made for it, the mouth, my lass. And now, who so shy and blushing as Prue, and who so nervous for her sake as Black George, very evidently clasping her hand under the table, and bidding her never mind, as he was content and never to put herself out over such as him. Whereupon Mistress Prue must needs turn, and taking his head between her hands, kissed him, not once, or twice, but three times, and upon, the place God made for it, the mouth. O oh, gleaming cutlasses, O oh, great brass jack and glittering pots and pans, can ye any longer gleam and glitter and twinkle in doubt? Alas, I trow not. Therefore it is only natural and to be expected that beneath your outward polish lurk black and bitter feelings against this curly-headed giant, and a bloodthirsty desire for vengeance. If so, then one and all of you have, at least, the good feeling not to show it, a behavior worthy of gentlemen. What do I say? Of gentlemen? Fie! Rather let it be said, of pots and pans. End of Which Sympathizes with a Brass Jack, a Brace of Cutlasses, and Divers Pots and Pans. Section 40 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckel. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 37. The Preacher. It is a wise, and to some extent a true saying, that hard work is an antidote to sorrow, a panacea for all trouble. But when the labor is over and done, when the tools are set by, and the weary worker goes forth into the quiet evening, how then? For we cannot always work, and sooner or later comes the still hour when memory rushes in upon us again, and sorrow and remorse sit dark and gloomy on either hand. A week dragged by, a season of alternate hope and black despair, a restless fever of nights and days, for with each dawn came hope that lived a while beside me, only to fly away with the sun and leave me to despair. I hungered for the sound of Charmian's voice, for the quick light fall of her foot, for the least touch of her hand. I became more and more possessed of a morbid fancy that she might be existing near by, could I but find her, that she had passed along the road only a little while before me, or at this very moment might be approaching, might be within sight, were I but quick enough. Often at such times I would fling down my hammer or tongs, to George's surprise, and hurry to the door, stare up and down the road, or pause in my hammer strokes, fiercely bidding George to do the same, fancying I heard her voice calling to me from a distance. And George would watch me with a troubled brow, but with rare delicacy, said no word. Indeed, the thought of Charmian was with me everywhere. The ringing hammers mocked me with her praises, the bellows sang of her beauty, the trees whispered Charmian, Charmian, and Charmian was in the very air. But when I had reluctantly bidden George good night and set out along the lanes full of the fragrant dusk of evening, when, reaching the hollow, I followed that leafy path beside the brook which she and I had so often trodden together, when I sat in my gloomy disordered cottage with the deep silence unbroken save for the plaintive murmur of the brook, then indeed my loneliness was well nigh more than I could bear. There were dark hours when the cottage rang with strange sounds, when I would lie face down upon the floor, clutching my throbbing temples between my palms, fearful of myself and dreading the oncoming horror of madness. 
It was at this time, too, that I began to be haunted by the thing above the door, the rusty staple upon which a man had choked out his wretched life sixty and six years ago. A wanderer, a lonely man, perhaps acquainted with misery or haunted by remorse, one who had suffered much and long, even as I, but who had eventually escaped it all, even as I might do. Thus I would sit, chin in hand, staring up at this staple until the light failed, and sometimes in the dead of night I would steal softly there to touch it with my finger. Looking back on all this, it seems that I came very near to losing my reason, for I had then by no means recovered from Black George's fist, and indeed even now I am at times not wholly free from its effect. My sleep, too, was often broken and troubled with wild dreams, so that bed became a place of horror, and, rising, I would sit before the empty hearth, a candle guttering at my elbow, and think of Charmian, until I would fancy I heard the rustle of her garments behind me, and start up, trembling and breathless. At such times the tap of a blown leaf against the lattice would fill me with a fever of hope and expectation. Often and often her soft laugh stole to me in the gurgle of the brook, and she would call to me in the deep night silences, in a voice very sweet and faint and far away. Then I would plunge out into the dark and lift my hands to the stars that winked upon my agony and journey on through a desolate world to return with the dawn, weary and despondent. It was after one of these wild night expeditions that I sat beneath a tree watching the sunrise, and yet I think I must have dozed, for I was startled by a voice close above me, and glancing up I recognized the little preacher. As our eyes met he immediately took the pipe from his lips and made as though to cram it into his pocket. "'Though indeed it is empty,' he explained as though I had spoken, "'old habits cling to one, young sir, and my pipe here has been the friend of my solitude these many years. I cannot bear to turn my back upon it yet, so I carry it with me still, and sometimes, when at all thoughtful, I find it between my lips. But though the flesh, as you see, is very weak, I hope in time to forego even this.' And he sighed, shaking his head in gentle deprecation of himself. "'But you look pale. Haggard,' he went on. "'You are ill, young sir.' "'No, no,' said I, springing to my feet. "'Look at this arm. Is it the arm of a sick man? "'No, no, I am well enough. "'But what of him we found in the ditch, you and I, "'the miserable creature who lay bubbling in the grass? "'He has been very near death, sir. "'Indeed, his days are numbered, I think. "'Yet he is better for the time being, "'and last night declared his intention "'of leaving the shelter of my humble roof "'and setting forth upon his mission. "'His mission, sir?' He speaks of himself as one chosen by God to work his will, and asks but to live until this mission, whatever it is, be accomplished. A strange being, said the little preacher, puffing at his empty pipe again as we walked on side by side. A dark, incomprehensible man, and a very, very wretched one, poor soul. Wretched, said I, is that not our human lot? Man is born to sorrow as the sparks fly upward, and Job was accounted wise in his generation. That was a cry from the depths of despond, but Job stood at last upon the heights, and felt once more God's blessed Son, and rejoiced, even as we should. But as regards this stranger, he is one who would seem to have suffered some great wrong, the continued thought of which has unhinged his mind. His heart seems broken, dead. I have, sitting beside his delirious couch, heard him babble a terrible indictment against some man. I have also heard him pray, and his prayers have been all for vengeance." "'Poor fellow,' said I. "'It were better we had left him to die in his ditch, "'for if death does not bring oblivion, "'it may bring a change of scene.' "'Sir,' said the preacher, laying his hand upon my arm, "'such bitterness in one so young is unnatural. "'You are in some trouble. "'I would that I might aid you, be your friend. "'Know you better.' "'Oh, sir, that is easily done. "'I am a blacksmith, hard-working, sober, "'and useful to my fellows. "'They call me Peter Smith.' A certain time since I was a useless dreamer, spending more money in a week than I now earn in a year, and getting very little for it. I was studious, egotistical, and pedantic, wasting my time upon impossible translations that nobody wanted, and they knew me as Peter Vibart. Vibart! exclaimed the preacher, starting and looking up at me. Vibart! I nodded. Related in any way to Sir Maurice Vibart? His cousin, sir. My companion appeared lost in thought, for he was puffing at his empty pipe again. "'Do you happen to know Sir Maurice?' I inquired. "'No,' returned the preacher. "'No, sir, but I have heard mention of him, and lately, though just when or where I cannot for the life of me recall.' 
"'Why, the name is familiar to a great many people,' said I. "'You see, he is rather a famous character in his way.' Talking thus, we presently reached a stile, beyond which the footpath led away through swaying corn and by shady hop-garden to Sissinghurst village. Here the preacher stopped and gave me his hand, but I noticed he still puffed at his pipe. "'And you are now a blacksmith, and mightily content so to be. You are a most strange young man,' said the preacher, shaking his head. "'Many people have told me the same, sir,' said I, and vaulted over the stile. Yet, turning back when I had gone some way, I saw him leaning where I had left him, and with his pipe still in his mouth. End of The Preacher Section 41 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 38. In which I meet my cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart. As I approached the smithy, late though the hour was, and George made it a rule to have the fire going by six every morning, no sound of hammer reached me, and coming into the place I found it empty. That I remembered that to-day George was to drive over to Tonbridge with Prudence and the Ancient to invest in certain household necessities, for in a month's time they were to be married. Hereupon I must needs contrast George's happy future with my dreary one, and fall bitterly to cursing myself and sitting on the ancient's stool in the corner i covered my face and my thoughts were very black now presently as i sat thus i became conscious of a very delicate perfume in the air and also that some one had entered quietly my breath caught in my throat but i did not at once look up fearing to dispel the hope that tingled within me so i remained with my face still covered until something touched me and i saw that it was the gold-mounted handle of a whip wherefore i raised my head suddenly and glanced up then I beheld a radiant vision, in polished riding-boots and speckless moleskins, in handsome flowered waistcoat and perfect-fitting coat, with snowy frills at throat and wrists, a tall gallant figure of a graceful, easy bearing, who stood, a picture of cool gentlemanly insolence, tapping his boot lightly with his whip. But as his eye met mine, the tapping whip grew suddenly still. His languid expression vanished and he came a quick step nearer and bent his face nearer my own, a dark face, handsome in its way, pale and aquiline with a powerful jaw, and dominating eyes and mouth, a face, nay, a mask, rather, that smiled and smiled, but never showed the man beneath. Now glancing up at his brow I saw there a small, newly-heeled scar. "'Is it possible?' said he, speaking in that softly modulated voice I remembered to have heard once before. Can it be possible that I address my worthy cousin? That shirt, that utterly impossible coat and belcher, and yet the likeness is remarkable. Have I the honour to address Mr. Peter Vibart, late of Oxford? The same, sir, I answered, rising. Then, most worthy cousin, I salute you, and he removed his hat, bowing with an ironic grace. Believe me, I have frequently desired to see that paragon of all the virtues, whose dutiful respect a revered uncle rewarded with the proverbial shilling. Egad, he went on, examining me through his glass, with a great show of interest. Had you been any other than the same virtuous cousin Peter, whose graces and perfections were forever being thrown at my head, I could have sympathized with you positively if only on account of that most obnoxious coat and belcher, and the grime and sootiness of things in general. Puff! he exclaimed, pressing his perfumed handkerchief to his nostrils. Phuh! How damnably sulphur and brimstony you do keep yourself, cousin! Oh, gad! You would certainly find it much clearer outside, said I, beginning to blow up the fire. But then, cousin Peter, outside one must become a target for the yokel eye, and I detest being stared at by the uneducated, who naturally lack appreciation. On the whole I prefer the smoke, though it chokes one most infernally. Where may one venture to sit here? I tendered him the stool, but he shook his head, and crossing to the anvil, flicked it daintily with his handkerchief, and sat down, dangling his leg. "'Pon my soul,' said he, eyeing me languidly through his glass again, "'pon my soul!' You are damnably like me, you know, in features. Damnably, I nodded. He glanced at me sharply and laughed. My man, a creature of the name of Parks, said he, swinging his spurred boot 
to and fro, led me to suppose that I should meet a person here, a blacksmith fellow. Your man Parks informed you correctly, I nodded. What can I do for you? The devil! exclaimed Sir Maurice, shaking his head. But no, you are, as I gather, somewhat eccentric, but even you would never take such a desperate step as to... to... Become a blacksmith fellow? I put in. Precisely! Alas, Sir Maurice, I blush to say that rather than become an unprincipled adventurer, living on my wits, or a mean-spirited hanger-on, fawning upon acquaintances for a livelihood, or doing anything rather than soil my hands with honest toil, I became a blacksmith fellow some four or five months ago. Really, it is most distressing to observe to what depths virtue may drag a man. You are a very monster of probity and rectitude, exclaimed Sir Maurice. Indeed, I am astonished. You manifest not only shocking bad judgment, but a most deplorable lack of thought. Virtue is damnably selfish as a rule. Really, it is quite disconcerting to find oneself first cousin to a blacksmith. Fellow, I added. Fellow, nodded Sir Maurice. Oh, the devil! To think of my worthy cousin reduced to the necessity of laboring with hammer and saw. Not a saw, I put in. We will say chisel, then. A vibart with a hammer and chisel. Deuce take me! Most distressing. And you will pardon my saying so. You do not seem to thrive on hammers and chisels. No one could say you looked blooming, or even flourishing, like the young bay tree, which is, I fancy, an eastern expression. Sir, said I, may I remind you that I have work to do? A deuced interesting place, though, this, he smiled, staring round imperturbably through his glass. So, er, so devilishly grimy and smutty and gritty. Quite a number of horseshoes, too. Do you know, cousin, I've never before remarked what a number of holes there are in a horseshoe, but live and learn. Here he paused to inhale a pinch of snuff, very daintily, from a jewelled box, it is a strange thing, he pursued, as he dusted his fingers on his handkerchief, a very strange thing, that being cousins, we have never met till now, especially as I have heard so very much about you. Pray, said I, pray, how should you hear about one so very insignificant as myself? Oh, I have heard of good cousin Peter since I was an imp of a boy, he smiled. Cousin Peter was my chart whereby to steer through the shoals of boyish mischief into the haven of our Uncle George's good graces. Oh, I have heard over much of you, cousin, from dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them. They rang your praises in my ears morning, noon, and night. And why? Simply that I might come to surpass you in virtue, learning, wit, and appearance, and so win our Uncle George's regard, and incidentally his legacy. But I was a young demon, romping with the grooms in the stable, while you were a young angel in nankeens, passing studious hours with your books. When I was a scapegrace of Harrow, you were winning gold opinions at Eton. When you were honours man at Oxford, I was rusticating at Cambridge. Naturally enough, perhaps, I grew sick of the name Peter, and indeed it smacks damnably of fish, don't you think? You, or your name, crossed me at every turn. If it wasn't for Cousin Peter, I was heir to ten thousand a year. But good Cousin Peter was so fond of Uncle George, and Uncle George was so fond of good Cousin Peter, that Maurice might go hang for a graceless dog and be damned to him. "'You have my deepest sympathy and apologies,' said I. "'Still, I have sometimes been curious to meet worthy Cousin Peter, and it's rather surprising that I've never done so.' "'On the contrary,' I began, but his laugh stopped me. "'Ah, to be sure,' he nodded, "'our ways have lain widely separated hitherto. You, a scholar, treading the difficult path of learning, I—' Oh, egad, a terrible fellow, a mauvais sujet, a sad dog. But after all, cousin, when one comes to look at you to-day, you might stand for a terrible example of virtue run riot, a distressing spectacle of dutiful respect and good precedent cut off with a shilling. Really, it is horrifying to observe to what depths virtue may plunge an otherwise well-balanced individual. Little dreamed those dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them, that while the willful Maurice lived on, continually getting into hot water and out again, up to his eyes in debt, and pretty well esteemed, the virtuous pattern Peter would descend to a hammer and saw, I should say chisel, in a very grimy place, where he is, it seems, the presiding genius. Indeed, this first meeting of ours under these circumstances is somewhat dramatic, as it should be. And yet we have met before, said I and the circumstances were then even more dramatic, perhaps. We met in a tempest, sir. 
Ha! he exclaimed, dwelling on the word and speaking very slowly. A tempest, cousin. There was much wind and rain, and it was very dark. Dark, cousin? But I saw your face very plainly as you lay on your back, sir, by the aid of a postillion's lanthorn. It was greatly struck by our mutual resemblance. Sir Maurice raised his glass and looked at me, and as he looked, smiled, but he could not hide the sudden passionate quiver of his thin nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. He rose slowly and paced to the door. When he came back again he was laughing softly, but still he could not hide the quiver of his nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. So it was you, he murmured, with a pause between the words. Oh, was ever so damnably contrary! To think that I should hunt her into your very arms! To think that of all men in the world it should be you to play the squire of dames! And he laughed again, but as he did so, the stout riding-whip snapped in his hands like a straw. He glanced down at the broken pieces, and then from them to me. "'You see, I'm rather strong in the hands, cousin,' said he, shaking his head. "'But I was not quite strong enough last time we met, though to be sure, as you say, it was very dark. Had I known it was worthy cousin Peter's throat I grasped, I think I might have squeezed just a little tighter.' "'Sir,' said I, shaking my head, "'I really don't think you could have done it. Yes, he sighed, tossing his broken whip into a corner. Yes, I think so. You see, I mistook you for merely an interfering country bumpkin. Yes, I nodded, while I, on the other hand, took you for a fine gentleman, nobly intent on the ruin of an unfortunate, friendless girl, whose poverty would seem to make her an easy victim. In which it appears you were as much mistaken as I, Cousin Peter. Here he glanced at me with a sudden keenness. Indeed. "'Why, surely,' said he, "'surely you must know.' He paused to flick a speck of soot from his knee, and then continued, "'Did she tell you nothing of herself?' "'Very little beside her name.' "'Ah, she told you her name, then?' "'Yes, she told me her name.' "'Well, cousin?' "'Well, sir?' We had both risen, and now fronted each other across the anvil, Sir Maurice, debonair and smiling, while I stood frowning and gloomy. "'Come,' said I at last, "'let us understand each other once for all.' You tell me that you have always looked upon me as your rival for our uncle's good graces. I never was. You have deceived yourself into believing that because I was his ward, and that alone augmented my chances of becoming the heir. It never did. He saw me as seldom as possible, and if he ever troubled his head about either of us it would have seemed that he favoured you. I tell you I never was your rival in the past, and never shall be in the future. Meaning, cousin? Meaning, sir, in regard to either the legacy or the Lady Sophia Sefton. I was never fond enough of money to marry for it. I have never seen this lady, nor do I propose to thus. So as far as I'm concerned, you are free to win her and the fortune as soon as you will. I, as you see, prefer horseshoes. And what, said Sir Maurice, flicking a speck of soot from his cuff, and immediately looking me again, what of Charmian? I don't know, I answered, nor should I be likely to tell you, if I did. Wherever she may be, she is safe, I trust, beyond your reach. No, he broke in, she will never be beyond my reach until she is dead, or I am, perhaps not even then, and I shall find her again, sooner or later, depend upon it. Yes, you may depend upon that. Cousin Maurice, said I, reaching out my hand to him, wherever she may be, she is alone and unprotected, pursue her no farther. Go back to London, marry your Lady Sefton, inherit your fortune, but leave Charmian Brown in peace. And pray, said he, frowning suddenly, whence this solicitude de on her behalf? What is she to you, this Charmian Brown? Nothing, I answered hurriedly. Nothing at all. God knows, nor ever can be. Sir Maurice suddenly leaned forward, and catching me by the shoulder, peered into my face. By heaven, he exclaimed, the fellow actually loves her. Well, said I, meeting his look, why not? Yes, I love her. A very fury of rage seemed suddenly to possess him. The languid, smiling gentleman became a devil with vicious eyes and evil, snarling mouth, whose fingers sank into my flesh as he swung me back and forth in a powerful grip. "'You love her? You? You?' he panted. "'Yes,' I answered, flinging him off so that he staggered. "'Yes, yes, I, who fought for her once and am willing, most willing, to do so again, now or at any other time. For though I hold no hope of winning her, ever, yet I can serve her still, and protect her from the pollution of your presence. And I clenched my fists. 
He stood poised as though about to spring at me, and I saw his knuckles gleam whiter than the laces above them. But all at once he laughed lightly, easily as ever. "'A very perfect, gentle knight,' he murmured, sans peur et sans reproche, though somewhat grimy and in a leather apron. Chivalry, kneeling amid hammers and horseshoes, worshipping her with a reverence distant and lowly. How like you, worthy cousin, how very like you, and how very affecting! But, and here his nostrils quivered again, but I tell you, she is mine. Mine, and always has been, and no man living shall come between us. No, by God! That, said I, that remains to be seen. Ha! Though indeed I think she is safe from you while I live. But then, cousin Peter, life is a very uncertain thing. At best, he returned, glancing at me beneath his drooping lids. Yes, I nodded. It is sometimes a blessing to remember that. Sir Maurice strolled to the door, and being there, paused, and looked back over his shoulder. I go to find Charmian, said he, and I shall find her sooner or later, and when I do, should you take it upon yourself to come between us again, or presume to interfere again, I shall kill you, worthy cousin, without the least compunction. If you think this sufficient warning, act upon it. If not, he shrugged his shoulders significantly, farewell, good and worthy cousin Peter, farewell, or shall we say au revoir? End of In Which I Meet My Cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart.